talking about her leaving for the weekend. I have a meeting in L.A. about a script I finished a few weeks ago. They're already moving forward with the caster. It's a quick trip. I'll be back on Sunday night. She frowned at Hank's place as we pulled into the drive. Will you call me while I'm gone? The edge of vulnerability I heard made me want to hold her close and reassure her with slow, deliberate kisses. Problem was, if I held her close, I'd be telling myself a few kisses weren't enough. I'd want a taste of her breast and thighs, and I wasn't referring to her mojo chicken recipe. Of course. I slid her an easy smile, then handed her my unlocked phone. Type in your number. I walked around the truck to her door as she programmed her contact info. When I opened her door, she took my hand and allowed me to help her down, entwining her fingers and keeping hold of my phone. We need some place with good light, she said distractedly, frowning at the darkness of early evening. Come up here on the porch. I let her tug me behind her and lead me up the stairs. She was on a mission, and from my place behind her, I was graced with a great view of her ass and legs. With each swish of her skirt, I was reminded that her stockings ended halfway up her thighs, and that reminded me of touching her skin. By the time we made it to the porch and she flipped on the overhead lights, I'd forgotten she had my phone. Sienna turned, opened her mouth to tell me something, but I stopped her by capturing her bottom lip with my teeth. Her breath hitched, her eyes widened, her body tensed. I liked that I'd surprised her could taste it in the air between us. I licked her lip and slipped my arm around her waist, gripping a handful of her ass. I needed the flavor of her on my tongue and the softness of her body beneath my grip. I wasn't going to lift her skirt on the porch, but I could show her how much I wanted to. Sienna moaned, long lashes drifting shut, relaxing against me while she swept her tongue out to invite me in. She arched, her body stretching along mine, pressing her tits to my chest and her rounded ass into my palm. Everywhere our bodies met, heat spread like wildfire. Backs of cold and hot traveled up my spine and down my legs, causing my hips to roll in an instinctive rhythm. Pulling her mouth from mine, Sienna said on a gasp, Jethro, this is such a bad idea. I was about to ask her if she wanted me to stop when she dug her fingers into my scalp and brought my mouth to her neck. Don't stop. Her contradicting messages had me smiling against her skin. It may have been a bad idea, making out on the front porch of Hank Weller's cabin for anyone to see. Well, anyone passing by, which no one ever did, or her guards to stumble upon, which was more likely. But I didn't want to let her go. I want to touch her heat. I nipped the underside of her jaw, telling her what I wanted to do, but couldn't presently make a reality. Not yet. Slide my fingers inside. Holy shit, I love your accent. She breathed out in a rush. Say something else. What do you want me to say? Anything. Anything that makes you hot. What about making you hot? I'm guessing anything that makes you hot will also make me hot. Fine, then. I want to leave love bites here. I palmed her breast and massaged, rubbing my thumb in a slow circle around her nipple. I wanted to suck her skin between my teeth and soothe the sting with my tongue. I want to feel you beneath me, panting, moaning. My face was still buried in her neck, my fingers pulling aside the edge of her shirt to expose the skin of her shoulder when I heard a soft click. I stiffened, a new kind of adrenaline, the kind laced with frustration and dread, pumped through my veins. I immediately lifted my head, searching for the source of the sound. Preparing to smash both the cameras and the heads of any voyeurs lurking nearby, my initial sweep revealed no one but us. Sienna was watching me with a dazed but sublimely happy expression, and her arm was raised to one side, the screen of the phone facing us, set to camera mode. It took me near a full minute before I comprehended that Sienna had used my cell to snap a picture. What did you... Look, I'm going to make this my avatar on your phone. She caught her bottom lip between her teeth and gave me a naughty grin, then showed me the screen. It was a picture of us making out, her head thrown back, her neck and shoulder exposed, and it was very, very hot. Sienna continued on a seductive whisper. So every time I call... I shook my head, both loving and hating her idea. You're so bad. 
If I'm so bad, then why are you smiling, Ranger? I stole another kiss, rolling my hips against hers, because I now knew she liked it, waiting until I felt her body tense with urgency, then pulled away and snatched my phone from her fingers. Walking backward, I enjoyed watching her chest rise and fall with heavy breaths, like how her eyes were clouded and hungry. Grinning, I left her on the porch and tossed my answer over my shoulder as I strolled away. Because you're also very, very good. I was in trouble. My cell phone company alerted me late Sunday afternoon that I'd nearly used up all my text messages for the entire month. I suspected the 75 or so texts I'd exchanged with Sienna since Friday night were the cause. So I called and upgraded to the unlimited plan. But that's not why I was in trouble. I was in trouble because I'd never been the text messaging sort. I figure, you got something to say and you expect me to pay attention? It better be important. If it's important, you call. Or stop by. It took just three minutes and one quick exchange with Sienna on Saturday morning for me to change my tune. Sienna texted me. Sienna. What are you doing? Jethro. Cutting buttresses for the carriage house. You? Sienna. Thinking about you? Yep, that's all it took. I read and reread the words for at least a full minute, probably longer. Three words on my phone staring back at me. Evidence that what we had between us wasn't one-sided. 212 messages and 36 hours later, I was in deep, drinking the text message in moonshine and waiting for my next fix. Of course, it helped that every time she sent a text, I got an eye full of the avatar she'd set next to her name. Plus, she was just as irresistible via phone as she was in person. Sienna. If you rearrange the letters of Jethro, you can spell Hot Jer. Sienna. Also, O.J. Reth, Thor J., and J.T. Hero, all of which would make an excellent name for a DJ. Jethro. Whereas yours spells a sin with nay left over. Sienna. FYI, mine also spells insane. Sienna. So watch out. The next text from Sienna was a wink and smiley face. I chuckled, covering my mouth with my hand. Throughout the day, she'd sent various pictures of herself doing funny things. In one, she posed with a guy on Hollywood Boulevard who was dressed like Smash Boy both of them making angry faces with the caption, You make Smash angry when you don't send shirtless pictures. We'd been doing this since she left, sending dumb stuff back and forth or just conversing about our day. Jethro, Insane and Sienna. That's quite a coincidence. Sienna, I often wonder if my parents did it on purpose. Jethro, What time did you get in tonight? Sienna, Past midnight. Jethro, do you want me to pick you up? Sienna, no, get your sleep. Sienna, and dream of me. Sienna, naked. Sienna, I mean, you should sleep naked and dream of me. Jethro, but not you naked? Sienna, if we're both naked, then I want details. We also texted about our families. She had a large one, too. Three sisters and two brothers. They sounded like fun. Getting ahead of myself, again, I like the idea of our kids having cousins on both sides. Lots of aunts and uncles nearby and lots to visit. Sienna was the youngest, and I learned her manager was her oldest sister, Marta. Sienna. Send a picture of yourself so I can show Marta. Jethro. No. Sienna. What? Why? Sienna, I want to tell her about us. I can't tell her if you don't send a picture. She'll want photographic evidence. Jethro, I don't do selfies. Sienna, that's not what your brother said. Sienna, get it? What is so funny? I glanced up, finding Claire peeping out of the kitchen, an expectant smile on her lips. It was Sunday afternoon, and as was my habit, I was over at Claire's checking in to make sure she had everything she needed. As usual, she'd invited me to stay for dinner. As usual, I'd accepted. Nothing. 
I shook my head, slipping my phone in my pocket and resuming my work on her kitchen drawer. I was fixing the roller track. You're still smiling, she teased, stepping into the doorway and placing her hands on her hips. This wouldn't have anything to do with a certain movie star, would it? I tossed her my best impression of irritation, but it wasn't very effective seeing as how I was still smiling. None of your business. She returned my glare, the effect also lost, and she was still smiling. Come on, Jet, I'm dying here. Cletus said you had her over for dinner. You two girls gossip about anyone else, or just me? Stop being coy. I'm excited for you. Claire sounded exasperated. Cletus seems to approve, and if Cletus approves, then she's got to be great. She is great, I said without thinking, the words slipping out easy as breathing. Then tell me about her. How did you meet? How serious is it? What do y'all do when the movie wraps up? I was with her until the last question, and then I felt my smile slip. We hadn't talked about what happens when the movie wraps up, but we'll figure it out, I guess. You guess? Meaning you'll still be seeing each other after? I hope so. Now, that was an understatement. I'm so happy for you. The quiet sincerity in her tone had me looking up from the drawer and into her big, sapphire blue eyes. I'm so happy to see you finally putting yourself out there. I was starting to worry you'd never fill that house with kids. Now hold on. I stood, picking up the fixed drawer and scooting past her into the kitchen. This thing just started. Ain't nothing serious yet. Come on, give me some credit. I didn't have to be looking at Claire to know she just rolled her eyes. We're taking things slow. She snorted. Well, now I know it's serious. You have to promise me you'll bring her over for dinner. I promise not to embarrass you too much. Claire said, and then added under her breath though I might embarrass myself. I smiled, but kept my back to her so she wouldn't see. What about you? Don't start with me. Maybe I've got plans you don't know about yet. I fit the drawer in its slot, rolling it back and forth a few times to make sure the movement was smooth before turning to tease my friend. No, no, no. If I'm taking chances with my heart, maybe it's time for you to do the same. She folded her hands under her chin and blinked several times. Oh, my apple pie. Jethro Winston taking chances with his heart. I never thought I'd see the day. Very funny. Now, why don't you tell me what's going on with you and Billy? Claire stiffened, her hands dropped, and her smile dimmed. What did you say? You heard me. Why would you tell Billy that you and I were involved? Her smile vanished entirely. A flash of remorse and guilt passed over her features, almost too quick for me to see before she succeeded in masking her emotions. Claire was real good at this, hiding her feelings. It had been a survival technique, learned over the course of a bitter childhood. I never told him that. Her tone was flat and defensive. Did you ever strongly imply that we were together? I meant to tease her about this, however, based on her reaction, I was careful to keep my tone light but devoid of playfulness. She said nothing, just glared at me with blue eyes that held so much wisdom it physically hurt to look at her. I knew she'd been ill-treated as a child. She was the only daughter of Razor, the president of the Iron Wraiths Motorcycle Club. Saying he'd been a bad father would be like calling Cletus mildly unconventional. She'd escaped the club when she was a teenager and had married Ben at 18. Ben had treated her right, but I knew his gentleness could never make up for the years of abuse that came before. I tried a different approach. I could usually charm her if the need arose. If you didn't imply it, did you infer it? She cracked a regretful smile, just a small one, and turned away. I'm sorry. You're sorry for what? I'm sorry if I caused any problems between you and your brother. I stared at her back for a long time, watched her shoulders rise and fall as I waited. She said nothing. I swear, this woman was as stubborn as a boulder. Claire, I don't know what's going on or what happened between you and Billy, but nothing happened between me and... She paused, rubbed her eyes with the base of her palms, and took a deep breath. Between me and him, not for a long time. Not since before Ben. Not since we were teenagers. Not since we were teenagers. This was news to me. I crossed my arm, seeing my good friend in a new light. Well, now, 
You got me feeling like I deserve some answers. I didn't know anything had ever happened between you and Billy. Her shoulders fell and she shook her head. It was so long ago, Jethro. I'm sorry if my silence on the matter caused you trouble. I truly am. I didn't infer or imply. I promise. I just... She lifted a hand to her chest and rubbed her ribs just beneath her heart, turning her head to give me her profile, like she couldn't bring herself to look at me. I just didn't deny anything when he asked. And what gives him the right to ask? Exactly. Now she did look at me, her eyes hard and her whisper fierce. He doesn't have a right. Chapter 22 The greatest hazard of all, losing oneself, can occur very quietly in the world, as if it were nothing at all. Soren Kierkegaard, The Sickness Unto Death Sienna Jethro didn't send me a selfie. Instead, he sent a picture of him and a gigantic black bear in the background. The bear was in a cage and was asleep or had been tranquilized. Jethro was crouching down next to the cage, but at a safe distance, not looking at the camera. My heart gave a happy leap, tingly pinpricks of warmth dancing beneath my skin. I smiled wistfully. At least it felt wistful on my lips. He was so handsome to me. He was the handsomest. Jethro, this is the only picture of myself I have on my phone. It'll have to do. Sienna, you have no selfies on your phone? Seriously? None at all? Jethro, nope. Sienna, you are the only human in the world with a smartphone and no selfies. Jethro, I'm pretty sure Drew has none on his phone either. Sienna, Drew doesn't count. Ashley said he reads poetry to her. He gets a free pass. Jethro. Is this your way of telling me to read poetry to you? Sienna. No, not at all. Sienna. I want you to read poetry to me. This is my way of telling you to read poetry to me. Who are you texting? Marta asked from behind the couch, startling me. I glanced over the back of the sofa where I was sitting. She was at my shoulder reading my screen. I immediately pressed the phone to my chest. Marta, don't read my text messages. Why can't I see? Who is it? You can't see because it's an invasion of privacy, you weirdo. She gave me a patronizing look. You know you have no privacy. Marta was referring to my cloud backup account being hacked three years ago, and now hundreds of my pictures had been made public. Unfortunately for the gossip pages, the most risque image they found was me in a two-piece bathing suit one of my college friends had taken and texted me. The media, we're talking CNN, Fox News, MSNBC et al., had spent months debating whether or not my waistline was healthy or attractive. Meanwhile, I was turning down dicks, both figurative and literal dicks, left and right. I should note that some of the literal dicks weren't attached to figurative dicks, which was nice. I went on a number of promising dates, but work always got in the way, and then my movies were hitting records. Finding dates with non-figurative dicks became increasingly difficult after that. I don't know what the media ultimately decided about my chances of dying alone and sexually starved because my tummy lacked a six-pack. I was too busy being happy with my body and making blockbusters. You know, crying myself to sleep on my big pile of money. Just because it's happened in the past, I continued to clutch the phone to my chest. Invasion of privacy is never okay. Would you want me looking at your personal messages? No, but I'm not a household name. You can't expect the same level of privacy as everyone else. People are interested in you. If you want to maintain this level of success, you have to expect some invasion of privacy. You know this. We'd had this conversation. One hundred times, but it had never started with her being the one spying. Yes, I understand that, but you're not just my manager. You're my sister, and I expect more from you. Marta had the decency to look mildly ashamed. You're right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have looked. Now, are you going to tell me who you've been texting? I smiled, unable to stop myself, because I'd been texting Jethro. 
Too happy to think about how Marta might react, I announced, I met someone. Marta's eyebrows bounced high on her forehead. In Tennessee? Yes. She looked at me for a long moment, her eyes losing focus like she was going through a file drawer inside her brain. Is it Tom? Are you two back together? No. No, no, no. Ken? Because that could work, especially with the promotional tour for the film coming up. No, Marta. My guy isn't an actor. Is it Joe? Who? The junior executive producer. You met him at the casting event. No. I had no idea who she was talking about. I knew the producing team because they'd stopped by the set last week, and none of them were named Joe. I don't even... No, it's nothing like that. He's a park ranger. Who is? My guy. He's a wildlife ranger. He works at the national park. I scrolled through my text messages until I found the picture of him next to the cage and showed it to my sister. She stared at the image like it confused her, and then suddenly she laughed. I watched her loss of composure for a full minute, because now I was confused. I even checked the picture to make sure I hadn't zoomed in on the bear. Nope. The screen displayed Jethro's handsomest face. Oh, Sienna, you're hilarious. She was holding her stomach, shaking her head. What? Why is this funny? For once, I didn't like the sound of someone laughing. Martha wiped her eyes, her laughter becoming short bursts of chuckles. What? I said, why is this funny? My sister blinked at me, waited, like she expected me to deliver a punchline. When I didn't, all humor fled from her features. Oh my God, you're serious. She grabbed the phone and looked at the screen again, her face grimacing in horror. You've got to be kidding me with this. Oh, oh my God. What is this picture? She turned the phone toward me and pointed at Jethro's avatar, the photo I'd taken with his phone of us making out on the porch. He'd sent it to me so I could make it his avatar as well. It's us, kissing. You see, Marta, when a boy likes a girl, it's this thing they do with their lips. He's all over you. Who took this picture? I did. You did? Yes. I took it with his phone, and then he texted it to me. She stared at me blankly, in a way that reminded me of a bomb about to detonate. But when she spoke, she did so in an eerily calm tone. You're telling me that the park ranger has this picture of the two of you on his phone, and you took it? That's right. Marta stared at me like I'd lost my mind. Are you trying to ruin your career? What's going on here? Do you need a vacation so badly that you're sabotaging yourself? You need to calm down. I swallowed past a thick knot of something uncomfortable in my throat. Marta's assessment was mostly wrong, but part of it rang with uncomfortable truth. Maybe part of me, a very small part of me, saw Jethro and a life with him as an escape from everything I'd hated about being a celebrity. Maybe. But so what? If being with a man I adored gave me the impetus to change my life for the better, gave me the strength to plot a new course, then where was the harm in that? Calm down. When he sells it to TMZ along with all the sordid, fake details of your love affair, don't expect me to clean this up. I snatched the phone away, a weird mixture of embarrassed and angry heat slithering up my neck. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with me? You think you're dating a park ranger in Tennessee. How do you think people are going to feel about that? Who cares? You should care. No, I shouldn't. I absolutely shouldn't care. And I believed this. My mantra since the success of my first film had been, never care about media opinion, work hard, do what's right. But Marta cared, and more frequently than I wanted to admit, her caring had the habit of affecting my career choices. Her caring was why I hadn't yet taken a vacation. Ultimately, it was my decision, but the thought of letting her down had been unbearable. Until now. Until I had something other than myself to fight for. 
I wasn't sure whether I was more concerned about disappointing my eldest sister or my manager. Sometimes I forgot who she was most to me. Perhaps she forgot, too. How can you say that? She looked like she wanted to strangle me. Because if I allowed myself to care about what the talking heads were saying, I would be horribly unhappy and nowhere near as successful as I am now. That's ridiculous. She ground out angrily, marching away from me toward her desk. It's not ridiculous. It's true. I followed her across the room. They call me the fat, funny lady, Martha. I'm plus-sized at a size 14, which, whatever, I don't care about the label. Plus-sized is fun-sized. But this business hates that I'm average-sized and successful. They hate that I'm a woman and write funny movies. We are not average size for film, Sienna. We are big. We are fat. Pretending we're not fat doesn't make it so. I ignored her spiteful comment. My sister had always struggled against her natural shape, and I knew her size, our size, was a sore spot for her. I'd always hoped to show her through embracing my gifts that she didn't need to measure herself against society's silly mandates. But we're average for the U.S. Size 14 is the average. You can't read an article about me without the writer bringing up my audacity for not caring, criticizing me for not starving myself. So you think I should listen to that crap? Marta lifted her voice over mine before I finished speaking. You think you're successful because you don't care? Well, guess what? You're successful because I care. Because I push you. I am the only reason you are taken seriously. You would be nothing if it weren't for me. I flinched, my ears ringing in the sudden silence. I couldn't be more surprised if she'd slapped my face. Seeing my expression, or maybe realizing what she'd just said, Marta covered her hands with her face and released a long exhale. I'm sorry, that came out wrong. I ignored her apology and presented the facts as I saw them. You're wrong. I am successful because I don't care about media opinion. If I cared, then I wouldn't be writing comedy film scripts because women aren't as funny as men. Sienna, I wouldn't be acting in film because actresses are a size zero and five foot two. I'm sorry. I wouldn't have won an Academy Award for Best Actress because only white women, usually named Meryl Streep, win that award, and never for a comedy role. You've made your point. Every step of the way, I'd been scolded for being happy with myself. How dare I be happy with who I am, my size, the color of my skin, that I can make both men and women laugh? So you think I'm going to let you or anyone else make me feel ashamed about Jethro? His name is Jethro. Her tone held a worried edge. Really? Couldn't you at least have messed around with a park ranger named Chris or Carter? It has to be a Jethro? I slow blinked because I was angry. I waited a full five seconds, simmering in my temper until I had control over it, before responding with forced calmness. Yes, it has to be Jethro, and I love his name. And we're not messing around. We're falling for each other. I'm halfway in love with him already. Marta looked at me, just looked at me, her expression one of frustrated helplessness and begrudging acceptance. So I looked at her in return, daring her to push me on this. I understood she believed she had my best interest at heart, but she didn't. My best interests, my career, my success? Of course, yes. My heart? Obviously not. Fine. We will... I guess we'll talk about this later. My sister glanced at her watch, then leveled me with a dispassionate glare. You'll be late for your flight if you don't leave soon. I met her stare straight on. We engaged in an old-fashioned stare down. I half expected a tumbleweed to blow across her office. She broke the silence and eye contact first. Sienna, it's time for you to go. You can glare at me later. Okay, I'll go. I nodded, but needed to clarify one point. However, 
You should know the only way we're talking about Jethro later is if you're ready to apologize and be excited for me. Otherwise, we're not talking about him at all. Chapter 23 I cannot conceive of a greater loss than the loss of one's self-respect. Mahatma Gandhi, Fools, Martyrs, Traitors The Story of Martyrdom in the Western World Siena On Monday morning when Jethro picked me up, he was distracted. And not a good, happy distracted. He was troubled. I sensed it in the way he smiled as he approached the porch, swiftly kissing me good morning when I met him halfway, held my hand tightly as we walked to his truck. He opened the door for me as usual. I climbed up, worried something new had happened since we last texted, something that had him rethinking the progress we'd made on Friday. Unlike all last week, Cletus wasn't present. It was just the two of us. I spotted my Hello Kitty mug in the cup holder, but when I reached for the mug, I found it empty. And so I worried my lip, feeling gun-shy because the last time we'd been alone in the car on the way to the set, he'd broken things off. As soon as Jethro pulled onto the main road, I blurted, If you're going to break up with me again, I wish you would just say so. But I wish you wouldn't, because, as I've already established, I really like you, and I think you're making a mistake. Jethro turned wide, confused eyes on me. What? What are you talking about? Are you going to call things off again? No. Why? What happened? I hesitated. The argument with my sister happened, but it didn't affect my relationship with Jethro and wasn't really pertinent to this conversation. Being happy with oneself and pandering to no one was the quickest way to scare the hell out of people. And right now, Marta was scared of me. I endeavored to shrug off the persistent weight of unpleasantness that had been plaguing me since leaving my sister yesterday. She would come around, mostly because I would give her no choice. I answered honestly. Nothing happened. Did anything happen with you? Not that I know of. So we're still in agreement? We're still a dating couple who are not temporary? That's correct. He grinned like he enjoyed hearing the words out loud. I released a sigh of relief. Thank goodness, because I was about to get Mexican mad. What's Mexican mad? Same as regular mad, just with me speaking in Spanish so I could call you an asshole without you knowing. You would suspect, but you wouldn't know. Oh. He nodded as though digesting this information. Then why don't you just call it Spanish mad, then? Because Mexican Spanish is different from Castilian Spanish, Spanish from Spain. Just like Dominican Spanish is different than Cuban Spanish, or Venezuelan Spanish, or Costa Rican Spanish. The Spanish I would use to curse you, should the need arise, would be of the Mexican variety. Ah, I get it. In Tennessee, we have our own way of speaking. Idioms that don't make any sense to the rest of the English-speaking world. Like what? I was all ears. I loved this kind of stuff. Well, let's see. He shifted in his seat as we stopped at the light, his eyes moving over me. My mama used to get mad and say, Well, that just deals my pickle. This made me grin. Did she really? Yep. Jethro nodded once, a rumbly chuckle making his shoulders shake. Cletus also says it sometimes. Now I laughed. <laughs> that fits him somehow. My new goal in life is to get your brother to say those words. He plays banjo in a band and is real judgmental of people who can't sing. This one time he said about a fellow who was trying to jam with them, he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. I snort laughed. See, that one would translate well in any language. Speaking as someone who can't sing, that's mean. But it's also funny. It is mean. Jethro turned his attention back to the road and made a right. But then, Cletus is kind of mean. I studied Jethro's profile, thinking about his assessment of his brother. Cletus didn't strike me as mean. Clever, perceptive, odd, yes. Mean? No. I don't think he's mean. Jethro gave me a sideways look. Yeah, well, you didn't grow up with him. When he was a kid, he was really mean. Used to make other students cry. 
He paused, obviously lost in a memory, and then added, He used to make his teachers cry, too. But that was when he was younger. So? So, don't you think it's a little unfair to judge your siblings now for labels assigned to them when they were kids? Jethro's easy smile morphed into a thoughtful one, and he raised an eyebrow at me. Like he found this concept intriguing, but didn't quite understand enough to agree or disagree with my point. So I explained. Growing up, I was the funny one. What? I was a clown. That's all I was. My other brother was the disappointment. My sister Maya was the beautiful one. And Rena was the smart one. Marta was the serious one. I was the clown. Now he looked vaguely dismayed. What does that even mean? It means people expected me to be funny, because I was funny when I was a kid. But they never expected me to be anything else. Smart, serious, beautiful, creative, or disappointing. I was just funny. And if I wasn't funny, well then, they assumed I wasn't feeling well. I glanced around our surroundings, realized he'd taken us on a detour. Where are we going? He must have been absorbed in our conversation or his resultant thoughts on the matter because he blinked a few times and glanced at the road like he was surprised by where we were. Oh, I wanted to pick up coffee before we went in. We have plenty of time. Good plan. Now I understood why my mug had been empty. Any place in particular? Daisies. He paired the single word with a sly grin. Immediate and thrilling anticipation had me smiling like an idiot and leaning forward in my seat. Really? Have you had a donut yet? I shook my head vehemently. No. No, I haven't. I've had none of Daisy's donuts. Then this'll be a treat. I stopped myself from bouncing in my seat. Since relating my Daisy donut fantasy to Jethro some weeks ago, where I imagined he would lick the smudge of frosting from the corner of my mouth, the fantasy had grown more delectably scandalous. Frosting on the nipples, both his and mine, may have been involved. It wasn't even about the donut or the frosting. It was the licking, the tasting, the savoring. The idea of him devouring me, him being insatiable for me. What about my family? He asked suddenly. What? I panted, lost in my lusty thoughts. He shifted in his seat again, his hands opening and closing on the steering wheel. You've met my siblings. What labels do you think we grew up with? A moment was necessary for my brain to switch tracks. But when I did, I saw that Jethro was frowning. His usual good temperament had been eclipsed by something dark. My first instinct was to avoid the question and respond, I don't know. Based on what I knew about Jethro both from him and from others, his label likely hadn't been a good one. It had been unkind, though perhaps well-earned. I took too long to answer. His brow clouded with murky melancholy as his eyes darted to mine. You can say it. I didn't know you growing up. But you can guess. Jethro gripped the steering wheel tighter and swallowed. His tone was hollow and quietly demanding as he insisted. Guess, please. I pressed my lips together in a flat line, not wanting to add any more fuel to his fire of perpetual self-recrimination. So instead, I said, Jethro, labeling kids isn't fair. It doesn't matter if the label is good or bad. It puts them in a box and makes them feel like they have to live inside it. We were quiet after that, my words hanging between us. He was considering them. As he pulled into the parking lot in front of Daisy's, I was relieved to see his brow clear and a soft smile whisper over his features. But then he said, Billy was a responsible one. Cletus was, well, he's the odd one. Ashley was a beautiful one. Bo was a charmer. Dwayne was the quiet one. Roscoe was considered the overachiever or something like that. And I was a disappointment. My heart twisted. His words physically hurt me. He may have made bad decisions as a kid, as a teenager, but shaking off a label affixed during childhood was almost impossible. You're not a disappointment. I grabbed his hand as soon as he parked, 
brought it to my lap and cradled it there. Your family is so proud of you. Most people live up or down to the expectations set by their label. Very few people are able to transcend it. I know. He gave me a charming shrug. Both his expression and words were laced with a healthy dose of self-confidence. I turned it around. Then he grinned a charming grin. My mouth parted with surprise and I marveled at this man. How do you do that? Do what? In one breath, you're so negative about yourself, and in the next, you're singing your own praises. An astonished laugh tumbled from my lips. I'm negative about who I used to be, Sienna, but not who I am now. I admit, though, sometimes I don't feel deserving of my own happiness. He turned his hand in mine and threaded our fingers together, bringing my knuckles to his lips. He brushed soft kisses over the backs of my fingers, and when he spoke, his words were introspective. It's frustrating, as you say, having the history of a label. I see it in people, the way they look at me, what they expect. They expect dishonesty. They expect me to be a joke. I felt compelled to say, People expect me to be a joke, too. Jethro gave me a soft, sympathetic smile. You are more than the jokes you told when you were five or eight or thirteen. And you are more than the mistakes of your youth. You are more than the label you've been assigned by people who might love you, but don't really know who you are anymore. His gaze captured mine, heated, and then dropped to my lips. I suppose it's part of why we seek out a partner, why we're driven to build a new family, pursue new friendships. There's freedom in being a blank canvas to another person and having some control over what's painted on that canvas. I studied him in the weighty silence, feeling a kinship that went beyond liking or even extreme liking. It was a shared understanding that only comes from living through similar experiences. Jethro had been the disappointment. I'd been the clown. Individually, we had become more. But together, and with each other, we didn't need to be our labels. We were free to just be ourselves. Coffee? Check. Donuts? Check. Along with Jethro and my trailer and the door locked? Double check. My call time wasn't until 10 a.m., but Jethro had to check the traps before then. If any bears had been caught over the weekend, he needed to haul them out of the cove before midday, before the sun heated the prairie. Even so, we had at least an hour until he had to leave. I pushed the chairs out of the way, leaving just a small circular side table in the middle of the space and an expanse of unencumbered carpet. I placed two plates on the table and stood back to survey my work. Jethro lifted his eyebrows at me while I arranged the furniture. He stood off to one side, holding the donuts and his own coffee. What are you doing? Setting the stage. For what? Be quiet. Let me think. I studied the setup and decided it would have to do. I grabbed the box of donuts. He procured four, all with icing, and placed one on each plate. I set the remaining two still in the box on the kitchenette table. Okay. I grabbed his hand and pulled him over to the small table, motioning for him to sit on the carpet. Let's have donuts. He sat. Actually, he semi-lounged. Jethro placed his coffee on the small table and leaned back at an angle on one arm, his long legs stretched out in front of him, crossed at the ankles. My tummy fluttered with excitement as I sat on the floor next to him and picked up the frosted confection. I was going to smudge the corner of my mouth with frosting. And then he was going to lick it off. And then we were going to kiss. And then good things after that. Hopefully including, but not limited to, rolling around and making out on the carpet like teenagers. Holding Jethro's eyes with mine, which were heavily lidded and hot with interest, I took a small bite, careful to dab the side of my mouth with the frosting. But then something unexpected happened, and it startled me out of my sexy thoughts. The donut was insanely delicious. Insanely delicious. It was still warm from the oven, and yet it melted on my tongue. It was sweet, but tempered by a center filled with rich, smooth, bitter, high-quality chocolate cream. Unable to help myself, I moaned. 
Oh, my God. Jethro's lips quirked to the side, his eyes on my mouth, and right on cue, he leaned forward. You have something just there. I ignored him, swatting his hand away and took another bite, speaking around a mouthful of heaven on earth. Holy shit, this is the best thing I've ever tasted. Jethro rolled his lips between his teeth, his eyes bright with laughter, and watched me devour the donut. I continued to moan with each bite, licking and sucking my fingers until it was gone. Completely preoccupied, I didn't notice a shift in his mood at first. I was just about to lick off the last of the cream when he caught my wrist, forcing my attention to him. My protest died on my lips as the weight and intensity of his gaze hit me all at once. He looked hungry. To be more precise, he looked ravenous. Jethro brought my finger to his lips and sucked it into his mouth, his tongue darting out to lick the junction between my index and middle finger. The light, slick touch sent unexpected trembles to my lower belly and pulled a soft whimper from the back of my throat. As I was saying, his darkened gaze drifted hotly from my eyes to my lips, and he used my hand as leverage to tug me forward. You have something. He didn't finish the sentence. Instead, he licked the corner of my mouth and then delved his tongue ardently between my lips, caressing mine hungrily. Jethro's grip on me shifted. His arm came around my waist, supporting me while my hands cupped his jaw. In a controlled and graceful movement, he rolled me onto my back, held himself above my body, and claimed my mouth. I felt his fingers on my thigh, sliding the hem of my skirt higher, skimming fingertips between my legs. Instinctively, I arched and strained, wanting to be touched, needing him to touch me. Undo your shirt. He ordered, pulling his mouth from mine and fastening it to my neck. Why don't you... Because I'll rip it off. Well, okay then. With eager fingers, I undid the buttons while he pressed his thigh between my legs, sliding against me. The rhythm was both intoxicating and frustrating. I felt empty, greedy for his skin. When I finished with my top, I set to work on his buttons. But he batted my hands away, his mouth moving to the center of my breast, groaning as he sucked me through the black mesh of my bra and into his mouth. Mindlessly, my hips rocked, searching for friction, for his touch. I don't know if it was the donut, food of the gods, or the sexy, sexy man above me, but I was already hovering on the edge of my orgasm. Please, I panted, grabbing his hand from where he drew light circles on my thigh and pressing it to the front of my panties. His eyes blazed a trail from my breasts, over my exposed throat to my lips. He slipped his fingers into the lace waistband with achingly slow and measured movements, stroking a tight circle around my center while bending his head and licking my lips. Please, I said again, chasing his mouth as he withdrew, his teeth and tongue skillfully lavishing my jaw, neck and shoulder with biting kisses. You were so lovely, he said his voice a deep growl, and these sounds you're making. He paused as though we were listening. I hadn't realized, but I was making sounds, soft, impassioned hitches in my breathing. Our eyes clashed. His were darker than usual. These desperate little moans. I'll never get enough of them. Never get enough of you. I began to spiral, holding his wrist as I curved my body toward his expert touch, unable to control or stifle my cries of ecstasy. That's right, ecstasy. Pure, one million percent, solid gold ecstasy. He felt so good. I forgot how percentages worked. And he must have known what he was doing, because as soon as the first wave of ecstasy receded, he stroked me again hitting all the right spots, faster and harder than before. I lost my mind a little after that, lost even more control of my response, lost my ability to temper the volume of my enthusiasm. In retrospect, I remembered grabbing fistfuls of his shirt, the sound of his name tumbling over and over from my lips, how his pants-clad legs slid against my bare thighs, how he captured my mouth at my peak, and gave me a hot, crushing, devouring kiss. 
And then I was falling slowly, drifting on a cloud back to earth, being wrapped in his strong arms, gathered to his chest. He pressed his lips to my forehead in a cherishing kiss as I clung to him, feeling every inch claimed, though he was still fully clothed. Jethro holding me was ecstasy. That's right, ecstasy. That's what it was. Chapter 24 As long as I could hear his voice, I was quite lost, quite blind, quite outside my own self. Anais Nin Jethro Holding Sienna was hard. No, scratch that. I was hard while holding Sienna. Holding Sienna was heavenly. That's better. I smoothed my hand up and down her back, down the silky skin of her lush thighs, and over her magnificently rounded backside, sadly still covered in lace panties. Her satin soft curves beneath my fingers did very little to help the rigid situation south of my belt. But that's all right. It fed a different addiction. Now that I touched her, watched, and felt her come, I was mentally rearranging my schedule for the rest of my life. I was going to do this every day, touching her now after her gratifyingly loud and spectacularly animated release calmed me even as it stoked a frenzied fire of need. I wanted to touch her everywhere and for always. What are you thinking about? She asked, snuggling closer and fitting her leg between mine. The action gave me more access to her thigh, specifically the innermost expanse of soft skin. I'm probably going to be a very tactile boyfriend, I said against her forehead, taking advantage of her new position by trailing the back of my knuckles between her legs. Her breath hitched. How do you feel about public displays of affection? I asked. Sienna responded on a whisper. Are you talking about holding hands or something that could get us arrested? Someplace in between. Jethro, if you keep doing what you're doing... I don't care if it's doggy style on the red carpet, just as long as it's with you. Well, now, that conjured all kinds of pleasant images. I know it's not polite to remark on the status of a lady's panties, but my woman was wet and supple, swollen and aroused. My thoughts naturally shifted to how very satisfying the feel of her would be right this minute, just as she was, especially given the state of my head right this minute. Fuck. I groaned. Okay, she said. I laughed. Removing my fingers reluctantly from between her legs, I grabbed a handful of her backside. I'm gonna kiss this. She giggled and nipped at my neck. You should. We should start every day with you kissing my ass, both figuratively and literally. I laughed again, kissing her forehead and tightening my arm around her shoulders. But then she said, I'm serious. This is me officially petitioning that you and I start sleeping together. How do we make that happen? I tensed, because to say I liked the idea, a lot, would be an understatement. But I was trying to be careful with this thing between us. Clearing my throat, I proceeded with caution. So, I build things. I work with wood. I'd like to work with your wood. She mumbled, and I knew she was trying to make a joke. I heard vulnerability in the joke, the way she couldn't quite meet my eyes. She was clearly nervous, perhaps feeling like she'd revealed too much with her official petition, been too forward. I leaned back so she could see me smile, but also so I could see her and gauge her reaction as I spoke. As a carpenter, I know for a fact if you want something to last, you have to build it to last. If we wanted to establish something lasting... We can't build our foundation on just the physical. You mean lust? I smirked at the disappointment in her tone. Yeah, I guess I do. Even if we have enough lust between us to build a city. This earned me a quick smile, but she continued to press. We don't have to do anything. We could just sleep. Cuddle. What do you think the chances of us just sleeping would be? Because I don't think they're very good. I'm up for the challenge. I'm not. Another quick, surprised grin claimed her features, revealing dimples and brightening her eyes. So you find me irresistible? I answered immediately, with blunt honesty. Yes. 
She grinned wider, then tried to wipe the excited happiness from her face and replace it with solemnity. I believe in you, Jethro. I think you can resist. Don't sell yourself short. Now she was teasing. You're wrong. I wasn't teasing, and pressure was building at the base of my skull because I was about to admit to something that might send her running. She continued to tease. I sleep in footy pajamas. I own three pairs. No one is sexy in footy pajamas. Sienna? And I have a variety of green beauty masks I can wear to bed. I think one is even called repellent. It smells like wet dog. I haven't been with a woman in five years. And I... I... She stuttered, stopped, and stared at me, blinking and edging an inch away, seeing his lips parted and her eyes went wide. What? What did you say? I haven't been with anyone in five years. You mean you haven't been in a relationship for five years? I searched her expression as I spoke, looking for some sign as to how much of a big deal this would be for her. Well, that's true, too. I haven't had a girl since high school, to be honest. But what I meant is, I haven't, um, slept with anyone in over five years. Whoa. Whoa. Her first woe was an inhale, a gasp, and the second woe was an exhale, a sigh. I watched her, keeping my gaze steady. Though her dark eyes were expressive, I was having a hard time getting a read on her thoughts. Abruptly, she removed her leg from between mine, pulled down her skirt to cover herself, and demanded, But why? Why would you do that? Not only to yourself, but to all the single ladies. Because I didn't want to hurt anybody. Propping myself up on my elbow, I cupped her cheek, pushing my fingers into her hair and caressing the smooth gold skin of her neck. I had a problem, treating women like they were disposable. Were you a sex addict? I frowned at her question, having not considered that possibility before, but then dismissed it. No, I don't think so. I was addicted to the lifestyle, not one thing in particular. Though addicted might not be the right word. More like it was all I knew. Using women had been part of the lifestyle of the club. When I left, I had to break all those patterns and habits. I stopped drinking, messing around, stealing cars, lying, cheating, conning. I went to school, to work, and kept my ass at home every night until new habits formed. Better habits, until I trusted myself. Do you drink now? Yeah, but not to excess like before. When did you start going out again? At night? A few years back, but not every night, and not to places where trouble would find me. She studied me from where she lay on the carpet, her brow pensive. You drink in moderation. You go out in moderation, so why not date in moderation? Because drinking and going out only have ramifications for me. Dating in moderation, as you put it, comes with the possibility of hurting someone else. Something clicked behind her gaze. You didn't want to lead someone on. I nodded, because that was exactly right. You mean to tell me you haven't met a woman you liked in the last five years? I've met plenty of women I like, but I'd always decide to wait a little longer. When push came to shove, I found it plenty easy to walk away. Her pretty eyes widened until they were almost round. But not with me? Not with you. Why? I searched her gaze, found myself lost in her eyes. Getting a sense I was taking too long to answer a question I finally just admitted. I honestly don't know. It's everything about you, I guess. Everything together that makes you impossible to leave, impossible to forget. And that was the truth. Her cheeks warmed with a pleased blush at my words. Jethro? She said my name tenderly, lifted her chin as though to kiss me, but I evaded her mouth. There's more. More? Sienna's mahogany gaze widened again, her lush lips forming circle and a pout. I had to bite my lip to keep from biting hers. Yeah. I nodded firmly, gritting my teeth and stealing my resolve. I decided a long time ago that I wouldn't. That the next woman I made love to would be my wife. She stared at me, her eyes growing impossibly wider. Seeing I was serious, she jerked backward and sputtered. But, but... What about... Apparently having trouble forming the words, Sienna motioned to her body with stilted movements, then blurted. What do you call what we just did? 
I tried to keep a smile from my face because she was just too fucking cute. Third base. She growled, lifted up on her elbow and jabbed a finger at my chest. Well, I call that making sweet, sweet love, Buster. You're right. That was sweet. But I'm talking about a home run and you know it. I kept my tone reasonable and gentle. She was teetering on the edge of real anger, her eyes flashing fire. I reached for her. She began to draw away, but I held on. Bringing her palm to my heart, I laid it all out. I'm falling for you, Sienna. I have been since I helped you down from my truck the first day when you were lost. You touched my hand and that was it. Whatever you want to call it. I was hooked. I am hooked. It might be an arbitrary line in the sand, but I needed the line to keep me walking the straight and narrow. Wanting to wait doesn't mean I don't want you. I know. She admitted reluctantly, and I saw she was melting, her expression a mixture of helpless and hopeful. You are pure evil, telling me this now, now that I'm addicted to you. A twinge of regret, of concern that I inadvertently hurt her, had me frowning, and I scooched an inch away. I see. She grabbed fistfuls of my shirt and tugged me closer. No, no, no. You're not going anywhere. Don't even think about it. I wasn't going anywhere. I said, my voice rough. I brushed a sheet of soft, thick hair from her shoulders, trying to ignore my desire to wrap my fingers in it and pull, expose her neck, bite, and mark her perpetually sun-kissed skin. I'm just sorry if you feel I misled you. I don't. She shook her head. I don't. I mean, when would you have brought it up before now? I appreciate you being so understanding. Her mouth opened and closed as she stared at me, finally saying, I understand, but I don't. I mean, if you're in a committed relationship, and since we've discussed the possibility of forever, I would call this a committed relationship. I don't see the need to wait until marriage. I don't understand that. But given what you've told me about your past, I understand that you might not trust yourself. And so you, as you say, drew an arbitrary line in the sand. I slid my hand down her body, feeding and torturing my need to touch her until my fingers met the bare skin of her thigh. I made the decision in order to keep from hurting someone again. Sure, okay, maybe. I'll buy that. If you know sex is off the table, you won't be motivated by it. She squinted at me. But maybe it's also a way to keep yourself from getting hurt. Maybe it keeps you from losing control, from fully investing in someone who might leave you. I glared at her. Her word struck a chord, and it was an uncomfortable one. My first instinct was to reject her assessment. Of course, I wasn't trying to protect myself. That was just silliness. That would make my sacrifice a selfish one. But the longer she stared at me with her serene expression, patience in her eyes, the better I could see past my initial impulse. I like to think I could have settled down a hundred times over in the five years, but that wasn't true. I have a healthy dose of ego and self-confidence, quite possibly bordering on arrogance. But when it got down to brass tacks, what woman worth having would want me for something other than a flame? What are you thinking? My gaze cut to hers, to this gorgeous, clever, strong woman, and I made two decisions. First, I might not ever truly deserve her, but I would work every day to be a man who did. I would work to merit her trust, loyalty, and love. I would earn it, no matter how freely she might be willing to give it. Second, I was going to break my rule. I was going to make love to her when that's what it was. It wouldn't be just sex, and it certainly wouldn't be fucking around. When the time was right, regardless of whether or not we were married... I was going to take that gamble. Jethro? Her eyes were wide and her features bracing. My silence and look in my eye must have been making her nervous. I was just thinking. I tempered my expression, gave her a warm smile, and kissed her shoulder. We should get Daisy's Donuts every morning. Chapter 25 Aging is not lost youth but a new stage of opportunity and strength. Betty Frieden Sienna Susie arrived just as Jethro was leaving. He tipped his hat with a rumbly, ma'am, needing to bend at an angle to clear the trailer door because he was so tall. She didn't say anything, just turned her head as he walked past, 
her eyebrows suspended over a stunned blue gaze. We both watched him saunter away through the south-facing window. Then she said, Whoa. I nodded, my eyes still on him in his audacious stride. Yeah, whoa. He turned the corner, slipped out of view, and then we both sighed. Nicely done. Susie patted me on the back. I grinned, biting my lip, feeling oddly shy. I know, right? And he's more beautiful on the inside than he is outside. How is that possible? Susie looked back to where he'd disappeared, frowning out the window. I shook my head slowly. I don't know. He looks like he's good with his hands. Immediately, I flushed scarlet, because I now had intimate knowledge of how very good he was with his hands. But then my heart twisted, because I might never know how good he was with other parts. Namely, his penis. And I really, really wanted to know what he could do with his penis. Based on the way he rolled his hips when we made out, I was pretty sure he was a master dill pickler, if you catch my meaning. Susie's gaze slid to mine, and she gave me an impish smile. Uh-huh. I laughed, hiding my face behind my fingers. Ah! Uh, I like him so much. She pushed my shoulder. Good. You're a gorgeous girl, but your real beauty lies within, doll. You deserve someone in your life who makes you happy. Thank you, Susie. She may have been my employee, and we might always have that barrier between us, but I didn't realize until that moment how much I'd needed someone to be happy for me. On that note, I needed to call my mom because I suspected she'd be happy for me. But then Susie had to add, and makes you moist. Thank, ah, I gagged, laughing again. She laughed too, wagging her eyebrows. I'm serious. I was worried about you last year. Tom is pretty, but I knew he wasn't the one for you. Well, what can I say? His looks and star power made me stupid for five minutes. We turned to the interior of the trailer, and she began setting up to do my makeup. But what's interesting, I continued, reaching for my coffee as I sat. Now, I don't find him attractive at all. I mean, I can see he's good-looking, but he does nothing for me. It's like I see him, and my vagina, afraid of his impotency, plays dead. She grinned at that. So, not moist? <laughs> no, not moist, I chuckled. More like a damp, wet blanket. Yes, I agree, she snickered, applying the undercoat to my face and neck. We were quiet for a while, and I found myself smiling at intervals, remembering events from the morning, some small thing Jethro had done or some detail about his face. And then I would frown, because of the giant celibate elephant in the room. And then I'd smile again, because he'd kissed me senseless before leaving. I was lost in these reflections when Susie, who apparently had been lost in her own reflections, broke our comfortable silence and offered philosophically, Think of how much better the world would be if people craved compliments about the beauty of their heart rather than the beauty of their face. The unexpected wisdom of her words startled me. I smiled softly at my surprised expression, and I found myself looking at her, entranced. I noticed, maybe for the first time in our acquaintance, she had wrinkles around her eyes and her mouth, deep, crinkling creases made deeper by her grin. They were laugh lines, and they were breathtaking. And so was she. Why do I feel so weird about this? Jethro slid his eyes to mine, then back to the road. I don't know. She doesn't bite. I stared at the artichoke dip I held on my lap. You have dinner with her every Sunday. He nodded. That's right. I'm meeting the woman you've had dinner with every Sunday for over five years. She's not a relative. She's a friend. A good friend. I reiterated the facts. Yup. I'm meeting the other woman. Or am I the other woman? Jethro lifted an eyebrow at me. Neither of you are the other woman. There's no reason to be uncomfortable. I'm not uncomfortable. 
I'm just feeling weird, and I don't know how to unweird myself. Well, don't unweird yourself on my account. I like you weird, and Claire will too. We drove in silence, me with my thoughts, Jethro with his, until I blurted, I just don't understand how you have dinner with a woman once a week, every week, who isn't a relative, and not try to make a move. I didn't add, especially this woman. Last Tuesday, Jess, Dwayne's girlfriend, had shown me a picture of Claire. I'd mentioned to Jess that Jethro and I were going over to Claire's house for dinner, and Jess pulled out her phone to show me a picture. Apparently, they were really good friends and taught together at the local high school. I momentarily forgot how to blink because this Claire woman was gorgeous. No, that's not right. She was fuckingly gorgeous. She was so gorgeous, her beauty deserved the F-bomb used as an adverb. How could Jethro spend time with her every week, week after week, and not succumb to her? Cletus told me she was tough and smart. Dwayne told me she was sweet and kind. Bo told me she was a great cook and had real pretty eyes. Roscoe told me she was his favorite teacher in high school, and he'd paired that statement with an eyebrow wag. Side note, Roscoe was too freaking adorable for his own good. And side note. Billy, however, had remained stonily silent on the matter of Claire. I was growing accustomed to Billy's stony silence. So why hadn't Jethro made a move? I was already a little in love with her, and I hadn't even met her yet. Not every week. Sometimes I have to travel for work. On those Sundays, my mama would invite Claire over for dinner. But, as far as I know, she never. Jethro's easy expression morphed into a thoughtful frown, his eyes growing unfocused, like he'd just realized something of importance. She never what? He shook himself. Sorry. She never accepted the invitation. She hasn't been to our house since she was a teenager. You didn't answer my question. Why haven't you made a move on Claire? According to your family and Jess, she's an ethereal goddess of perfection. Jethro rolled his eyes. Yeah, well, I know Claire better than they do. She's human enough, got scars and flaws like everybody else. Plus, I don't think about her that way. We've known each other since we were kids. She's like a sister to me. Objectively, I can see that. Ashley is beautiful on the outside, but when I look at her, I see her heart and her warts in equal measure. It's the same with Claire. Okay, that makes sense. But just so you know, I have no warts. I am an ethereal goddess of perfection. Jethro grinned, pulling onto a long dirt driveway leading to a small white farmhouse with a red door and navy trim. I never doubted it. His eyes conducted a quick appreciative sweep of my body before he closed them briefly and exhaled, like he was trying to control himself. Meanwhile, my stomach was a bundle of nerves. Despite what he said, with his sister just recently returned after an eight-year absence and the passing of his mother, Claire was the woman in his life. She was important to him. They may have never been romantically involved, but what she thought mattered. Also, she was single. Jethro told me she was an only child and had no family to speak of. She had no other person in her life to make dinner for on Sundays. I felt like a usurper. I also felt a little irritated with her for making me feel like a usurper, even though she'd done nothing but exist. How's that for mental health? Claire's house had flowers and boxes under the windows and along the porch. Gorgeous, neatly trimmed topiaries sat on either side of the porch steps and the door. The house looked like something out of a magazine. Wow, I said, scanning the front yard. This is a really pretty house. Jethro grinned like he was proud. It is, right? I added the porch two years ago. The boxes were Claire's idea last spring. I painted them to match the trim. I gaped at Jethro. You built her porch? He nodded, completely clueless as to how that news sounded to me. I did, and the gazebo and deck out back. I've done a little work around the house, from time to time. 
A little work? Oh, you know, like building porches, decks, and gazebos. Maybe this news wouldn't have struck me so acutely if Jethro and I had been together longer, or if we'd been physically intimate since the Daisy Donut incident last Monday. But we hadn't. This thing between us was new and tentative and just a week old. Dating a guy who wasn't trying to get in my pants every ten minutes was a new experience for me. It was... unnerving. Good, but unnerving nonetheless. Thus, I couldn't think of a single thing to say that wasn't a joke, so I just stared at his dashboard. Jethro parked and grabbed the pie he'd made from the back seat. I took the opportunity of him walking around the truck to take a deep breath, giving myself a mental pep talk. You've got this. You go in there and be charming. You charm the freckles off your face. Do it. He opened my door and helped me down, tangling our fingers together as we walked to her front door. Don't be nervous, he whispered, squeezing my hand. I'm not nervous. I'm Sienna. How many times do I have to tell you my name? The terrible joke slipped from my mouth before I could catch it. He cocked an eyebrow at me, his lips twisting, then flattening, but said nothing. I was nervous. Maybe... Jethro, Claire, and I can live together in harmony. Maybe she can be my sister wife. Yes, that was the answer. She could have a pretty farmhouse and custody of Jethro on Sundays. I could have him the rest of the week. And if she touched him, I would claw her eyes out. Perfect solution. Jethro knocked on the door, then slid his eyes to mine. You look like you're anticipating eating a bug. I didn't get a chance to respond because Claire immediately opened the door, almost like she'd been lying in wait. And fuckingly hell. Claire was even more gorgeous in person. Hi, she shouted at me, her very pretty eyes, big and excited. Uh, I glanced at Jethro. He was no help, as his features were carefully expressionless, and he was looking above her head at the door jam, and managed to say, Hi. She stepped forward and pulled me into a hug. I'm so excited to meet you. She was still shouting. Jethro saved the dip, taking it from my hands so Claire could squeeze me tight. Our eyes met over her shoulder. He was trying not to laugh. Trying and failing. She pulled away, holding me by the shoulders. I'm sorry. I'm being weird. I'm just, I love you so much. My eyes widened at her confession, and she covered her mouth with her hands. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I'm just nervous. Look at me. I'm a terrible hostess. Please, come inside. She stepped back, stumbling over her own feet. She was clearly flustered, her cheeks burning red. I promised myself I wasn't going to be a creeper, and here I am, being a creeper. This last part she seemed to say to herself, and it was the best thing she could have said because now I was completely at ease. She was a fan. Claire McClure is a fan of Sienna Diaz. It never occurred to me that she would be a fan. Honestly, it didn't. Maybe I'd been spoiled by my time with Jethro and his family. They'd all been so cool about it, almost disinterested, whereas Claire was not disinterested. I promised myself I wasn't going to be weird either. I smiled at her, and she blinked at me like I was dazzling. You could never be weird, she said, her voice full of adoration, her eyes dazed and dreamy. All right, all right. Jethro grabbed my hand and pulled me inside, through a living room to the dining room. Stop being a wackadoodle, Claire. Pull yourself together and shut the door. We have dip. Was for dinner. Claire wasn't quite an ethereal goddess of perfection, but she was pretty darn close. And she was an excellent cook. Everything was comfort food, but with a twist. Homemade crusty Italian bread with red pepper cherry preserves and goat cheese as a delicious variation on bruschetta. Oh yeah, she made the goat cheese herself. From goats. Her neighbor's Nigerian pygmy goats. She also made the preserves. She canned her own jams and jellies. For the main course, she'd made macaroni and cheese, but 
with spinach ziti and an Asiago Alfredo lobster sauce. She made her own pasta. The salad was made with romaine lettuce, peppers, chives, and tomatoes from her summer garden. It tasted like fresh heaven. Bickering with Jethro, talking about cooking, and my compliments about her food, seemed to pull her out of the starstruck trance. Jethro knew just what buttons to push, and I followed his lead when she stared at me or vocalized, ad nauseum, how much she loved my movies and how she admired me and that I smelled really, really good. But by the end of dinner, thanks in large part to Jethro, she'd relaxed. We both relaxed. And I discovered I had a little bit of a crush on Claire McClure. Yes, yes! Buster Keaton was brilliant. I pointed at Claire, nodding enthusiastically. We were discussing silent film movie greats, and, as it turns out, we had the same opinions about everything. Don't get me wrong. Charlie Chaplin was wonderful in The Gold Rush. I love a good chicken soup gag. But I don't think you can compare it to The General. I mean, that train was moving the whole time, and he's jumping on and off like it's a trampoline. So much, yes. He was a physical comedian, but not in the same way as Chaplin. His physical comedy was smarter, wittier, and his timing, huh, there has never been anything like it. And at the end, when he tries to kiss Annabelle but has to keep saluting the soldiers, we both giggled, remembering the same point in the movie. Claire mimed the salute scene, perfectly mimicking Buster Keaton's exasperation, launching us into renewed laughter. Jethro snagged my attention, slipping his fingers into mine and bringing my knuckles to his lips for a soft kiss. His smiling eyes ensnared me, heated and cherishing, making me feel warm and cherished. He looked happy. He gave my hand another squeeze, then stood, quietly picking up our plates and strolling out of the dining room. I've always said a man's place is in the kitchen. Claire lifted her voice so he could hear, winking at me. He must have heard her because he called back, Shut your mouth, woman, or you're not getting any pie. You brought pie? She hollered, suddenly serious. He didn't respond. She turned her attention to me. He brought pie? I didn't see pie when y'all walked in. I shrugged, hiding my smile behind a sip of wine. She didn't see the pie because it had taken her 30 minutes to stop staring at me when we arrived. Thank you so much for having me over. She smiled a brilliant smile, her cheeks blushing pink with pleasure. The next time we meet, I promise I won't go gaga again. And I'm so sorry about that. I see now that you're a normal person, just like everyone else. She nodded, then added with stellar comedic timing, except funnier, clever, and smelling like gardenias. Claire? And with my long eyelashes. Stop. I can't stop. Sorry. I grinned at her silliness. Please don't apologize. No, I will. I promised myself I wouldn't act like a fool. But faced with the reality of you on my front porch, I lost my mind, and I'm sorry. It might take me a little while, but I'll eventually stop putting my foot in my mouth. She lifted her glass of red wine toward me. Wine helps. <laughs> so call me when you're a half hour away next time and I'll drink a glass. We both laughed at this suggestion. She was the picture of charming self-deprecation. You two go for a walk. Jethro reappeared and began stacking the leftovers. I should help with the dishes. I stood to gather the glasses, but Jethro snatched the nearest one from my grip. Go on now. I want you to see the gazebo. I thought I might put something similar behind the old house, and I want your opinion. I knew what he was doing. Now that Claire wasn't tongue-tied, he wanted us to spend more time together. He wanted us to be friends. Things had been going swimmingly, but now a stirring of self-consciousness reignited in my stomach. Being Sienna Diaz's movie star was easy. Tiring, but easy. It was a role, a mask I could slip on at will. Being myself wasn't usually as easy. Jethro had made it easy for me, which was one of the reasons I loved being around him. I glanced from him to Claire. She was watching me with hopeful eyes. I'll bring the wine, 
she offered, grinning at me. I promise I won't smell you again unless you want me to. And again, just like that, my nerves dissipated. I'll only go if you promise to smell me. Deal. She hit the table as she stood and then plucked her wine glass and the bottle from the table. But seriously, you do smell good. What perfume do you wear? I followed her out the French doors that led off the dining room, catching Jethro's small, pleased smile as he turned back to the kitchen. Honestly, I don't even know. My sister sends it to me. She also buys all of my other products. Makeup, moisturizer, shampoo, everything. And I use what she sends. Do you mind asking her for me? I can't find anything I like. Sure, absolutely. I made a mental note to have a bottle of whatever it was sent over, because the goat cheese alone deserved a hundred gallons of fancy perfume. Claire and I crossed her deck down the steps to a flagstone path. The gazebo was in the distance, illuminated by floodlights, and covered in blooming fuchsia bougainvillea and white jasmine. The night air smelled heavenly. This is beautiful. I skimmed my fingertips over the white flowers. Jethro built it a few years ago, and I trained the vines to climb the lattice. This is my favorite time of year to be outside. There's nothing quite like the smell of jasmine and a starry summer sky. Plus, in a little bit, the lightning bugs will come out and give us a good show. I inspected the craftsmanship of the gazebo, noting the small details along the rail. Vines and long-petaled flowers etched into the cedar. Did Jethro do the carving, too? She nodded proudly. Yes, he did. That boy can do just about anything with wood. I lifted an eyebrow at that, how it sounded, but knew she'd meant it innocently. The carvings were beautiful. This must have taken forever, I mumbled to myself. How long had he spent working on this gazebo? Claire's house was finished and perfect. Meanwhile, his own home wasn't even half restored. The silence stretched. I felt Claire's eyes on me, so I lifted mine to hers. She wore a small smile, her blue eyes clever and assessing. I had the distinct impression she could read my thoughts. She gathered a deep breath and sat on the swinging bench, her eyes never leaving mine. I'm really glad I had the opportunity to meet you. Her voice sounded different, deeper, wiser, her giddy silliness now subdued. I strolled to the swinging bench and sat next to her. We should get together again before I leave. I can cook next Sunday if you want. If you don't mind my tagging along. Not all the time. I don't want to impose. But I'll still be here for a month or more and... But I won't be. You won't be? I frowned at her, not understanding. That's right. I won't be here. I was called last month by a friend of mine who works for a community college in Nashville. They're looking for an adjunct to teach music theory and drama. She thought I might be a good fit. I interviewed two weeks ago and... She shrugged, her eyes drifting over my shoulder. I got the position and I'm going to take it. Oh. I blinked at her. My heart sank. Jethro didn't say anything. Claire studied me, the side of her mouth hitching with a soft smile. Jethro doesn't know yet. I felt my eyebrows jump. Jethro doesn't know? No. She shook her head, her soft smile dropping from her lips, but lingering behind her eyes. I'm so happy for Jet. I'm so happy he found you. His heart was lost, lonely, and now it's not, and that's because of you. Perhaps my time in Hollywood spent amongst image-obsessed double-talkers had changed my expectations of conversation, but the emotion, sentiment, and sincerity behind Claire's words caught me completely off guard. I opened my mouth to respond, but found myself at a loss. She reached forward and covered my hand with hers. I hope I'm not putting too much pressure on you or making too many assumptions. No. No, not at all. Where Jethro is concerned, please, put all the pressure on me. Pile it on. She chuckled. Good. I'm glad to hear it. He deserves to be happy, and so do you. We shared a smile, then swung in silence.
turning our attention to the stars in the sky. I used the time to organize my thoughts regarding Claire, while endeavoring to stealthily scrutinize her. This woman in Jethro's life was on the precipice of leaving it. I suspected that as much as she'd been a constant for him, he'd been a constant for her. So why was she leaving town? Why now? Before I realized I was speaking, I thought and asked at the same time, Claire, when did you decide to take this new job? Her bright eyes cut to mine, seeming to glow like sapphires with their own internal brilliance. I guess I made up my mind on Tuesday. When will you tell him? I don't know. Not yet. Probably not till my bags are packed and I'm on the other side of the state. I don't really like goodbyes. So he'll understand. I'm not leaving the country, just the county. I'll come back to visit. I inspected her open features, deciding that if she could be assertively candid, then I could too. I hope this is a silly question, but you're not leaving because of me, are you? No. She responded too quickly, sighed, then amended. Not really. Not in the way you think. There's no reason for me to stay here. There hasn't been a reason for a long time. Her gaze moved to her fingers and she fiddled with the band-aid wrapped around her thumb. Has Jethro told you about my, uh, husband? About Ben? Yes, he told me what a wonderful man he was. He was wonderful. Her smile was sad and she lifted her eyes to the sky when we first got the news about Ben. I told myself I was staying to help his parents and to help Jethro. I wanted to be there, here, in case they needed me. But it's been five years, five years of hiding away in this pretty house, with its pretty garden, watching the world go by. Her gaze dropped to mine, and she added in a cheerful tone, Even the McClure's are trying to get me moving. In fact, Carter McClure, Ben's daddy, was the one to put my name on the short list for this position. We shared a smile. Silence stretched. Seconds turned to minutes. Claire's eyes turned unfocused and introspective, and she frowned. I ran into somebody on Tuesday. Someone I used to know. I wanted to ask her who it was, but her voice was distracted as though she spoke without consciously meaning to do so. I waited for her to continue. We had ugly words. She shook her head, clearly trying to dispel the memory. I left him, and I felt lost and upset. And then Jethro called, sounding so happy, asking if he could bring you to dinner. Both things happening on the same day felt like a sign. I always told myself I would leave when Jethro was settled, when the McClears were in a good place. How do you think Jethro will take the news? I honestly wanted to know because I worried for my guy. Jet? Oh, he'll be fine, no doubt. He just wants me to be happy. She wrinkled her nose at my concern like I was silly. I think you two should move into the house after I leave, if I may be so bold. You'll have no privacy at the Winston place with those boys, and Jethro has done so many upgrades here. This place feels more like his than mine. I glanced over my shoulder at the pretty house and spotted Jethro, just stepping out of the French doors. When an opportunity presents itself, and you have a choice of either living life, risky as it might be, or continuing to do what's expected, Claire paused, waiting for me to meet her gaze, a knowing smile curving her lips. She was quoting me, one of my favorite lines from my first film, Taco Tuesday, I returned her grin and finished the quote. You have to grab that regal centaur by the mane and ride it over the rainbow of opportunity. We finished together. Or, or else it, it might mistake, mistake you for a unicorn, unicorn and try to impregnate you. I love that movie. She grinned, shaking her head. I always thought, like a wackadoodle, that you and I would be best friends one day. Ah, I see. You've set this whole thing in motion between Jethro and me just so we could meet and be best friends. She shrugged, then giggled. You make me sound like Cletus. 
That made us both laugh again. I watched her, feeling humbled and oddly light, because this woman loved my films and wanted to be my friend. And Claire McClure was clearly one of those rare souls who was more concerned with the beauty of her heart than she was with the beauty of her face. I decided I loved her. It was friend love at first sight. I would be sad to see her move away. I also decided if things didn't work out with Jethro, I would ask her to marry me and request she make goat cheese bruschetta every Sunday. Chapter 26 Things are sweeter when they're lost. F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Beautiful and Damned. Sienna. Ten days after the donut dalliance and four days after dinner with Claire, I called my mother. I called her after a date with Jethro. Technically, it had been our fourth date, if you counted the disaster at the front porch over a month ago as our first date, and my introduction to Daisy's Donuts as our second date. Our third date had been a middle-of-the-night movie date in Knoxville. Tonight, our fourth date had consisted of a dinner picnic and dancing on the prairie. Afterward, he dropped me off at the cabin, giving me a toe-curling, spine-tingling kiss. He left me, alone to my bed in wishful thoughts for the remainder of the night. I didn't count dinner with his family or Claire as a date. I'd given the matter a lot of thought, defining what was a date and what wasn't. Because by now, I figured we should be ending the night at the very least, necking and making out in his truck. But that wasn't happening. So I called my mother. Sienna, mija, you're calling? What happened? Are you okay? She sounded concerned. We had scheduled a call every Sunday night when I was filming because my work schedule and her work schedule were so crazy. In between films, I would fly home and spend a few days with her and dad. We frequently texted during the week, sharing funny thoughts or I love yous or I'm going to strangle your father. But Sunday was our day to talk. We'd missed our last two Sunday calls, which happened from time to time, so I hadn't told her about Jethro yet. Today was Thursday, and it was past midnight for me, so I understood her concern. Nothing has happened. Nothing bad, anyway. I just... I just wanted to talk to you. Oh. I heard her release a relieved breath. I'll never turn down a call from my lovely daughter. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I said, nodding even though she couldn't see me. Actually, mamita, I'm good, but I need your advice. Beaks. What? Whatever it is, use beaks. <laughs> I rolled my eyes. Usually when I called unexpectedly, it was because I had a cold or some other mysterious ailment and needed my mother's soothing presence and her medical expertise. I don't think Vix is going to work this time. Oh, well then sex. I coughed, choking on nothing. What? Sex, mija. You sound on edge. You need a release. This was a new approach, much blunter than usual. Typically, she'd say, you need a man. Let me set you up. I know a nice boy. When I was younger, I didn't understand her meaning, and I would grow indignant, angry she thought I needed a man. But as I grew older and heard her say the same thing to my older sisters, I realized, you need a man meant you need to get laid. But this was the first time she'd just come right out and said it. My neck heated with the involuntary blush, but I pressed on. So, that's sort of what I want to talk to you about. Oh? She sounded surprised. Do you need some resource materials? Toys? No! I blurted, huffing a laugh. No, I... I met someone. Oh! She sing-songed. I could almost see her wailing in her seat, the giant grin on her face. Tell me about him. Does he need resource materials? Now, I was really laughing, but chided. Mamita, let me speak. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I gathered a breath for courage, because Marta's reaction, for better or for worse, had me feeling gun-shy about sharing Jethro with my family. His name is Jethro. He's a wildlife park ranger here in Tennessee. I paused, bracing myself for her reaction. 
She didn't say anything at first, and my heart rate doubled. I was just about to make a joke when she said, In the Old Testament, Jethro was the name of Moses' father-in-law. That will make Abuela very happy. It's a good name. And he treats you well, with kindness. I collapsed onto my bed, my heart swelling with gratitude. Clearly I'd been silly to think my mother would share any of Marta's concerns. Thank God for my mother. Yes, he treats me so well. He is amazing. Tell me about your young man. Leave nothing out. I smiled at the ceiling of stars above me and spent the next half hour telling her everything. Well, almost everything. I didn't tell her about how we almost had sex against a tree behind his house, or how we'd attacked each other in my trailer after I ate the world's best donut. I shared details about his past, a little about Ben, nothing about his criminal pursuits or the iron wraiths, enough to make it clear he'd made poor decisions as a youth but had changed his ways. I finished telling her about our first two dates and moved on to date three. So, I mentioned to him last week while we were driving to the set, he still drives you every morning? Yes, we drive in together in the mornings, and then usually after work we have dinner with his family. His brothers, and his sister and her fiancé, and his family, they are good people. Yes, they are the best, the best. They kind of remind me of the Marx Brothers, the shenanigans and hijinks. I love them. That's good. Your children will resemble, in looks and temperament, your husband's siblings and your siblings. I tried to feel irritated she would jump to this conclusion, that we might be getting married and having children, but all I felt was excitement. Even so, I reprimanded her. Mamita, we've just started dating. I couldn't have her getting carried away. One of us needed to be sensible. Yes, but you are telling me about him. You've never told me about anyone before. He is the one. I feel it in my bones, and my bones never lie. And you spend so much time with him, in the mornings before work, in the evenings. Do you still enjoy his company? Yes, so much. Spending time with him is comforting and thrilling and energizing. He is so easy to be around and to talk to. He makes everything calmer, but more exciting. I don't know how to describe it. It's like when we're together, we're in a bubble. Hmm. I could tell she was smiling, but she refrained from voicing her thoughts, instead putting the conversation back on track. You were saying about your third date. Oh, yes. I mentioned to him that I missed going to the movies as a spectator. You know, I haven't seen a movie, just gone to the theater to enjoy a film. Not a big splashy premiere for work, in years. So it turns out, Jethro knows the owner of an old theater in Knoxville, and he arranged for a midnight showing of Duck Soup. Ah, that's one of your favorites. Yes, I don't know how he knew that. He wouldn't reveal his sources, but he knew. I like this guy. I like him, too. My mother waited for me to continue. When I didn't, she prompted me. But? Closing my eyes, I released a long exhale. But after the movie, he drove me home, carried me upstairs because I was asleep, kissed me goodnight, and left. Okay. We kiss a lot but we've done nothing else for ten days. Again, she was quiet, but I could tell she was thinking, not waiting for me. Then she asked, What did you do tonight? Was it dinner with his family again? No. Tonight was a date. He made a picnic, and we had dinner on the prairie. And we danced. You danced? Yes. He made a playlist, and we danced. Then he brought me home, Kissed me goodnight as usual, and now here I am. What kind of music? I frowned, not understanding her question. What do you mean? What kind of music did he play? The playlist. Um, slow music. Ballads. Some Frank Sinatra, that kind of thing. He held you close the whole time. 
I thought about her question and realized she was right. Yes, he held me close the whole time. So you are doing more than just kissing. You think it's a mistake all those songs were slow? No. He wanted to touch you. He is sneaky and clever. I like him even more. Her conclusion made me feel better. Much better. And yet, I was still alone, tangled in want and frustration, wishing he were here. He is a gentleman. He sounds very complex. He has layers, like an onion. Exactly. He lives his life simply, but he's not simple. Well put. He's a man, mija. Men live simply, but are not simple. Boys are simple, but do not live simply. They don't understand what is important. Jethro isn't one of your boys. Your father and I, when we met, we were still very young. We became adults together. We grew together and challenged each other. Jethro is already a man. He will expect you to behave like a woman. He will challenge you. Are you ready to be so serious with someone? Yes, I answered without hesitation. I am. But I don't know what to do about the kissing. What do you mean? He wants to wait to have sex until he's married. I'm not sure how to initiate something other than a kiss. Again, my mother was quiet for a time, obviously thinking about this new information. Is he a virgin? Thankfully, the question sounded coldly clinical. Speaking to my mother about sex was always easier when she wore her doctor's hat. We'd always talked freely, but she was still my mother. No. Like I said, he didn't make good decisions when he was younger. I went on to rehash how he had been trying to redeem himself through his actions and had felt enforced celibacy for the last five years was necessary to avoid hurting anyone. I further explained that we'd been intimate in some ways, just the once, but he'd drawn the line in the sand regarding that one thing. I see. Again, she paused and deliberated. Before she could launch into a new set of questions, I added, I respect his decision, and I'm not pushing for him to cross that line. But it would be nice to do something other than kiss and dance. We spend very little time alone other than the time in the truck driving to work. I feel so much for him, and I love the time we spend together. And yet, when he leaves me at the end of the day, I have all this pent-up affection and no outlet. I heard her teeth click, and her tone change from clinical to mama bear. Well, you need to tell him that. You need to say exactly that. We're not living in Victorian times. I applaud you for supporting him and his boundaries. But you are feeling neglected. He doesn't have to break his vow in order to satisfy his woman. You need to tell him and give him a chance to make things right. I nodded, her words bolstering my confidence. Yes, you're right. I have resource materials if he needs them. I grinned, shaking my head. No, no, he doesn't need them. I just... You're right about everything. I know he wants me. She snorted. Yes, he wants you. Never doubt that, Mirmosa. He would be a sexist idiot if he did not. Thank you. It's the truth. You're very hot. Just like your mother. I shook my head and giggled. I will speak to him. If he is as you describe, if he is thoughtful and kind, then he will do something about your feelings. He will want to make things right for you, even if it makes things difficult for him. I frowned at this. What do you mean? Put the pieces together, Mika. He feels for you. He is a gentleman. He doesn't want to break his vow, but he wants you fiercely. It sounds like... He avoids situations that place him in temptation. Dinner with his family, late night movies so you'll be tired after, or leaving you at home early after a picnic. You are a very big temptation. So, should I not tempt him? Of course you should tempt him, she contradicted, then added in a sly tone. It's good for a man's soul to be tortured in this way. I frowned, not understanding how torturing Jethro was good for him. As though reading my mind, she huffed impatiently. Trust me, I am your mother. I know what's best.
Armed with my mother's advice, I waited. I didn't confront him. I just waited. Like a coward. I'd never been a coward before. It was an odd and unpleasant state of being. But it was also safe. Jethro didn't make me a coward. I made me a coward. More precisely, my feelings for him did. Every day, every moment we spent together, they grew bigger. And I grew quieter. I felt myself retreating, but didn't know what to do about it. Saying nothing felt so much safer than admitting the truth and risk pushing him away. And so, there we were, after our third midnight movie, sitting silently in his truck. We had time because Jethro only arranged for midnight movies on evenings when I didn't need to be up early the next day and he had the day off. I wasn't nearly as tired as the last two middle-of-the-night showings. Upon Dave and Susie's urging, I'd taken a nap in the afternoon. Jethro didn't appear to be tired either. He seemed wired, on edge. He'd kept shifting in his seat during the movie, especially when Humphrey Bogart grabbed Ingrid Bergman and kissed the hell out of her. Now the movie was over. We were both wide awake, staring out of the windshield of his truck, completely alone and nowhere to go. And I was hot. Thick, twisting tension coiled in my belly. I wanted him to touch me. But the celibacy elephant and three weeks of just kissing had me wondering how to ask. Or should I just touch him? Or what the hell was I supposed to do? It was the same debate I'd been having since the Daisy Donut dalliance. Hey. Jethro said, making me jump. He laughed lightly at my reaction, grinning at his steering wheel. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to startle you. I smiled at him, trying to swallow past these random nerves. Being awake and alone with him and not having some place to be felt significant. Foreboding. I wanted to make a joke, but I also didn't want to make a joke. So, hey. He started again, his voice quieter. Are you tired? No. Nope. Not tired. I shook my head more vehemently than necessary, as though I were denying an accusation of murder rather than sleepiness. His grin grew. You want to do something else? I nodded resolutely. Yes. But again, said nothing else, because I didn't want to start bartering for physical affection. This something else, will we be alone? Can we make out? What will it take for you to put your hand up my skirt? I'll make you a cake if you touch my boob. I bit my lip to keep from offering baked goods in exchange for intimacy. Jethro studied me, his eyes narrowing, his knuckles growing white where he gripped the steering wheel too tight. Shall we? He asked, his voice like gravel. I nodded, my heart fluttering. Yes, I whispered. He frowned his eyes dropping to my mouth and growing unmistakably heated. I held my breath and watched him, the air heavy between us, saturated with things unsaid. Breaking the moment, Jethro breathed out forcefully and suddenly, tearing his gaze away. He gritted his teeth and started the truck. We drove in silence. We drove in complete silence for a very long time. Complete silence being an unnatural state for us, only perpetuated the tension. Despite not wanting to make a joke, my desire to break the tension with levity grew and grew until I could contain it no longer. So I said, Knock, knock. His eyes flickered to mine, then back to the dark road. Who's there? Owl. Owl who? I'll give you a kiss if you tell me where we're going. Jethro's eyebrows furrowed for a split second. Then his brow cleared. The truck's headlights made his grim visible. The great thing about owl knock-knock jokes is that they work for everything, all situations, I said, using an instructional tone. I'll give you a high five if you help me with this thing. Or, I'll make you a cake if you stop being an asshole. He nodded his agreement, but his smile waned. Jethro pressed on the brake, slowing the truck and flipping on his right-turn blinker. I inspected the darkness beyond the windshield, seeing nothing but mountain road and forest. Then, quite suddenly, I spotted a turnoff. Large bushes concealed the view of a dirt path. I held on to the door and the armrest, the truck rocking back and forth as we traversed the uneven and unpaved road. We drove another three minutes, 
never exceeding ten miles per hour, nothing but inky darkness and the shadows of tall trees before Jethro said, This is Hawk's Field, or we're almost there, just another half mile. Hawk's Field? I echoed, the name sounding familiar, but I was unable to place it. That's right. I thought we could check out the stars. There are no lights up there, and it's a clear night. His voice was tight, but he sounded perfectly reasonable, his plan innocent. Nevertheless, his statement caused riots. My body was rioting. Is that really what he wants to do? Park in the middle of a field in the middle of the night and look at stars? That had to be code for something, right? Right? Before I knew it, he'd parked and stepped down from the truck, opening the door behind the driver's seat. The sound of him rummaging in the back of the cab woke me from my stupor. Shaking myself, I exited the vehicle. I dressed casually for our date, converse sneakers, black leggings, and a long-sleeved pink cotton tunic. I wasn't cold, but the air held a slight chill. If we'd stayed outside for too long, I'd likely become cold. I didn't want to stand around lamely, so I walked around to his side just as he tossed a bundle of something into the bed of the truck. Can I help? Jethro glanced over his shoulder. The interior lights of the truck illuminated his outline. Sure, hold this flashlight. I accepted the big flashlight and quickly found the on-off switch. Jethro tossed two more bundles onto the bed of the truck, then shut the cab doors, waving me forward to follow him to the back. He lowered the tailgate and with one impressive jump, hopped up to the bed, Dukes of Hazard style. Can you shine that in here just for a minute? Sure. I lifted the flashlight and peeked over the side so I could watch him work. The bundles he'd tossed in earlier were sleeping bags, blankets, and pillows. I stared at them and him as he worked, the earlier body riots continuing and increasing in severity. He was making a place for us to lie down, next to each other, so we could look at stars. Right. Are you okay? I blinked up at him. He was frowning at me. The line of his brow told me he was concerned. I nodded quickly. I'm good. Jethro glanced at the makeshift bed, then back to me, the line of his brow now determined rather than concerned. Let me help you up. Um, uh, no problem. I can do it. I placed the flashlight on the open tailgate and jumped up easily, using the strength in my arms to lift my body the rest of the way. I might not have been a sexy park ranger who hauled live black bears around and made it look easy, but I was a sexy Hollywood actress who did yoga daily. Despite my ability to climb into the truck bed without assistance, Jethro was right there before I could straighten. He slipped his arm around my waist and steadied me unnecessarily, holding my hand. His thumb swiped the inside of my wrist, and he brought me flush against him. As soon as I stood, he kissed me, a quick touch of his lips to mine. Then he kissed me again, and it felt unplanned, like he couldn't help himself. He lingered, punctuating each pass of his mouth with hungry nips of his teeth and licks of his tongue. His hands drifted lower, caressing and squeezing as they went. I've missed you. His voice was low, surprisingly desperate and gravelly. My head was swimming. He lifted my tunic, his large hot hands splaying on my sides, his thumbs drawing circles on the skin just beneath my bra, his lips lowered to my neck where he dotted the sensitive underside of my jaw with the same biting kisses. I inhaled sharply as he slid his fingers lower and into my leggings, grabbing handfuls of my backside. And then, with his pelvis pressed against my lower belly, I felt how much he'd missed me. Instinctively, I brought my fingers around to the front of his jeans, between us, and cupped him. He hissed his body growing tense and still as I rubbed with the base of my palm. My head swimming became brain-drowning, and I moaned, shifting an inch away and reaching for the buckle of his belt. His breathing quickened, and so did mine, and when I finally, finally circled my hand around his length, we both shuddered. I loved the feel of him, the dichotomy of hard and smooth, the involuntary, primitive, and yet controlled nature of his arousal. Taking action was always a choice. 
But the physical evidence of how Jethro saw me, how he desired me, wanted me, was raw and honest and impossible to deny. I needed to feel him, taste him, consume him. In much the same way I'd hoped Jethro would be insatiable for me, I was, in that moment, insatiable for him. And something happened that had never happened to me before. I actually wanted to give a man a blowjob. Not only did I want to do it, I felt like I might go batshit crazy if he didn't let me do it. I felt the frantic need in my chest and the tips of my fingers on my tongue and low in my belly. Armed with this need and intent on my goal, I began lowering myself to my knees, tugging his boxers and jeans down as I went. But Jethro, who had been standing so still as I touched him, as though he'd been afraid the moment would disappear or prove to be a figment of his imagination, stopped me. His eyes flew open, just visible under the starlight. His searched mine and gripped my arms to halt my movements. Wait. Wait. What are you doing? His words were breathless and held an unmistakable air of panic. I'm heading downtown, I answered, equally breathless. He blinked at me, didn't move, and said nothing. So I pushed his jeans down to his hips and moved to kneel. He stopped me again. Don't. I reached for him again, gripping the smooth, thick length of him and stroking, effectively cutting off his words. His eyes closed again, and his forehead met mine. But he didn't loosen his grip on my arms. Jethro, I want to. He groaned. It sounded tortured. And perhaps thinking about my mother in that moment was a little weird, but I did. Specifically, I thought about her words, it's good for a man's soul to be tortured in this way. Without thinking, I asked, are you afraid of temptation? He shook his head. God, no. Just being with you, just seeing you. Fuck. He mostly swallowed the expletive, his hips rolling in a way that made me think the movement was instinctual, then added on a rush, you breathing tempts me. That made my heart do happy backflips, and I smiled, feeling bolder. Lowering my voice to the octave reserved for seduction, I pressed, Then what are you afraid of? I'm not afraid. Then what? I don't want you to have any regrets. Oh, Jethro. I removed his fingers from my arm and placed them on my shoulder. Then I lifted my chin and gave him a tender kiss, a gentle kiss. Paired with my tight, rough strokes, I hoped it conveyed the weight of my affection, the complexity of my feelings. I will never regret you, I whispered solemnly. He released a shuddering sigh, and I felt some of his tension drain away. Those seemed to be the magic words, or maybe what I was doing inside his shorts was magical. Whatever it was, he didn't try to stop me this time as I knelt on the cushion provided by the sleeping bags, bringing his shorts all the way down as I lowered myself, enjoying the feel of his legs as I skimmed my fingers over his thighs and behind his knees. Darkness pressed in on us, cloaking my movements. Though I was greedy for the sight of him, the moonless night obscured his bare skin. But I could feel him, still heavy and hard and smooth. With no further prelude, I took him in my mouth and moaned. I moaned because a bone-deep satisfaction warmed my blood as he filled me. With each pass of my lips and each of his ragged breaths, a growing fulfillment blossomed, ballooned, eliminating the void carved out by weeks of frustrated longing. Now I was able to indulge myself. I felt the full weight of my desire. My pent-up frustration dissolved. I'd wanted to give without expectation of receiving, I'd wanted to suffocate him with affection and touch. I wanted to love him. And so I did. Chapter 27 No effort that we can make to attain something beautiful is ever lost. Helen Keller Jethro Sienna I reached for her. Jethro She stepped away. You're killing me here. You look healthy to me. 
she said, moving the flashlight up and down my person as I tried to buckle my belt. I tried to grab her again, but she moved away again, flicking off the flashlight, sitting and settling on top of the sleeping bags out of my reach. So I chased her, kneeling in front of her drawn-up legs and wrapping my hands around her thighs. You can't do what you just did. You mean give my boyfriend a spectacular blowjob? I frowned, because it was more than that. Calling what she'd done just a blowjob was like calling Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata just a song. It hadn't been part of my plan for the evening. I'd wanted a repeat of what happened after her first Daisy Donut, at the very least, but I'd hoped for more. More of her sweet sounds. More of her bare skin. I'd also planned to take my time with her body. Learn every soft curve. But she'd surprised me. In that moment, I'd never wanted anything more than her mouth on me. Although want might have been an understatement. You can't expect me not to want to return the favor. Again, want might have been an understatement. I tugged on her legs, already anticipating the taste of her. It wasn't a favor. Then a gift. It wasn't that either. Her tone was more serious than I'd expected, so I stopped tugging and endeavored to make out her features. It was dark, but we Winston boys could see better than most with very little light. With no moon in the sky, the stars alone illuminated her gorgeous face. I wanted to see her naked body under the starlight, her tits rise and fall with excited breaths as I slid my tongue inside her. Jesus fucking Christ, I couldn't breathe with how much I wanted her. Sienna turned her face away, giving me her profile. She looked to be studying the surrounding blackness. Sienna. I tugged on her legs once more, wanting her to lift her hips so I could ease down her tights and expose her exquisite skin. She covered my hands with hers, halting my movements, and she had emotion in her eyes as she brought them back to me. Why haven't you been coming inside my trailer? In the mornings? Her question sounded like an accusation. It took me a moment to respond, but then she cut me off with another question before I could. And why haven't you spent any alone time with me other than when we're rushing to the set, or to your house for dinner, or to the cabin? You just drop me off and leave. She sounded hurt, and her eyes were wide with it and her hurt burned me. See, Anna, I struggled for the right words. Her anger blindsided and perplexed me. I needed to make things right. I needed to hold her, and I saw she needed me to hold her. So I did. I gathered her in my arms and laid us both down on the sleeping bags. She didn't fight me. She snuggled closer, burying her face in my neck and gripping my shirt. Now that we were touching, I started again. We haven't been spending time alone because there's no place for us to be alone. What about my trailer and my room at the cabin and... Sunshine, those places aren't private. They are private. Not private enough, because Sienna, you're not quiet when you come. Not that I'm complaining. I'm not. Not at all. I love everything about making you feel good. She huffed. Are you telling me you haven't been... Haven't been, say, avienta el mañanero because you require complete privacy? What does that mean? Literally translated, it's throwing the morning one. You know, getting it on in the morning. That made me grin, because we were definitely going to be throwing the morning one with frequency. Hopefully sooner rather than later. I'd have to learn the Spanish words and whisper it in her ear to wake her up. Tucking that thought away, I quickly responded. I don't require complete privacy. But then I thought more about her question and had to amend my answer. I don't require it, but I want it. She chuckled. It sounded frustrated. You're going to have to explain yourself. I tightened my arms around her and tangled her legs together. For right now, especially for right now, I want what happens between us to be between us. I know that pretty soon things are going to change. I know I'm going to have to share you with all the dirty list makers. But for now, I have you to myself. What we're building is between just us, and that's important. I'm not ready to share. Not yet. She was quiet, like she was thinking on my words. I didn't push. Instead, I rubbed her back, slipped my fingers under her shirt. I was after her skin. Abruptly, she caught my hands on their way to her breast. This whole time, you've been stalling, because you wanted complete privacy? Just for now. I tried moving my hand again, but she had a firm hold on me. 
I could easily break it. I didn't. Instead, I waited. I thought... When she didn't continue, I shifted away so I could see her face. Her eyes were searching for mine, and she brought her fingers to my cheek like she was touching me in lieu of seeing me. Now she'd released my hand, I continued my upward progress until I cupped her through her bra, loving the generous weight and yielding suppleness of her breast. I began pulling down the cup, planning to take her nipple between my teeth. I moved my knee to the junction of her thighs, and my mouth watered in anticipation. What did you think? I whispered. I thought, since you're trying to wait until marriage, you didn't want to do anything with me. What? My single word arrived sharper than I'd intended. I saw we had some things that needed discussing. No, no, no. God, no. All I think about is you, doing things to you, and trying to figure out how to do those things away from prying eyes and ears. Her lips flattened. She didn't look convinced. I pressed a quick kiss to her sweet lips. Sienna, this afternoon, did Susie tell you to take a nap? She hesitated for a minute before admitting. Yes. And Dave? Yes. I asked them to do that. I have hot chocolate and champagne in the truck. And tequila. I put the sleeping bags, blankets, and pillows in the cab on Monday. I've been counting down the days, putting all the pieces in motion. Getting you alone, out here and awake. This has been in the works since early last week. I'm desperate for you. I kissed her again, pulling down the cup of her bra and sliding my palm over her perfectly shaped breast. Fuck. She felt so fucking good. Heaven in my hands. I wanted her. Right now. I wanted her little, panting, hitching breaths and her loud, abandoned moans. And now I knew she was a happy screamer. I wanted her screams, too. Wait. She twisted her mouth from mine and caught my hand again. Wait, stop. I stopped, but groaned my dissatisfaction. What? What is it? I don't want you to go down on me. Her words were breathless, but I heard conviction in her tone. Why? I asked through gritted teeth, because I did want it. As much as I needed her mouth on me before, I needed my mouth on her sweet body. Needed the taste of her. Needed it. Because... I didn't give you a blowjob because I wanted reciprocation. I did it because I need you to, to, to accept my affection. I have feelings for you. Deep, important, overwhelming feelings. And I have to be able to show you how I feel. Fine. Done. You can show me while I taste you. I moved to kiss her again, shifting my thigh between her legs. Jethro, stop. You're not listening to me. Her grip on my Roman hands tightened and I growled in frustration. My patience was at an end. I couldn't be this close without taking some part of her for myself, so I pulled my hands and body away. I rolled onto my back, shoving my palms into my eye sockets. My heart galloped. Blood pounded between my ears and rushed with needful intent to my dick. Let me know when you're calm enough to talk, she said, her tone even, completely fucking reasonable. She didn't apologize, and I was glad. She had nothing to be sorry for. But Christ Almighty, I was shaking with how badly I needed to touch her. I was sweating with it, and that wasn't her fault. Time. I needed time. And space. I pushed myself upright and edged to the tailgate jumping down. In my peripheral vision, I saw she'd also set up and was trying to figure out what I was up to. Likely, to her eyes, I was a black mass against the dark field and sky. Jethro? She sounded uncertain. I didn't like that. I cleared my throat and tried to mimic her earlier reasonable tone. I need a drink. You want something? I have hot chocolate. She hesitated before asking. Do you think it's still hot? Should be. It's in my camping thermos. Then, yes, please. I walked to the driver's side and opened the door while I considered taking off my shirt. I was still hot. I knew of a pond not far from here I could jump in. It wouldn't be precisely cold at 70 or so degrees, but it might do the trick. I fished out the thermos and tequila, shut the doors, walked back to the tailgate, and poured her cup first. She'd crawled on her hands and knees to where I stood, and I had to look away. Seeing her in that position inspired all kinds of frustrating thoughts. 
I set the mug just in front of her, pulled the cork from the bottle of Patron, and took a short drink. I needed to clear my head, not get drunk. The burn helped, sobered, and slowed my frenzied pulse. You're drinking tequila? I nodded, then remembered she couldn't see me. Yeah, I'm drinking tequila. She was quiet, like she was picking her words, then said, You're upset. I tried the words on, and they didn't quite fit. I'm not upset. I'm frustrated. Why are you frustrated? A humorless laugh burst from my lips. Because I've been planning this evening for weeks, and instead of me making you feel good, I get a moonlight sonata of a blowjob, and then I'm not allowed to touch you. And why do you want to touch me so badly? I glared at her, seeing she was trying to subtly tell me something, or bring me to a specific conclusion. You're trying to lead me someplace to some conclusion. Well, instead, why don't you just come out and say it? Fine, I'll just say it. You're frustrated because you want to show me how much I mean to you and I won't allow it, correct? That's one way of putting it. I thought to myself another way might be, I'm obsessed with your body, with touching you and tasting you and bringing you pleasure, and yet you seem indifferent. I know how you feel because that's how I've been feeling for weeks. I stared at her, growing irritated all over again, but this was a new kind of irritated, like she was punishing me for not being a mind reader. You've been frustrated for weeks? Yes. You never said anything. I know. I should have. I'm sorry. Yeah, you should have said something. If you've been feeling frustrated, you should have told me. How could you not know? She demanded, her words loud and irritable. Did you really think I'd be happy with no physical intimacy? So you're punishing me, because I'm not all-knowing. You think I haven't been frustrated, too? I lifted my voice to match her volume. I'm not punishing you. She reached for my hand and held it between both of hers, sending the now familiar spike of magic, a belonging and longing racing up my arm. But now, confusion and resentment muddied it. Then what are you doing? I ground out between clenched teeth because I didn't want to holler at her. I want to talk about this before I lose my nerve, because I've been wanting to talk to you for weeks and I've been too afraid. I blinked at her new confession. Most of my furious resentment morphing into concern. My mouth went dry with it. She'd again surprised me. I choked out. You're afraid of me? No, no, I'm saying this wrong. She huffed like she was frustrated with herself and quickly added. I promise, if you still want to savor my papaya after we finish talking, then I will gladly strip naked and sit on your face. But first, we have to talk. Then talk. Tell me. And don't be afraid of me. I'm sure my request sounded like a plea because the thought of Sienna being scared of me settled like shards of glass in my stomach. Okay. She nodded once, gathered a deep breath, then said on a rush. I want to be able to show you how I want you without worrying who is going to overhear or see us. I'm not talking about being an exhibitionist, but I can't go another two weeks until you arrange for complete privacy. I don't like being afraid that I'm pushing you further than you're willing to go. So before additional touching commences, I need you to know that I want you, all the time. But I don't want to lose you. I guess I'm afraid I'm losing you. You. I took a moment to sort through her words, picking out the actionable items. You want more, and you want it more often, and you don't care about privacy. I care about privacy, but not to the point where we do nothing because someone might overhear. And I don't want to lose you. I shook my head at this last bit, but then remembered again she couldn't see me. I wish we weren't having this conversation in the dark. I mumbled as I climbed back into the bed of the truck. I pulled my fingers from her grip, found her hot chocolate, and tossed it into the grass. I know I can be pushy, she said, still explaining herself. I have these big feelings for you, and they make me clumsy. When I couldn't do anything with them, it made me sad. Everything about what I feel for you is new to me. I don't know what I'm doing. I know the celebrity thing is a headache, already a lot to deal with. I didn't and don't want to push you. You're not going to push me away. I whispered firmly, easing her back on the sleeping bags. I gripped her wrist, holding them trapped on either side of her as I planked above. I fit my knee between her legs, but applied no pressure. 
And you being a celebrity isn't going to scare me off. I know I'll have to share you. I know. And I'm coming to terms with it. I want to be someone who builds you up, not someone you have to worry over. Don't worry about me. I can't help it. You have to trust me. I trusted you when you said this thing between us wasn't temporary. No amount of celebrity headaches or you telling me how you feel is going to send me running. I wondered how she could think that. Sienna gathered a deep breath, her breast pressing against my chest for the barest of moments. I won't ask you to cross your line. I appreciate that. But you should know. But I will do things that make keeping your vow difficult. And I might or might not do them on purpose. I smiled. Despite the anxiety and worry in her tone, her last statement sounded like a threat. A sexy and enticing threat. I lowered to sweep a quick kiss over her lips. I look forward to these things you might or might not do on purpose. Thank you for warning me. Now, you gotta promise me that you won't be afraid. That you'll tell me what you're thinking, no matter what. I promise. She made the promise on a sigh, and I felt the tension ease where I held her wrist. I kissed her once more, sucking her bottom lip between mine. I loved how she tasted. Sweetness and sunshine. Good, I said, then sat up on my knees and grabbed the pillows lining the left side of the bed. Now, let's get going. Uh, we're going? Yeah, no need to fold up these sleeping bags. I stood and jumped down to the ground, crossing back to the driver's side door. We can just stuff them in the back. She grabbed the side rail and shimmied over, as close as she could get to me while still kneeling in the truck bed. So, now you don't want my papaya? She sounded confused and aggrieved. I chuckled. Oh no, I very much want your papaya. And I want you sitting on my face while I take my time with your papaya, like you promised. Then why are we leaving? Because your bed back at the cabin will be more comfortable than these sleeping bags. And if I need to get used to people being around to hear your screams of ecstasy? I shrugged, unable to contain my grin. Then we might as well get started right now. We made it back to the cabin in record time and I had papaya before going to bed. Then I stayed the night and held her. And then I had papaya again before breakfast. Best papaya ever but it was more she was more so much more was it because of five years of celibacy or because of the woman herself has to be the woman how had she doubted my feelings for her pleasing her my woman cherishing her loving her had no comparison satisfaction desire fulfillment were woefully inadequate words so responsive so incredible so Mine. I drifted downstairs with a big smile on my face after 10 a.m., leaving Sienna in her room. She was asleep again. Naked. Leaving her had been difficult, but I knew she'd wake up hungry. My plan was to drive over to Daisy's Nut House, pick up donuts and caffeine before she woke up, then keep her in bed all day. Naked. But the smell and sounds of freshly brewing coffee had me stopping in my tracks as I passed the kitchen. I glanced inside. Dave and Tim were sitting at the kitchen table reading the paper. I spotted an open box of donuts on the counter. Chances were both Dave and Tim had heard Sienna last night. Likely they'd also heard her this morning. So I walked into the kitchen. Hey, these donuts spoken for, or can I steal a few? Dave looked up from his paper and didn't appear even a little bit surprised to see me. No, no, take as many as you want. Yeah? We picked up extra on purpose. From the sound of things, you two are probably hungry, Tim added, giving me a knowing smile. It wasn't lascivious. It was just knowing. I didn't mind. In fact, I liked that he knew. I decided everyone should know. Meanwhile, Dave hit Tim in the back of the head. What's wrong with you? What? That was rude. What? What did I say? He doesn't want you talking about her that way. And neither do I. Tim dropped the paper he was reading and tossed his hands in the air. I didn't say anything. I grinned at their bickering. It reminded me of my brother's. No, no, it's fine. Tim didn't say anything untoward. Dave narrowed his eyes on me. He needs to learn respect. But she's loud with Jethro. 
A woman isn't that loud unless she's having the time of her life. She's got to be starving. That's all I'm saying. Tim tried to explain again, which only served to piss Dave off more and make me laugh harder. Jesus Christ, Tim, shut your fucking mouth. Dave hit him again. Watch your language, New Jersey. Tim swatted Dave's hand away. Dave moved to smack him again, but stopped when the sound of the front door opened and pulled our collective attention away from the hole Tim had been digging. I looked at Dave. He looked at me. All three of us moved for the foyer. But the tension left me when I heard Hank Weller's voice call. Hey, anyone home? We're back here. Tim hollered back, releasing a relieved breath, taking his seat again. Dave also stopped and his shoulders relaxed, though he whispered to me. I know it's his cabin and all, but I don't like how he lets himself in. How can I keep her safe if people drop in unannounced? He comes by? He nodded. He used to call and she'd beg off, say she was too busy. So he started coming by unannounced, at least once a week for the last month. Why? He's just like the rest of them. Dave gave me a single eyebrow lift, his tone telling me everything I needed to know. I crossed my arms as Hank appeared in the doorway, watched as the expectant smile on his face wavered when he caught sight of me. Jethro. Hank? He straightened, his eyes narrowing as they took in my bare feet, jeans with no belt, and white t-shirt. What are you doing here? Hank asked. Making Sienna scream? Tim mumbled too low for anyone but me to hear. What was that? Hank looked between the two of us. Nothing. Dave glared at Tim. Apparently he'd also heard the big man's mumble, then pointed to the kitchen counter. Do you want some coffee? We just made some. Uh, sure. Hank made a show of looking around the kitchen and then sidestepping and glancing over his shoulder to the living room. Where's Sienna? Tim started. She's... She's still asleep. Hank's eyes widened, his eyebrows jumping high on his forehead. Still asleep? It's past ten. So it is. I nodded once. My business partner inspected me again. She never sleeps past seven, let alone ten. I didn't like that he knew when Sienna slept, so I allowed an edge of irritation in my voice as I put the question to him. Why are you keeping tabs on Sienna's sleep habits, Hank? My business partner stepped fully into the kitchen and mimicked my stance. Why are you here, Jethro? Dave cleared his throat and tapped Tim on the shoulder. I think we'll finish our breakfast in the um, other room. Tim grabbed his coffee cup, newspaper, and half-eaten donut and followed Dave out of the kitchen, leaving Hank and me swapping glares. Neither of us spoke for a full minute or more, likely because we already knew the answer to each other's question. Finally, Hank asked, you decided to ignore my advice? The fact Hank was the first to break the silence was unsurprising. He'd always been impatient, too curious for his own good. Did you give me advice? I leaned my hip against the kitchen counter. You know what I'm talking about. He crossed to the coffee maker and poured a cup, giving me his profile. When she leaves you in the dust, you can't say I didn't warn you. I studied the unhappy curve of his mouth, saw he believed his own words. Why are you really here, Hank? Same as you, I suspect. I like her. She's beautiful. She makes me laugh. She tells great stories. She makes me feel good. He turned to look at me, blowing steam from the coffee cup and taking a sip before adding. Except, Sienna and I are friends. When she leaves, I'll still know her. Whereas you... He shrugged, his eyes full of sympathy. Hey, is there any coffee left? Both Hank and I turned toward the entrance to the kitchen. Sienna stood just inside the doorway, rubbing sleep from her eyes. She wore a black silk bathrobe that covered just as much as it showed. And based on what it showed, I was pretty sure she was naked beneath it. Without waiting for us to respond, she walked into the kitchen and headed directly to where I stood. When she reached me, she wrapped her arms around my neck, pressed her body to mine, and placed a sweet kiss on my mouth, nibbling my top lip as she pulled away. I grabbed her waist before she could retreat too far and confirmed my earlier suspicion. She was naked under the rope. I fought a groan. I also fought the urge to sweep her in my arms and carry her back upstairs. Her tits were built for my hands. The idea of unwrapping her from the black silk had my blood pumping thick and urgent. 
She might not mind the caveman display, but I wanted Hank and everyone else to see I was nothing but confident where Sienna Diaz was concerned. I love that mouth, she said with a sleepy grin, her eyes on my lips as she pressed her thumb to my chin. And I love this beard. She kissed my chin. And I love this nose. She kissed my nose. And I love this neck. She kissed my neck, her body inadvertently sliding against mine. I kept my eyes studiously forward, but didn't hide my satisfied grin. In my side vision, I could see Hank gawking at us. There's still coffee. I pushed her rich chestnut hair from her face and angled her chin so I could steal another kiss. Or we could take these donuts and head back to bed. Look at you, smartest man alive. She pushed on my shoulder playfully. When we're in L.A., every Saturday will be spent this way. I demand it. Hank cleared his throat. Actually, he choked on a sip of coffee. Sienna's head whipped toward the sound, her eyes wide, her mouth parted in surprise, and she gasped. Hank, crap, jeez, I didn't see you. Sorry. She pressed closer to me, turning me slightly, so my body hid hers. No, no, I'm sorry. I should have, uh, I should have called first. He waved away her apology, his gaze flickering to mine. He has held speculation and maybe a hint of all. In fact, I would have called, but I was cleaning out the shower drain at the strip club, and you'll never guess what disgusting thing I found. Sienna sighed tiredly but gave him a patient smile, tugging me by the fabric of my shirt toward the stairs. I'm tired of games, Hank. Even that one. Is there anything else? Did this month's payment go through? For the rent? Hank nodded, looking sufficiently dumbfounded and maybe even a little contrite. Oh, uh, yeah, it cleared last week. There's nothing else. Good, she said, then to me. Grab the donuts. I'll meet you upstairs. Sienna gave me a quick kiss and a sly grin, lowering her lashes, heat and promise in her eyes. Then she turned and skipped lightly on her feet out of the kitchen. My last glimpse of her retreating form was her full, round backside draped in black silk. I exhaled. Wasn't a loud exhale, but it was necessary because that woman took my breath away. The kitchen descended into weighty silence. I counted to ten before sliding my eyes to Hank's. Well, I'll be. He shook his head, looking at me with unveiled wonder. Jethro Whitman Winston. I'm impressed. I don't know what you're talking about, Hank Herman Weller. I'm pretty sure my smile was as arrogant as it was pleased. No, really, I'm impressed. I never thought I'd see Sienna. What? I don't know. I just thought she'd always be single. Never getting serious with anyone. Even with you? I asked, because it was a question that needed asking. Hank seemed stunned, but if he was jealous, he was hiding it well. His gaze went hazy as he considered my question. Honestly? No. Not even with me. We don't suit. We didn't in college, and we don't suit now. His eyes refocused on me. Don't get me wrong, I'd switch places with you in a second. I'd be a fool not to. He grinned and quickly added. But if she was going to tie herself down, settle. I'm happy it's with you. You too. You're good people. You deserve each other. I appreciate that, Hank. I was surprised, but pleased I didn't have to deal with jealousy where he was concerned. He was my business partner and friend. I'd hate to lose him as either. I openly inspected him, and I needed to add. But I have to contradict you on one point. Sienna hasn't tied herself down, nor has she settled, and neither have I. It doesn't work that way. Not when it's the right person. So she's like Red Bull? She gives you wings? He lifted a teasing eyebrow. I shook my head. More like she's the sun, and makes every minute better than the last. His grin waned an expression of skepticism and confusion on his face. I chuckled. Don't worry. One of these days you'll understand. I reached for the box on the counter and moved to follow my woman. Now, if you'll excuse me, I can't forget the donuts. Chapter 28 In the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself within a dark woods where the straight way was lost. Dante Alighieri, Inferno. 
Sienna. Jethro took me to Daisy's nut house for our eighth date. We arrived to a sign that read, closed for a private party. He'd bought out the entire restaurant. It was just Jethro, Daisy, and me, and a candlelit dinner for two of hamburgers, steak fries, hot sauce, and milkshakes. He'd suggested a booth in the back, but I requested the diner counter. I couldn't remember the last time I'd been able to sit in a restaurant at the diner counter. It felt so brazen to be out in the open, like I was on display with no consequences. The words magnificently liberating came to mind. Sitting beside me on a stool, Jethro watched me with a wry expression as I added a generous amount of sriracha to my Swiss and mushroom burger. What? I squeezed the sriracha out in a smiley face shape on top of the burger patty. Nothing? He shook his head, still grinning, still watching me in a way that had my stomach and heart doing gymnastics. No, tell me, what is it? He hesitated for just a second before saying, It's just... I like that you eat hot sauce because it means you can handle surprises in your mouth. I squinted at him. He probably thought the statement was funny or shocking or cute, or all three. Admittedly, he was right. It was funny, shocking, and cute, but only coming from him. Jethro's flirting was typically light and teasing, respectful. He was so rarely lewd, well, apart from when we were in bed. Thus, I kind of liked his lewd flirting. It felt special, like he reserved it just for me. Jethro and his layers, one of which was apparently thinking about giving me surprises, in my mouth. I waited until he took a bite of his hamburger before I asked, How do you feel about Pop Rocks, then? Jethro coughed, his eyes bulging, and he covered his mouth with his napkin. He might have been choking to death on ketchup and laughter. I took this as a sign to continue. Because if you think hot sauce is a surprise, you should try Pop Rocks and Coke. I mean, that's like setting off a bomb of what the fuck did I sign up for inside your mouth. Stop, he rasped, reaching for and gulping his water, still laughing and choking. I continued to squint at him, but was now grinning widely. Tears had formed in his eyes, and he wiped them away, still chuckling. I promise, I will never surprise your mouth if you promise never to tell a joke when I've got food in mine. Agreed. We shook on it. Instead of letting my hand go, he kept it on his thigh, curling his fingers around mine. I couldn't remember ever holding someone's hand during a date. It was such a simple, affectionate gesture, as though he couldn't stand having me close and not touching me. I loved him for it. I love him. I blinked. The unbidden thought caught me off guard and was made even scarier because it, it wasn't too soon. Since Hawks Field and the fun that came after, we'd been considerably more open about our relationship. He stayed with me most nights. We drove to the set together, then made out or just shared each other's company in my trailer. People on the set were talking, but we couldn't be bothered to care. We'd done everything but cross his line, and I believed he enjoyed my tempting him just as much as I did. I was mad for him. Everything was grand. We were perfect together. If my life were a movie script, the timing would have been just right. Two months? Eight dates, a few ups and downs, actually a lot of ups and very few downs, and no insurmountable issues. I loved him. I trusted him. I wanted to be with him all the time. He treated me like I was precious to him, like I was the most important thing in his life, like I took priority. And I hoped he knew I felt the same way for him. I couldn't imagine my life without him. You know, I still don't know much about what you actually do. What I do? I squeaked, jumping, trying to keep up with the conversation even as I was endeavoring to not freak out about the fact I loved him. I'd never been in love. But I loved Jethro. I love him. Yeah, your job. We've talked about your writing, but you don't talk much about acting. What a funny comment. Had we really never talked about my job? I was sure I'd rambled incessantly about acting at some point. My job? 
Yes. An unbidden smile claimed my mouth and my heart skipped a few beats. So you haven't looked me up? Nope. He smiled, clearly pleased I was pleased. Yep. I love him. Not at all? No googling or yahooing or binging? I don't know what binging is, but it sounds like something we should try later. No, we shouldn't. It's the shameful receptacle of thwarted hopes, where dreams and searches go to die. I joked, because I now knew I loved him and thus was nervous. We should definitely steer clear of shameful receptacles of thwarted hopes. He smiled at me even as he studied me, his voice a rich, velvety baritone. I even loved his voice. Actually, I especially loved his voice. Then he asked, Does talking about your job make you nervous? No. No, not at all. I guess I can't believe we haven't talked about it yet. I mean, it's usually the only thing people want to talk to me about. He clearly didn't like my offhanded confession, because his resultant frown was severe. It was the truth. People usually only wanted to talk to me about my job, my movies, or what it was like to be an actress. But I hadn't ever admitted the truth out loud, nor had I ever explicitly realized it as a thought. And yet, with Jethro, we'd known each other for months, and this was the first time he'd asked me about it. Actually, there had been one other time, when he'd thought my name was Sarah, and I told him I was a writer. Other than that one incident, he'd asked me all manner of questions what I thought, what I wished for, but never about being an actress or a celebrity. I rushed to answer his question, not wanting to dwell on the depressing truth of my impromptu confession. Okay, let's see. My first film, Taco Tuesday, didn't have much to do with tacos. It was about a girl who grew tired of the words used to describe women, but hardly ever used to describe men. Like what? Give me some examples. Okay, like feisty, or buxom, or dainty, perky, prissy, slutty, bitchy, and prude. He nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, okay, I can see that. I've never called a man feisty or slutty, for that matter. And you wouldn't. It just isn't done. A woman is a slut, but a man is a man slut. Why is the default gender of a slut a woman? Why can't sluts just be sluts instead of having to differentiate the gender? Yeah, let them all be sluts. That's what I always say. I'm very careful to refer to my sex worker friends as escorts, not man tramps or men wenches. Jethro laughed, his smile lingering for a long time after his chuckle tapered. I loved the sound of his laugh. And I loved that he laughed so freely, without reservation. I loved how vulnerable he was to happiness, truly open to the possibility of it. His willingness made being around him relaxing, easy. So easy, everyone else's company felt difficult and challenging in comparison. When I realized I was staring at him in his charming face, I shook myself, returned my attention to my food, and gathered my wits. Anyway, this girl, Kate was her name, she grew irritated with how words were used so she started insulting women with words reserved for men, like dickface, and men with words reserved for women, like prude. But then her rant was picked up by the national news, went viral, and she became the reluctant spokesperson for feminism. It was a satire comedy, like a buddy movie that made fun of both men and women and our first world struggles, feminists and meninists. Meninists? Oh, yes, men's rights activists. The way Jethro both lifted and furrowed his eyebrows told me this concept perplexed him. You made that word up. No, I didn't. I swear. They exist, and they have Twitter accounts, and all hate me. What the hell is a men's rights activist? Well, if you asked Kate, the main character from Taco Tuesday, it's a coven of dainty, sassy, wee men who are quite perky, headstrong, and prudish, and who fret about how society is eroding their privilege. But, if you ask me, it's a bunch of guys who don't have enough to do, suffer from micro-IQ scores, and can't get laid, so they hate on women. Huh. 
I could see his expression still held confusion and disbelief. In the end, he shrugged. So why did you write it? Why'd you write the script? I love to write. I've always loved writing, much more than performing, giving voice to the imaginary people in my head. And movies. I love film. But I wrote this particular script because so much about our culture is inadvertently hilarious. I enjoy poking fun at sensitive topics. Because you can achieve a lot more with humor and entertainment, reach more hearts and minds, than with the most thoughtful and well-researched letter to the editor. And because most of the words used to describe only women, not all, just most, are really rather negative or condescending. Like the term working mom. No one says working dad. Why do we do that? Don't mothers have it hard enough? Buxom isn't negative. Referring to my earlier word list, Jethro's eyes darted to my chest and then back up. He didn't apologize, but he did smile. So of course I had to tease him. Did you just look at my chest when you said buxom? Yes. He nodded once, his eyes warm and playful. And why did you do that? Because the word describes what you have going on in that area. Just like... The word clever describes what you have going on here. He motioned to my brain. And the word beautiful describes what you have going on everywhere. Warmth bloomed in my chest and I couldn't help my grin. Oh, you're good. Yes, but sometimes... His eyes dropped again, this time conducting a slow perusal from the heels of my shoes to the locket around my neck heating every inch of my body with his gaze until it collided with mine. Sometimes I'm very, very bad. We were in his truck driving to his house after dinner, enjoying each other's company, when Marta called. Her name flashing on the screen hit me like a bucket of ice water being thrown on the evening. I stared at my phone and debated what to do. What's wrong? I glanced at Jethro. He was obviously concerned about my sudden mood shift. Um, it's just my sister. I rejected the call. I'll call her later. Which one? Marta. Your manager? Yes, that's the one. I swallowed stiffly, wondering if the time had come for me to tell him about the argument she and I'd had when I was in L.A. We'd been texting each other and emailing since the fight last month, our discussions limited to business topics only. This was the first time she'd called. Before I could decide what to do, she called again. You should get it. Jethro lifted his chin toward the phone. It might be important. It's never important, I grumbled, but I answered the call anyway. Hello? Siena, Marta said by way of greeting, which would have been fine, except she'd said my name like she was trying to talk reason into me, like, now, now, Siena, calm down. So I mimicked her tone. Marta. Now, now, Marta, calm down. Clearly, she hadn't been expecting that, because it took her several seconds to speak again. Before she did, she cleared her throat, and I heard her chair squeak. She was at work. Even with the time difference, it was still late for her to still be at the office. I'm calling about the Smash Girl script and the London premiere. I grimaced, having forgotten all about the London premiere. Again. When was that again? August? Where are you with the script? Barnaby called again this morning asking for a status. My grimace intensified because I hadn't thought much about the script since they uncasted me from the role. Sienna? Yes, I'm here. Anything more I can share with Barnaby? Not yet. She sighed, sounding disappointed and irritated, but she said, Fine. I'm still thinking things through, I hedged. That wasn't like me, and Marta knew it. I'd allowed it to lapse, which wasn't professional behavior at all. I needed to work on it or officially step aside. I could blame it on writer's block, but Marta knew me better than that. And London? Do you want me to reach out to Tom's people? Tom's people? Jethro shifted in his seat, drawing my eyes to him. He wasn't looking at me, as his attention was on the dark road, but I could see he didn't like the mention of my co-star. You have to go with someone. He was your most recent... No, I interrupted her. Tom isn't my most recent anything. 
Then, on a whim, I said, I'll bring Jethro. His eyes cut to mine, his eyebrows suspended in question. I mouthed, Just a minute. Again, silence, followed by a chair squeak. I made a mental note to order her some WD-40 for that chair. Do you think it's a good idea? Yes. She huffed. Okay. Forget our conversation when you were here in L.A. Forget that I think you're making a terrible mistake hooking up with this guy. Forget all of that for a minute and just think about this. I can't believe I have to spell this out. But consider this. If you take the park ranger to this event, Jethro, his name is Jethro. She ignored me. Then everyone will know about the two of you. His life will never be the same. People will dig into his past. Celebrity bloggers and websites will pick him apart. He'll find himself on the cover of magazines, newspapers, photographic work, wherever he goes. He'll be the object of much fascination. Is that what you want? Is that what he wants? of what I'd been stubbornly ignoring for the last months saddled itself on my shoulders. I felt foolish. I felt idiotic, stranded by my own willful blindness. Marta had just pointed out major serious issues that should have been obvious to me. Issues Jethro and I should have discussed prior to now. Prior to our first date. Prior to agreeing to more than temporary. And prior to my falling in love with him. Now I felt the weight of it, like a slap in the face or a punch in the stomach. I felt it all. What's wrong? he asked, placing his hand on my legs and squeezing. More bad news? Do we need to go dancing? I managed to crack a smile at that, but couldn't sustain it. My thoughts were turning pragmatic, and with pragmatism came some depressing truths. I'd been selfish because I liked him so much. He wanted more than temporary with me, but he couldn't possibly know what that meant in real-world terms. He may have had an inkling based on our first date and from the looks we'd been getting around the set, but he really had no idea. By his own admission during dinner, he hadn't looked me up yet. Resting my elbow on the windowsill, I placed my forehead in my hand and closed my eyes, exhaling in an effort to diffuse the foreboding swelling in my chest. So... When I was in L.A., Marta and I had a disagreement. She saw the picture of us on my phone, and... I sighed. All my words were irritating, so I rushed to finish. She didn't like it. She's worried about the photo getting out. I'm not sharing it, if that's what she's worried about. I sighed again, trying to ease the tightness in my chest. It's not just that. I have to go to a film premiere next week in London. My voice was strained. Okay, that doesn't sound so bad. I swallowed, finding my mouth dry and my tongue coated with dread. It's complicated. I need to go with someone. A date? Yes, 
I need to go with a date, someone who will help my image and create the right kind of buzz, I said flatly, echoing Marta's words from so many meetings and phone calls and lectures about the capricious nature of success, how it could vanish in the blink of an eye. I'm going to be real honest, Sienna. I'm not going to be happy if you go with someone other than me on a date. His tone was firm, like he meant business, but also measured and coaxing, like he was trying his hardest not to turn the statement into a mandate. I don't want to go with anyone other than you. That wouldn't make me happy either. He paused for a second before asking, Then what's the problem? I covered his hand with mine, and he immediately turned his palm upward, tangling our fingers together. If you decide to come with me, to the premiere, then everyone will know about us. So? So are you ready to lose your privacy? Are you ready for people to dig through your trash, hack into your phone, and take pictures of you at work, while you grocery shop? I tried to keep the bitterness out of my voice and mostly failed. He shifted in his seat. I assumed his hesitation meant he was coming to the same realization as me. Suddenly, I had a heartbreaking thought. Jethro and I had been doomed from the start, or at least an open relationship was doomed. My mind scrambled to find a solution. Maybe he would consider a relationship in secret, where his privacy could be protected. Maybe if we kept everything between us discreet. But we hadn't been discreet. People on set knew. Strangely enough, it hadn't hit the gossip mags. Could we contain things? Keep them here? Yes. I frowned, not knowing what question he was answering. Yes, what? Yes. I'm ready to lose my privacy and have people dig through my trash. I'll have to warn Cletus, though. He disposes of all things from time to time. Maybe I should move out of the homestead, get a place in Maryville. I gawked at him. What? How can you even consider this? He looked at me, his eyebrows arched over hooded eyes, his gaze slid meaningfully up and down my body, like I was a crazy one. I think I'll suffer through. I grinned despite myself and despite the situation, but reality soon won out over his charm. You don't understand. We're not just talking about now, Jethro. We're talking about your past. Everything you've ever done would be turned into media fodder. Every embarrassing arrest photo, every painful story. You would be giving up your privacy, both past, present, and future, to be with me. His fingers tightened on mine. Now he was frowning. I tore my eyes from his profile because looking at him was starting to hurt. We drove in silence, and I could almost hear his mind working, going back over my words. I wanted to suggest we go the secret relationship route to protect his privacy for as long as possible. And it was on the tip of my tongue when he said, You're afraid my past will hurt your image. I flinched because his tone was heartbreaking, and I immediately contradicted him. No! God, no! Nothing embarrasses me. He pulled his hand from mine. But it would, right? I've been arrested plenty of times. There's plenty of photos for them to use. Plenty of sordid stories from my past. It would hurt your image and your career. I gaped at him, baffled by the unexpected direction of the conversation. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about my image. He said nothing, but was gritting his teeth, his knuckles white on the steering wheel. I was just about to reiterate that my image wasn't at issue when he asked, How bad? What? How bad would it be? Could you lose more film roles? I opened my mouth to respond, but no sound came out. I didn't want to lie and say no. The truth was, I didn't know, because I hadn't given the matter much thought. But he took my silence as confirmation and cursed. Jethro. I reached for him, and he flinched away, startling me. I wanted to reach for him again, but it seemed my touch was now unwelcome. A sharp stabbing pierced my chest, my lungs rigid, inflexible. I couldn't draw a full breath. I'd never seen him like this. He'd been angry during our first date, a bewildered, frustrated anger. But this was different. He was angry, but also something else, 
unwieldy and dark, and he felt far away, removed from me. He'd opened a chasm between us. I tried again, using a carefully calm tone, though panic made every beat of my heart painful and sluggish. Jethro, it's not about my image. I've never cared about my image, what people say. Do you care about your career? I ignored his question. This is about your privacy. His jaw ticked. I'm taking you to the cabin. Will you stay with me? Tonight? He shook his head, but said nothing. I pressed my lips together to keep my chin from wobbling, but couldn't quite manage to keep my voice steady as I reminded him. You promised me. You promised me that my celebrity wouldn't send you running. You said I could trust you. Sienna, this isn't about your celebrity. This is about my past hurting your future. Don't do this. I wanted to reach for him again, frustrated tears burning my eyes. Stay with me. Stay the night, and we'll talk it through. Not the night. Jethro didn't look at me when he spoke, but his voice was unrecognizable, hard, and cold as granite. I need time. Chapter 29 Ever has it been that love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. Khalil Gibran Jethro Time, she echoed. I made no move other than to turn left toward Hank's cabin. I said nothing because I couldn't speak. Not yet. I was too angry, too frustrated. I couldn't think past the string of curses and profanities hurling through my brain. It didn't matter how much I'd changed, how hard I'd worked to become something different, better than the garbage I'd been. My past was still hurting people, or had the potential to hurt. And this time, it would be Sienna. You need time? She said. I didn't like her tone. She sounded hollow and anxious, close to tears. But I couldn't do anything about her tone just now. I couldn't find the wherewithal within myself to pacify and soothe. Tell her everything was going to be just fine. I wasn't a liar. Not anymore. I didn't know whether or not everything would be just fine. We pulled into Hank's gravel driveway and I eased on the brake. I tried to ignore the sense of hopelessness as we pulled to a complete stop. Neither of us spoke. I was too busy trying to think of ways to obscure my past. Maybe, maybe I could ask Cletus for help. Maybe he could figure out a way to remove all my arrest records from the law enforcement databases. But that still left all the people who knew me growing up. That still left plenty of stories and willing storytellers eager to share tales of my misdeeds. I didn't blame them. I'd been the one to mess up my life. I'd earned every mortifyingly scandalous element of those stories. I was responsible. And, of course, there was my father. If the picture he'd sent me weeks ago was any indication, he'd be the first person in line to exploit our relationship. I heard his words again, the message on the photo, as though he were sitting in the truck with us. You always were best at the big cons. I hope her bank account's as big as her tits. She can pay my legal fees. I cursed under my breath, wanting to smash something. What the hell had I done? He was a loose cannon. Shit. Sienna deserved better. She didn't deserve to be tarnished by association. She didn't deserve to be linked to my father. My job, as her man, was to take care of her, see to her needs and well-being, not cause embarrassment, not be a stain on her reputation, not make her job harder. I'd already darkened the lives of my own family. I couldn't live with myself if I hurt her chances for success. I couldn't, and I wouldn't. She cleared her throat, her hands balled into fist on her lap. How much time do you need? I shook my head but didn't answer. Instead, I exited the cab and walked around to her side, opening her door and offering her my hand. She didn't take it and made no move to leave the truck. Jethro, she exhaled on a broken sigh. Talk to me. I dropped my hand and met her pleading dark eyes, hating myself for putting sadness there. Just give me time, I said, removed from the moment. What are you thinking? I tried to breathe in, but the tightness around my lungs didn't permit it. You know what I'm thinking. You're overreacting. 
She jumped down from the cab, shut the door, and placed her hands on my shoulders, narrowing her eyes at me. Nothing has to be decided right now. We can. She paused, swallowing with effort, and when she spoke next, her voice cracked. I know it's not ideal, but we can date in secret for a while. Just until... Hell no, I growled. A visceral, vehement rejection of the idea pounded through my veins, setting my brain on fire. I hated it. I hated lying. I hated denying and pretending. Her hands dropped from my shoulders, her eyes widening by what she saw in my face. Sienna tried to take a step back, but the truck behind her halted her progress. And it wasn't just the thought of lying to everyone. Over the last weeks, I'd given Sienna's fame serious thought, but obviously not enough. Not about things that mattered. She mattered more than anything. See, I'd been preoccupied with her status on countless dirty lists. Like Bose, for example. I'd come to a measure of peace with this reality. She was famous and beautiful, smart, funny, and sexy. Of course she was going to be on these lists. Of course men and some women would think about her in that way. If being with Sienna meant thousands, if not millions, of people lusted after my woman, I could deal with that. Fine. Okay. So be it. Just as long as the world knew she was mine. Sure, my fixation on that aspect of her fame likely made me a blind caveman, a reactionary Neanderthal. But it was what it was. Among others, I suffered from the human conditions of jealousy and pride. I never claimed to be perfect. Nor have I claimed to be smart. If I'd been smart, I would have considered how my past, how being with me, might affect her future. I'm so fucking stupid. I grumbled, my forehead falling to my fingers. I stepped away from her, turned, giving her my back. I don't care what anyone thinks. Her voice was small, and I hated the sound of that, too. Hated that I was responsible for that as well. You should, I said. You've worked hard for what you have. You can't throw it away just because you fancy a hick from backwoods Appalachia. Jethro. I walked back to the driver's side, each step feeling wrong, though I knew they were right. Where does this leave us? She called after me. I don't know, I said honestly, because I wasn't ready to give up, but I couldn't see a way forward. All routes were blocked by decisions I'd made a decade ago. That was my fault. It was all my fault. And now I was finally paying the price. You've chopped all the wood. I didn't look over my shoulder. I recognized the speaker. Billy. He was right. I'd chopped all the wood at the woodshed. And now I was swinging a double-bit felon axe at a pine some yards into the forest behind our house. I wasn't even 50% into the trunk, though I'd been at it for over an hour. Nor was I ready to stop. Not by a long shot. When I didn't answer, he said, We don't need more wood, Jet. I wrenched the blade from where it bit into the trunk and swung again. Jet! Fuck off, Billy. Last night, after dropping off Sienna, I'd driven myself to the Dragon Biker Bar, the club headquarters for the Iron Wraiths. I wanted a fight. I wanted to beat the shit out of someone and have the guts beaten out of me. Raising hell, getting drunk, getting high wouldn't have felt good. But I thought it had to feel better than the cavernous abyss of misery. I didn't go in. I couldn't. My past may have lost me a chance with Sienna, but I still had five brothers and a sister. I hadn't lost them. They'd given me a chance. I couldn't let them down. But I could destroy a tree. Billy didn't leave. What did you do to the carriage house? I didn't respond. It looks like someone took a sledgehammer to your new framework. Fuck. Off, he sighed. I sensed his presence behind me, standing silently while I took satisfaction in the jar and pain running up my arms every time I buried the axe into the trunk. Then, a second voice spoke. Jethro, did you chop all the wood? Cletus. I sighed, shaking my head. Cletus continued. We don't need all that wood. What are we going to do with a split pile of wood that big? It's like you're inviting termites over for tea. I asked the same thing, I heard Billy whisper. And he destroyed the upstairs framework in the carriage house. I can hear you, dummy. I pulled the blade from the tree and glared over my shoulder, finding my brothers frowning at me. 
Can you hear me? I said, Fuck off, yes, I heard you. Billy's tone was flat, aggravated, but he didn't budge. Cletus glanced between us, a thoughtful eyebrow raised. I take it something happened with Miss Diaz. I slid my eyes to Cletus, grinding my teeth, but said nothing. If I spoke, a string of curses would erupt like a volcano. I still hadn't beaten the shit out of anyone, but the day was young, and Cletus was a good fighter. As though reading my mind, Cletus stiffened. You will do no such thing. I haven't had breakfast yet, and this is my best smoking jacket. Then leave. Cletus grunted, his mouth a flat line, then threatened. If you don't tell me what happened, then I'll pay a call to Miss Diaz, and... You won't, I ordered sharply, taking a step toward my brothers. Cletus raised his hands between us as though warding me off. Then tell me what happened. What'd you do to her? Billy lifted an eyebrow, his gaze cold and assessing and irritating as hell. I did nothing. I seethed between clenched teeth, tossing the axe to a nearby stump so I wouldn't throw it at Billy's head. Billy's frown intensified. He clearly didn't believe me. Judgment was written all over his face, and in that moment I hated him. Without thinking, I asked, What'd you do to Claire? Billy flinched, the stone steadiness of his expression cracking with surprise. What? You heard me. I wiped the back of my hand across my brow. What'd you do to her? Why does she hate you so much? Billy blanched as though I'd sucker punched him, and I was immediately remorseful for asking the question. This, what I was doing, the mind games, the lashing out, wasn't who I was. Even at my worst, I'd never done this shit. This was my father. This was how he operated. And now I hated myself, too. Before I could apologize, Cletus stepped between us. This ain't about Billy. This is about you deforesting the Great Smoky Mountains National Park for superfluous firewood. Firewood that's about as useful as a screen door on a submarine. Now, I'll ask you again. What happened with you in Siena? The fight drained from me, leaving my body tired and my head pounding and my chest hurting. We're over. The words felt final and wrong rang empty and desolate, hung heavy in the stagnant summer air. I'd been repeating them to myself, trying them on, because I couldn't figure a way around the mountain of my past, but I also couldn't let her go. And because I was growing desperate, I was also trying on her idea of dating in secret. Unfortunately, that suggestion, thinking on the ramifications of it, led me to destroy in the upstairs framework in the carriage house, so I'd moved to the woodshed. Maybe by the time I cut down this tree, I'd be more at peace with her proposal of a concealed relationship. Fuck, I shook my head. Maybe we're not over. I don't know. Cletus placed his hands on his hips. Why are you over? Did something happen at Daisy's? I shook my head. No, she got a call from her sister on the drive back. Sienna has a, a thing, a movie premiere in London she's got to go to this week and she needs to bring a date. Cletus scrutinized me as though he expected me to continue. When I didn't, he prompted, So? What's the problem? So? My gaze flickered to Billy. He was back to stonewalling me, his arms crossed, his mouth a rigid line. So it can't be me. Cletus tisked impatiently. Why can't it be you? You got plans or something? A cake to bake? Because, Cletus, then everybody would know about us. Because if we go public, the news people will dig into my past. And how do you think America's sweetheart is going to look saddled with me? An ex-con named Jethro, from Backwoods, Appalachia, with a GED and an album full of arrest photos. Cletus's frown was severe, fuming. You're not an ex-con. You were never convicted. Same difference. I didn't get caught, but I did it. We all know I did it. Cletus's eyes moved over me. So she broke it off? No. I shook my head, a humorless laugh tumbling from my lips. I'm breaking it off. I'm going to have to break it off. You? Billy asked abruptly, another fracture of surprise in his granite-like expression. Yes, me. Why? Billy pressed, clearly captivated by my words. Because I can't do that to her. I ground out between clenched teeth, yelling at him, feeling wretched all over again, angry all over again, 
hurting all over again. I can't wreck her career, her image. I can't do that. You don't do that to someone you love. I was about to say love. I turned, gave on my back, and I thought to myself, you don't do that to someone you love. Damn it all to hell, but I was in love with Sienna Diaz. Falling for her had been like breathing, natural, easy, necessary, inescapable, and the thought of spending the rest of my days without her had me drowning in panic. Cursing, I moved to pick up the axe, but was intercepted by Cletus. Whoa, wait, wait a minute. His hands were again held out between us, his eyebrows suspended over concerned eyes. Now hold on, what did she have to say? I shrugged. It doesn't matter. What she wants doesn't matter? He baited. I didn't say that, of course what she wants matters. Then what does she want? I shook my head, closing my eyes. She doesn't want to invade my privacy, and she wants us to date in secret. What? What does that mean? She's focused on what this means for my privacy. She's worried I'll have no privacy, that I'll be given up too much. So, she wants to hide our relationship. And you're not worried about that? About your privacy? God, no. I opened my eyes, my words forceful. I don't care about that. I'd gladly give up my privacy if I could be with her. But not when my past is going to... Tarnish her image, yes, I know. Cletus finished for me, waving my words away, a frown etched into his features. And it's not just hurting her career. You saw that photo Daryl sent. You read his note. Do you think our father's just going to leave us in peace? No, Billy answered honestly for both him and Cletus. He'll try to exploit the hell out of you. He'll try blackmail. He'll try everything. Don't you worry about Daryl Winston. Again, Cletus waved this concern away. I can deal with Daryl Winston. Forget about him. I got him under control. How can I be sure? I pressed my brother. This is Sienna. I can't take any chances. Jethro Whitman Winston. Cletus's eyes were flinty and stern. You're going to have to trust me. Let it go. We glared at each other. I didn't know if I could let it go. But then he ground out. Have I ever let you down? Have I ever failed to keep a promise? I'm telling you. Let. Me. Deal. With. It. I gritted my teeth. Cletus was right. He was sneaky and sinister, mean even. But his word was sacred. In the end, his meanness was why I ultimately trusted him to deal with Daryl. You need to focus your attention back to your woman. How you're going to make this right. Maybe we should just date in secret, I said. But the same visceral reaction as before drummed outward from my chest to my fingertips, making my skin and lungs burn. Don't do that, Billy said, shaking his head emphatically. Do it in public, or don't do it at all. Don't hide what you have. The lies will destroy you and her. It'll turn what's beautiful between you ugly. I glared at Billy, surprised by his words and hating how wise and true they were. But I was desperate and grasping at straws. We stood in the relative silence of the forest. I heard nothing, saw nothing, because I felt nothing but hopelessness. Billy was the first to move, to break the stillness of the moment. He removed his dress shirt, tossing it over the branch of a nearby tree. His eyes skated over my dirty, sweaty clothes. Then he removed his undershirt. Crossing to the axe, he picked it up and offered it to me. Here, he said. Take it. I glanced at the axe handle, then at my brother. What are you doing? He shrugged, but I saw a glimmer of something like sympathy buried deep in his eyes. We'll take turns. And when the tree comes down, I'll help you drag it to the pit, cut it into sections. I swallowed. My eyes stung and my lungs labored as though I were surrounded on all sides by smoke. I was suffocating. My voice was rough, gravely, as I asked. Why? Because you're my brother, he said, as though it were obvious. And you need my help. Chapter 30 I am free, and that is why I'm lost. Franz Kafka Sienna My heart wasn't working correctly. First of all, it hurt. Especially when I breathed, or sat, or stood, or walked. And also, it was thumping oddly, skipping beats, 
pumping blood either too fast or too slow. It was broken. Sienna, Dave called, knocking on my bedroom door. My room, the master suite, was on the third floor and the guys were staying on the main level. The entire second floor was taken up with a viewing room, entertainment area, bar combination, that looked over the lake. Most of the ceiling in my room was comprised of a massive skylight. The night sky and stars were my nightly view and the windows tinted automatically during the day to shield the space from the sun. I ignored Dave and continued to stare at the sky. I'd been doing this since Jethro dropped me off. That's not true. At first, just after he left, I'd spent several minutes calling him all kinds of names in both English and Mexican Spanish. I'd slammed some doors, I'd brushed my teeth with vigor, and I'd started on the Smash Girl script, deciding she would initially grow red and angry because all men were fools. I was frustrated. My laptop screen eventually blurred because of my tears, so I'd lain on my bed and stared at the sky. My heart wasn't working properly. It was broken. Sienna, Dave called again. I shook my head, but that hurt my heart, so I stopped. A moment passed, and then I heard Dave's retreating footsteps. Some more time passed. I honestly didn't know how long. The sun was hidden by clouds and the skylight had tinted automatically. I blamed my broken heart. Had it been working, I might have been more capable of keeping track of time. And then my door opened. I turned my head, which hurt my heart. Cletus. He stood just inside my room, his expression inscrutable as he watched me. Cletus? I said, not recognizing my own voice. Miss Diaz? He nodded once. My heart is broken, I said. He nodded again like he already knew, but now his eyes shone with sympathy. He crossed to the bed and sat next to me, grabbing for and holding my hand. Yes, that's why I'm here. Please tell me you're going to fix it. My vision blurred because I was crying again. The side of his mouth hitched, though he looked troubled. I'm going to try. Cletus made me take a shower. I cried a lot in the shower. And then he made me a cup of tea and gave me a Tylenol. He ushered me to the back porch so we could look over the lake. A nice view always helps, he said, adding sugar to my tea. I don't take it with sugar. He pressed the cup into my hands. Sweet tea always helps. I huffed a laugh and drank the sweet tea. It kind of helped. Now tell me what happened, he instructed, using a grandfatherly voice. I lifted an eyebrow at him because I was fairly certain we were approximately the same age and yet something about his somber expression and the brightness of his eyes made him appear so much older. Have you talked to... to him? I asked, sipping my tea, the syrupy concoction coating my tongue with sweetness. Yes. I gathered a bracing breath. What did he say? I'll tell you in a minute. First, I want to hear what happened from your perspective. So I told him. I told Cletus everything. I started at the beginning, recounting how we'd met, how I liked Jethro so much from the start, and ended with how angry I'd been last night. Why won't he even consider dating me in secret? It's not uncommon in Hollywood. People do it all the time. Sienna, pause a minute. You've just used a double negative. Obviously you're distressed. Think about what you're proposing. You're asking Jethro to deny the two of you are together. You're asking him to lie about it, like it's wrong and needs to be hidden. But it wouldn't be like that. Of course it would. And you'd never be able to visit him here, not in Green Valley. This is a small town. There are no secrets here. People have already seen you two out and about. Right now they might be pacified thinking you're just friendly. But he's already been cornered more than once. Saying nothing adds fuel to the fire. It's not a matter of keeping a secret. It's a matter of lying all the time. To everyone. I couldn't hold his earnest gaze, so I glanced at my tea. It looked like perfectly normal tea. But it wasn't normal. It was sweet tea because Cletus had made it sweet. Jethro told me some of what he's done, about his past. I heard Cletus shift in his chair, the sturdy weight of him causing the wood to creak. Yeah, 
What about it? Maybe if I knew more, I could mitigate some of the fallout. Ask him. I did. I met Cletus' gaze directly. He hasn't told me a lot about his penchant for stealing, his time in the Iron Wraiths, or much about your father. But enough that I can piece a few things together. I understand his shame. He also said he used to string girls along. He also said he used to use women, the women at the motorcycle club, treat them like they were disposable. Cletus scratched his jaw, his eyes losing focus as his thoughts turned introspective. See now, that's where things get messy. He might have guilt about that because our mama raised us better. But those women hang around that club for one reason only, and that's to get laid by a member of the Iron Wraiths. He used them, and they used him. As long as both parties participated as consenting adults, rationally, I can't find any fault with his actions. Irrationally, though, I think both participating parties are gross. You think men who have sex with lots of women are gross? I'd never heard a full-grown man describe promiscuity as gross. Yes, I do. He nodded firmly. All that swapping of bodily fluids, disgusting. Indiscriminate sex is like indiscriminate pie eating. I might enjoy the pie, but then I find out it was baked in a dirty kitchen, drooled and sneezed on by nut jobs, baked by a nut job who wants me to eat her dirty pie every day. Next thing you know, I have a stalker, dysentery, and herpes. Just from one ignorant bite of pie, I keep my kitchen clean and discriminate, and so should my partner. Plus, I don't want someone telling me pop tarts are pie. Pop tarts aren't pie. I can tell the difference. I don't want a half-ass baker. Despite the situation, I couldn't help my small smile. So you're looking for a virgin kitchen, Cletus? No, no, no. I didn't say that. Ideally, I'd like a chef who keeps a clean kitchen, but knows a thing or two about bacon, or at least makes a solid effort. If she doesn't know how to bake or isn't good at cooking, I guess I could teach her. But he shrugged. I like the idea of being with someone where we can both teach each other to cook new, quality recipes. In non-analogy terms, please. Fine. I'm after a woman who likes sex. But doesn't put the lust part above the intelligence part. She could have a hundred partners for all I care, just as long as they've been vetted for psychopathic tendencies. I have four rules. Number one, don't invite a person into your body if you wouldn't invite her into your kitchen. Number two, the act needs to take place in a clean environment. Number three, precautions need to be taken to protect from disease and pregnancy. And number four. Don't ration the passion, i.e., put your best fuck forward. I had to press my lips together, even in my current state of despair. Put your best fuck forward was hilarious. I might have to steal that Cletus. Go right ahead. I ain't using it for anything profitable. Wanting to get back to Jethro's guilt, I asked. So these women at the motorcycle club, they didn't take precautions. It's not just the women. That's what I'm saying. Neither party thinks about any of the above. Not the women or the men. No one has a clean kitchen. Everyone is serving pop tarts and calling it pie. And the kitchen is full of sociopaths going around being violent fools. It's gonorrhea city up in that place, and that's why I think it's gross. And Jethro? Well, he didn't think about it until he did think about it. And when he thought about it, he stopped. And then he called the health inspector. And now he's kept his kitchen spotless by not baking anything for anyone, just for himself. This is the basis for all his guilt—that he made thoughtless, horny decisions as a youth. He told you about stealing cars. Yes, but he was never convicted, right? That's right. But he did it regardless. Never paid for it either. I think it bothers him the stealing and not being punished for him. He was going to turn himself in, but my mama asked him not to. She asked him to go to school instead, be a man we would all look up to. She said, and I agreed, he could make up for his thieving by doing right by his family. 
He wouldn't have done a lick of good locked up. He still feels undeserving, though. He still feels like he should be punished. I think so. Never mind all the shit he put up with when he was thieving from our father and the club. If you ask me, he's already paid his debt. But, uh, Cletus hesitated, scratching his jaw. There was this one time our father tried to do something untoward concerning Ashley. I nodded, noting softly. Jethro told me about that. Then I assume he told you about Roxy and Kim. I tensed. No. Who are they? Are they club women? Yes and no. Yes, they became club women, but Jethro introduced them to the lifestyle, and now they're both hooked on drugs and live at the club, getting passed around by those sociopaths. He blames himself. Ah, I see. And I did see. And that was a big deal. Kim thought Jethro was her old man, and he likely lied to lead her on, and Roxy, who he also led on, was half in love with him when he took her to the club the first time. What has he done about it? I mean, has he tried to help? Yes, but neither of those ladies are interested in his help. I was almost too afraid to ask. What happened to them? Well, now, Roxy's still there, but we haven't seen Kim in ages. Jethro was going to offer marriage to one of them a few years back. Roxy, I think, just to get her out of the club. But Drew counseled him against it, meaning he talked sense into Jet. And these women aren't the only ones he brought into the Iron Wraiths, but they're the only ones that stayed. Susie Samuels, for instance. Once she figured out Jethro was stringing her along, she set fire to his motorcycle. She hates his guts and spews obscenities at him every time their paths cross. That's the way most of them went. The Tanner twins, Susie Samuels, Gretchen LaRoe to name a few. He's got a pack of females in these parts who hate his guts and would happily speak to your news people about how terrible a person he is. Oh, my goodness. Why doesn't he leave? I suppose he feels he deserves it after how he mistreated them and all he's done. Hearing names paired with Jethro's misdeeds made his past feel more real. The names gave weight to his guilt as well as his concern about hurting my image. Even so... He wasn't the same person. He'd proved that. Five years of living a different life, making good decisions, and being honorable was proof enough for me. I don't know what to do, I admitted. Tell me what to do, Cletus. It's simple. Tell the world you're together and deal with the consequences. End of story. I frowned at my tea. And take away Jethro's privacy? Throw him to the wolves? Give these women a stage for their scorn? Yes. If that's the price of being with you, I know he'll gladly pay it. You're acting like Jethro is some delicate flower. That man feels remorse for his wrongs. But he's not hiding from his sins. He's more concerned about what this'll do to your image. I don't care about that. I honestly don't. If I had to choose between being an actress and Jethro, I'd choose him each time. You don't care about being an actress? A celebrity? No. I mean, I like that the work I've done, the work I'm doing, might pave the way for others like me. Women in film who don't all look one particular way. If I've given hope to one little girl who thinks she has weight issues, or brown skin, or an odd sense of humor, that yes, you can be successful, and no, there's nothing wrong with being different. Being different should be an asset. I like that I might have contributed to changing the perception that women aren't funny. I like acting, performing. Worst case scenario, and keeping it real here, having Jethro in my life might knock me off this ridiculous pedestal, but it's not going to get me blacklisted. I can still perform. It might not be an A-list big-budget movies. I might not be America's sweetheart, but screw that. Please believe me when I tell you being with him Sharing my life with him means more to me than being any level of celebrity. Cletus set his tea on the table between us with a thunk. He doesn't care about his privacy. You don't care about your image. So why not just trust each other and move on? It's not that simple. It's as simple as dry toast. 
You're encouraging me to knowingly hurt him. Cletus grunted impatiently and threw his hands up. We're talking in circles. Here's reality. People get hurt and they move on or they don't. You can't have it both ways. You either get to be famous and deal with the hassle that comes with it, or you leave it all behind. Own your shit, Sienna. And let Jethro own his. And then get married and own that shit together. Cletus stood, clearly frustrated, and stomped away from me to the back door. He disappeared into the house, only to appear three seconds later to add, And while you're at it, but get me some nieces and nephews. Own your shit, and let Jethro own his. <sighs> 2.25 a.m. I was exhausted. I couldn't sleep. Cletus's words from earlier in the day were bouncing around, commandeering my thoughts. He was right. He was very, very right. My job meant that privacy was a luxury, but so what? Either I was going to live my life alone, avoid relationships, give in to the fear of hurting the people I cared about, or I was going to own my shit. So, where did that leave Jethro and me? I wasn't going to jump unless he was with me. I couldn't make this decision for the both of us. I glanced at the photo of us on my phone, the one I'd taken of us kissing. Just then, I received a text, and my heart jumped to my throat. Jethro, are you up? I quickly messaged back. Sienna, yes? Jethro, I have something to ask you, a new proposal. Sienna, ask me. Jethro, I'm coming over. Sienna, okay. Sienna, I miss you. Jethro, I miss you so much. Sorry I left. I'll be right there. Sienna, I don't care about my image. I wish you would believe me. If I lose film roles, so what? I love my work, but I'll love it just as much working on smaller films. I checked my phone obsessively for five minutes. When he didn't respond, I sent him another message. Sienna, what would you do if I sent this picture of us kissing to every celebrity blogger and reporter I know? Jethro, don't. I quickly typed a new message. Sienna, I'm going to do it. Sienna, and I'm going to send them your full name and social security number. Sienna, and a picture of me giving the double middle finger salute. Sienna, naked. Jethro, hold your horses, woman. I'm on my way. I leapt from my bed and darted out my bedroom door. Running down the steps, I had to temper my footfalls when I reached the second landing. I didn't want to wake Dave and Tim. Henry was on duty, and I spotted him as soon as I cleared the last stair. He was sitting in front of the TV, watching a baseball game, and looked over his shoulder as I appeared. Can't sleep? He looked nervous, like he expected me to burst into tears at any moment. Shaking my head, I darted to the foyer. No, no, Jethro is coming over. I'll let him in. Watch your game. I paced in the front door, peeking out the window every five seconds. After an eternity, sixteen minutes, the headlights of his truck appeared, filling the windows and momentarily blinding me. I grabbed the door handle, thinking maybe he wanted me to meet him outside, but then stopped myself. I didn't want to meet him outside. I didn't want to have this conversation in his truck. I didn't want to make it easy for him to say goodbye, if that's what he was planning. Stepping away from the door, I walked back to the living room and loud whispered to Henry, Get the door when he knocks and send him upstairs. Got it? Wide-eyed, Henry nodded and stood from the couch. I jogged up the stairs back to my room and paced the length of it, straining my ears for the sound of Jethro's approach. Not a minute later, I heard footfalls on the stairs. I tried to swallow, but I couldn't. My hands were shaking, so I placed my phone on the dresser and turned to face the open door. And then, he was there. Hovering just outside my room, his eyes moving over me, he was still gorgeous, dressed in a white t-shirt and dark jeans, boots, and no belt. His hair was in disarray, and he looked tired. He'd obviously dressed in a hurry. But the sight of him filled my heart with impatience and anxious joy. So, in other words, hope. Come in. His eyes lifted to mine, and I felt a pang when I saw how guarded they were, how bracing. You should probably put a robe on, he said gruffly. I glanced down at myself, saw I was in my normal pajamas, 
pink cotton sleep shorts and a matching camisole. Of course, when Jethro had slipped over, I'd been naked. I stuck my hip out and placed my hand on it. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. I'm not putting a robe on. Sienna? Jethro? I admit, I used my sexy voice. His eyes heated. I'm not putting a robe on. And I wouldn't. I wasn't going to put a robe on because if he was here to break up for good, I wasn't going to make it easy. No way. If you can't control yourself, then don't control yourself. You have my full permission to ogle and or touch me however you like. My breath caught on the last word because as I spoke, his eyes narrowed, sharp and predatory, and he took a step into my room. Holding my gaze captive, he closed the door behind him. With a signature unaffected confidence, he crossed the space and stopped just in front of me, inches separating us. I lifted my chin, balled my hands into fists. I had to force myself not to take a step back. The weight and intensity of his stare was almost too much to endure, but I did. His eyes dropped to my mouth, then to my neck, slid along my collarbone, raising goosebumps wherever his gaze focused. He lifted a large hand and placed it on my arm. The heat and strength of him had me sucking in a breath. His fingers pulled the strap of my top to one side, burying my shoulder to his eyes. Tingles raced down my spine, blossomed in my chest, made my heart thunder between my ears. His eyes on the skin he'd uncovered. Jethro said, I'm in love with you. I blinked at him, at his admission. You. My lips parted, and I blinked some more. I. You. I was well and truly stunned because those weren't the words I'd been bracing for. Meanwhile, Jethro continued staring at my skin, his thumb rubbing a slow circle on the front of my shoulder, as though spellbound. He pulled the strap further down, his other hand doing the same to the second strap until my chest was bare to his eyes. Bending at the waist, his strong fingers sliding to my back and pressing me forward, he licked a wet trail around the center of my breast, sucking me into his mouth with an abandoned groan. We were moving. He was moving us, walking me backward to the bed. My fingers were in his hair, my nails anchored to his scalp, holding him to me. Tingly sparks ignited beneath my skin, racing over my body. Large, strong hands held me in place as he devoured my skin, biting and sucking, soothing the marks with his hot tongue. And I was moving. I slid my hands to his jeans, enjoying how the muscles beneath his plain white tee tensed and hardened under my fingertips. Unfastening the button, then the zipper, I reached for him, my fingers greedy. He hissed as I cupped and stroked him through his boxers, the feel of him so hard and ready awakened some primitive part of my mind. I'm in love with you, he repeated. But this time I got the impression he was speaking to himself. His fingers dug into my hips, his thumbs dipping into the band of my shorts, hooking in the elastic. I want to make love to you. Jethro, I panted, his words sobering me only slightly, the anticipation both sweet and torturous. His mouth met mine and he kissed me tenderly, yet I could feel how he held himself back, every muscle strained, tight, rigid. Silly Sienna, smart Sienna. He continued on a low growl against my lips, one hand threading through my hair, the other dipping into my shorts and panties, inching them down my hips. Sexy Sienna. I rushed to say, I don't want you to do something you'll regret. He hesitated, but just for a split second, and then he was wrapping the bulk of my hair around his hand and tugging, exposing my neck. The action made me arch, my breasts lifting. He lavished the exposed skin with hot, hungry kisses, my shorts and panties now past my hips to my thighs. I wanted him badly. Yet even though his touch burned like fire, my blood simmering, my body hot and aching, I didn't want him for just one night. I couldn't remove this thought, this worry from my mind. He loved me. He loved me and wanted to make love to me. Right now. Meanwhile, I wanted the forever he'd promised and didn't want to do anything to jeopardize it. Wait. I withdrew my fingers from his pants and gripped his shoulders. The wet trail he left exposed to the cool air made me shiver as he traveled lower, easing me onto the bed. Do you want me to stop? 
he asked gruffly, using his knee to spread my legs as soon as my back hit the mattress. No, I don't want you to stop, but I... Shh. His hot breath fanned over my stomach, his hands tugging at the camisole around my waist, lifting it so he could tongue my belly button. I groaned, then swallowed, removing my hands from his shoulders, squeezing my eyes shut, and forcing myself to concentrate. And when I did, I said the first words that popped into my head. I love you too. By mother's nipples, I love this man. It was everything about him, from how he was a truly talented flirt to his epic levels of capability. No matter what it was, he had it handled. Nothing in the world was more alluring than a capable man. Jethro's hands stilled on my thighs. In fact, he stopped moving, period. But I heard him breathe, felt his heart beat against my thigh. And this isn't temporary, I continued abruptly, pressing my fists into my closed lids. And you made a promise to yourself that the next person you would make love to would be your wife. I don't want you to break your promise, but Godzilla's Modzilla, Jethro, if you don't stop right now, I will cheerfully contribute to your downfall, and then you'll never be rid of me. Saying nothing, he skimmed his fingertips around to the backs of my legs and lifted my knees, placing them over his shoulders. Oh, God. I swallowed the words, gripping the sheets on either side of me reflexively, because in the next second, his hot, wet, skillful mouth was on me, and my body strained, entirely tuned to that one blissful spot. He wasn't quiet either, lapping with his tongue, sliding his fingers, and groaning as my breath hitched. It felt so good, sinful, and right. And I kind of hated that he was a master at this. I especially hated that he had me so turned on I couldn't savor the feel of him. I was coming apart too soon, my body in various states of anarchy. Unlike the other times he'd brought me to climax, this time he didn't draw it out, didn't chase the second release. Instead, he let my legs drop and stood. I opened my eyes, watched as he pulled several condoms from his back pocket, and tossed all but one to the nightstand. Ensnaring my gaze, he dropped his pants, ripped open the square packet with his teeth, and smoothly rolled a condom down his length. Do you want me to stop? He asked gruffly, reaching for my knees again and spreading my legs. I shook my head, too stunned by what was happening to give voice to my consent. Also, I was impressed at his condom rolling skills. I mean, he was super fast. He paused. Sienna? Don't stop. I breathed, choking on desire and amazement. With sure movement, he placed a knee on the bed and shifted his hands to my hips, lifting me, sliding his length against my sensitive center. I shuddered and writhed, reaching for him, feeling empty. Then, with a graceful roll of his hips, he entered me. Slowly at first, and not all the way. He took his time, torturing me as he stretched my swollen flesh though his eyes were blazing. Once again, the intensity there burned. And this time, I felt branded. Jethro, I moaned, still reaching for him, near panic with my need to touch him. Finally, finally, he bent forward, smoothly lowering my hips to the bed and planking over me. I greedily touched him everywhere, wanting his skin, his warm chest against mine. But he continued to hold himself at a distance rolling his hips like a gifted dancer. He didn't thrust. He rocked. His movements were fluid, stroking me with the moist, intimate part of himself. It was maddening, and so unlike anything I'd ever experienced. It was perfection. The view of his arms and chest and stomach bracing his waist while he expertly rocked into my body had me gasping and closing my eyes. I felt him everywhere though our bodies met only where I lay my hands and where he made love to me. Fuck. Fuck, fuck, fuck. He made love like he walked, like he spoke, like he lived. With complete confidence and artless self-assurance, it was straightforward, passionate, and beautiful. It broke something in me, 
something I didn't consciously know existed, a wall I'd built with jokes, flippant comebacks, and careless shrugs. He broke my shield against all those who'd ever criticized my inability to fit in or conform. Because what he thought mattered. How he touched me, how he saw me, what he said, and how he spoke to me mattered. I wanted to please him. I wanted to drive him crazy, open myself to him, trust him completely. I wanted to be truly vulnerable. I wanted him to dominate and cherish and use my body. I wanted him to want me, need me. I wanted him satisfied, but insatiable, always craving more, always thinking of me. With those thoughts spiraling through my mind, tears in my eyes and frantic longing in my heart, I came apart again, his name tumbling from my lips over and over like a plea. I love you, he growled, kissing my face, my neck, my chest. As my body intuitively tightened around his, his movements quickened, but we were no less graceful and hypnotic. I love you, I echoed and then repeated. I love you. And then he captured my mouth with his, and he came. Jethro Winston was my forever person. I would never be strong enough to let him go. Chapter 31 We have faith that there is purpose. We hope for things we can't see. We believe that there are lessons in loss, power in love, and that we have within us the potential for a beauty so magnificent, our bodies can't contain it. Amy Harmon, Making Faces Jethro Everything was going according to plan, just in the wrong order. But that was fine. I'd arrived with an agenda. I could now cross off the second item on my list. We were lying on her bed above the sheets facing each other kissing, petting, and getting worked up all over again. I was naked, but she still had her camisole around her waist. I wanted to remove it so I could see and touch her entire gorgeous body. I started lifting the top, and she stilled my movements, the look in her eyes snagging my attention. She looked worried. You can tell a joke if you want, I offered, my voice rough because speaking sense wasn't coming easy, not after what we'd just done, not with what we were still doing. Her eyebrows bounced upward. Why would I do that? Because that's what you do when you're anxious about something. I palmed her breast, loving how it overflowed in my hand. I had big hands. Really big hands. Even though her skin held a flush from our earlier lovemaking, the pink intensified and she ducked her head. Does it bother you? I lifted her chin, forcing her to meet my eyes. No. I love it. I brushed a kiss over her luscious lips and whispered, I love everything about you. She sighed, and it sounded wounded, sad. I shifted back so I could see her, noticed she had tears in her eyes. I pushed my fingers into her hair and held her face so she couldn't hide again. Sienna, honey, what's wrong? I care what you think. I lifted an eyebrow at this. And that's making you cry? She nodded and wrapped her leg around mine like she was securing our bodies together. I grinned at her and her beautiful face and said, I care what you think. She sniffed. Please don't regret a single thing that just happened. It was so beautiful. I think I'd have to murder you if you regretted the hottest lovemaking of all time. Shaking my head, my eyelids lowered as all parts of my body recalled each exquisite moment, each hitch of her breath, each reflexive movement. The moment she admitted her love might never be surpassed, but the feel of her supple body, her heat, her submissive, greedy arousal came in a close second. A very close second. I'd likely have to take her again soon just to make sure. I attempted to soothe her. I'll never regret a second of being with you. Being with you is where I belong. Her breaths were coming faster than usual. Obviously, she was still fretting. What can I say to calm your fears? I whispered, kissing her nose. I don't know, she said, and she looked serious, her eyes darting between mine. 
I studied her, wondering if now was the right time to ask her to marry me. But everything was happening backward. She was supposed to be dressed when I arrived. We were supposed to talk, sort through our troubles. I was supposed to make my case. Then, after she was wearing the ring, we were supposed to make love. I've been thinking about your proposal. I started carefully. She was skittish, and I didn't want to frighten her off. Which? Which proposal? That we see each other in secret for a time. She swallowed, and her leg tightened over mine. Oh, you should marry me, I said suddenly, ripping off the proverbial band-aid and nodding at the wisdom of my words. We should get married. Her lips parted, and I was pleased to see most of the anxiety plaguing her expression had disappeared. However, in all fairness, the anxiety was replaced by surprise. She blinked, her mouth moving, but no sound coming out. Hear me out. I smoothed my hand from her neck to her hip, tucking her body an inch closer, my grip tightening. You think we ought to date in secret? I don't think... Just listen. I hate that idea. I do. I hate it. Now, part of my hate is because I don't want to lie to folks, but the other part is selfish. I'm in love with you, and the idea of us being a secret makes me want to break something. Or cut down all the trees on the mountain. Her gaze turned warm and soft, and her lush body relaxed into mine, making it difficult for me to think. I never... Let me finish. I growled, the words coming out much gruffer than I'd intended, because my heart was now beating at a breakneck pace. And I wanted her again. I wanted her crying my name and losing her mind. I wanted her begging me to do dirty things, hearing her soft moans and watching her body bounce and ripple and yield beneath mine. So, yeah, I was gruff. So, what I propose is that we do this in secret, at first. We do this slowly, and I'll work with someone to help lessen the fallout. Her face scrunched. Like an image consultant? Sure, fine. Just someone who will help soften the edges of my past for general consumption. So you aren't paying the price for my past misdeeds. And I'd pay for it all. I had plenty of money. My mama came from money. In addition to the house and land, I'd inherited two million dollars last month when I turned 31. I'd done nothing with it. It was in a bank in Knoxville collecting dust. Jethro! And I'll sign a prenup or whatever. I don't care about your money. I know you don't. But we get married now, before the movie wraps. Wait, I know it might not make sense to you, and I know this is fast, but I'm certain. Listen, Fora, I could deal with keeping things secret in the short term, if we were engaged. I finished, frowning so she'd know I was dead serious and had given the matter serious thought. I couldn't see her, not really, because my heart was beating in my throat and I was nervous as hell. So it took me a full minute before she came back into focus, before I stepped out of my own way long enough to see her soft, wondrous smile. Yes, she whispered, her smile beaming back at me. Sienna shifted on the bed, arching her back and straining so she could kiss me. It took me another few seconds to comprehend that she'd accepted. And when I did, I finally exhaled. Yes, I couldn't believe it. I held her smiling gaze as she nodded, grinning wildly. Holy shit. I cursed, beyond happy, beyond joy and elation. I was equal parts euphoric and stunned. Wrapping her in my arms, bringing her body flush with mine, I kissed her. And then I'd made love to her again, taking special care of my woman. Because I'd just won the lottery of life. Sienna Diaz was going to be my wife. The least I could do was show my betrothed how much she was loved. I fished the ring out of my pants pocket while she slept, after we'd made love for a second time and as the sun rose. I slipped it on her finger where it belonged. She stirred just as I fixed it into place. Her lashes fluttered. She saw me and reached for me. I grabbed her hand, pressed her palms together, and brought her wrist to my lips. She gave me a sleepy smile, but then she blinked, her eyes snagging on her third finger, her gaze sharpening and her mouth opening. I grinned. She looked like a cartoon character. Exaggerated wide eyes, gaping mouth, disbelieving wrinkle between her eyebrows. I loved how expressive she was. Holy shit! 
Her gaze moved back to mine, and she repeated breathlessly, Holy shit! I grinned wider. It's platinum, a two-carat old mine-cut diamond, passed down on the Oliver side of the family for three generations, from father to oldest son, each giving it to their betrothed. After my grandmother passed, my mama, who was an only child, kept it in a safety deposit box my daddy didn't know about. Before meeting Sienna, I tried to give the ring to Drew for Ashley. He turned me down, saying, Your mama wanted you to have it, for your woman. She liked to talk about you as a father, raising your own babies. She thought you'd make a great dad someday. Even I appreciated the epic nature of this ring, an heirloom, impressive, irreplaceable, important beyond its monetary value. Priceless. It caught and captivated the light, glittering like a thousand stars. The ring looked important, and that was good because it communicated to her and to the world how I saw her. She was important, impressive, and irreplaceable to me. This is my ring? Her words caught, her voice cracking. I nodded. Happy, she was happy. Her happiness was all that mattered to me. This is your ring. Her eyes filled with tears, and she moved them to mine. This is my ring. And you're going to be my husband. I laughed, though my throat was also tight with some emotion I couldn't quite pin down. It was more than contentment, more than relief, more than joy. It was all of those things, and more. I decided it was love, because nothing else had ever come close to feeling this good. Chapter 32 when the debate is lost, slander becomes the tool of the loser. Socrates Jethro We didn't announce our engagement to my family. I hated lying, yet I would in order to protect Sienna. But I wasn't about to ask my family to tell falsehoods. So we said nothing during the few days that followed our engagement, neither confirmed nor denied the truth. Luckily, no one asked. They just eyeballed the ring and arrived at their own conclusions. Though Cletus was huffing more than usual since he caught sight of it. She wore the ring on her right hand most of the time when she was on the set or when we were at my house. But when we were together, just the two of us, she'd slip it onto her left and stare as though she expected it to disappear. Like now. We were in her trailer five days after my proposal, the sun just rising in the sky. Though we hadn't planned to, we'd spent the night. I'd stop by with takeout from the front porch, expecting to take her home after. One kiss turned into several kisses, then kisses all over, then urgent love making on the kitchen table. Neither of us wanted to leave after that. She was off to London in the morning, and this was our last stretch of time together before she left. So Sienna had made coffee, and we talked until late, sharing one bunk. The twin bed should have been uncomfortable, but it wasn't. The small space meant I held her tight all through the night, and that suited me just fine. You're staring at it again, I teased, drawing her attention to me. She started, her gaze flickering to mine. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were awake. I slid my hand from her back to her thigh, savoring the feel of her. Christ, I wanted to touch her everywhere at once. Why are you apologizing? I don't know. She laughed lightly. It sounded like she was speaking to herself, she added. I'm just not used to caring so much about what someone else thinks. I inched my head back and stared at her profile, thinking on her words. She must have felt my attention because she closed her eyes, cleared her throat self-consciously, and joked. I think I'm going to be a very clingy fiancé. You'll be tactile, I'll be clingy, and we'll be very happy just as long as we sleep in a twin bed and call each other 1,700 times a day. I chuckled. She was joking, but her words held a kernel of truth. It didn't take a mind reader to see she was afraid. It's good to care, Sienna. It's good to care about what others think, but only when those other people matter. She lifted her chin and gazed at me, her long lashes brushing against her cheeks as she blinked. But how do you balance it? I mean, I care what my parents think because I love them and know they love me and I trust their judgment. But in the end... I always just do what I think is best. Then that's what you keep doing. I trust your heart, and so should you. She hesitated, searching my eyes, then blurted. But I don't want to let you down. 
I caught my bottom lip before I grinned. You won't. My parents have to love me. So does my family. They have no choice. We're stuck with each other. I do stupid things, and I know they'll forgive me. But you? You could just leave me, and... I cut her off with a kiss because she was talking nonsense. Once I had her restless and out of breath, I broke the kiss and smoothed her hair from her face. I don't do things by half, Sienna. I tell you I love you. I mean it. I ask you to marry me. Technically, you never asked. I ignored her, though the truth she spoke made me smile. I'm not going to change my mind. After your sister called, after she pointed out some hard truths, I needed time, and I took it. And I couldn't let you go, though part of me thought it would be for the best. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be for the best. You should never think that. I won't. I've made my decision, selfish as it is, and so have you. We're in this together. We have a good deal to learn about each other. You can't ever be certain of another person, and that's where faith comes in. I've asked a lot of people to have faith in me when I didn't deserve it, and I'm asking the same of you now. Her fingers gripped my bicep, squeezing. You do deserve it. I nodded. Fine, then. I deserve it. You should give it to me. And move on from your worry. But don't you see? It's not you, Jethro. It's me. Do I deserve your faith? Do you want my faith? Yes. She shook me a little for emphasis, her single-word answer loud in the small trailer. Yes, I want it. But I'm not used to considering someone else in my decisions. I'll need your patience. Then you have it. Thank you. She sighed. But I wasn't finished. I'll give you my patience, but don't expect me to be a statue or a doormat. If you make me angry, I'm going to let you know. Her eyes widened and lost focus, clearly thinking back on a memory. You're a little scary when you're angry. I lifted an eyebrow at this and frowned, concerned. I would never, ever hurt you or touch you in anger. Oh, I know. She lowered her eyes to my neck. It's still scary, though. I studied her the way she was biting her lip. Sienna, I might leave to cool off, but I'll always come back. That's part of the promise I made when I gave you this ring. She nodded, still not looking at me, but then she said, I guess I just have to trust you. Yeah, just like I have to trust you. Her mouth tugged to the side. Trust me not to drive you crazy. Oh, no, I laughed. You'll definitely drive me crazy. I have no illusions about that. Your name is Insane, after all. She scrunched her face and pinched my shoulder. I flinched away, still laughing, and grabbed her hand to halt her assault. What I meant was, I waited for her to meet my eyes again before continuing. I trust you. I have faith in you that no matter where you go or what you're doing, in the end, you'll always come back to me. I left Sienna's trailer wearing yesterday's clothes and a big smile. Who knew tight quarters could be so much fun? We couldn't get far enough away from each other to allow any measure of space, so of course accidental touching became on-purpose touching. I blamed my size and hers. In other words, we were perfect for each other. It's the lumber sexual. I looked up, finding Mr. Lowe strolling toward me, an unpleasant expression on his face. Now here was a guy who was an asshole. I hated these guys because they reminded me of who I used to be. I nodded my head once in greeting, but had no intent to actually stop and converse. Unfortunately, his plans didn't align with mine. Blocking the path so I'd have to stop or walk into him, he held his hands up between us and said, Aren't you going to say hello, or is that business about southern manners an exaggeration? I stepped back, thinking it would be a bad idea for me to be within easy punching distance and shoved my hands in my pockets. Morning, Mr. Lowe. You can call me Tom. After all, he shrugged, we both fucked the same woman. Yep, good thing he wasn't within punching distance. Good decision. I blinked at him once, then turned on my heel and walked away. I would take the long way around to my truck. No biggie. He jogged after me. Hey, where are you going? Busy planting trees or whatever you Boy Scouts do? I made a list of what needed to be picked up from the grocery store for dinner. 
Making list helps. Cletus had taught me to do that. Not many people knew, but Cletus had a terrible temper. As a kid, his tantrums were legendary, and as a teenager, his rage made him blind. He kept it all locked up now by making mental lists whenever he felt the urge to pummel someone. Of course, he also hatched maniacal plans of revenge against anyone who crossed him. But when I often considered giving Cletus a hairless cat as a present so his James Bond supervillain image would be complete. But then, Tom pushed my back, making me stumble forward a few steps. I didn't like to be pushed. Riding myself, I turned slowly. Mr. Lowe was obviously after a confrontation. What do you want? My voice was gruff, but that's to be expected. I kept my hands in my pocket, another trick I'd learned from Cletus. Man, he shook his head, sneering. She did a number on you. You actually think you're special, don't you? People are laughing at you. I stared at him, giving him nothing. Running late for work wasn't a worry. I figured he'd wear himself out eventually. I know you're a simple people, but do you honestly think Sienna Diaz is interested? In you? Her sister would never allow it. You have heard of Marta, haven't you? Sienna listens to her sister about everything. See, Marta and I are good friends, and I know she hates the idea of you. You're already as good as gone. He chuckled, and it was forced. I tried to ignore his words, but some of them hit a target. Just as we hadn't told my family, we hadn't told Sienna's. We knew Marta was definitely not Teen Jethro. Yet. And yet, Mr. Lowe wanted me to doubt. He wanted chaos. I refused to give it to him. So, I needed kale from the store and tomatoes and feta. We already had garlic and onions. You're nothing, he spat. When filming wraps, you're gone. And then she's off to her next fuck buddy. Man, I really wanted to shut his mouth. Breaking his jaw would do the trick. Instead, I started making a new list of how many ways I could wreck his pretty face. Hey! He stepped directly in front of me and snapped his fingers in front of my eyes. Can you hear me, hillbilly? Or are you too stupid? On instinct, I grabbed his wrist and wrenched it behind his back, shoving him away. He stumbled, then fell to one knee. You're drunk, old-timer. Go home. I readied myself for a right hook because how he was crouched lent himself well to a surprise punch in the face. That was assuming Mr. Lowe even knew how to fight. Mr. Lowe straightened and turned rage in his eyes. I guess he didn't like being called old-timer. Honestly, I suspected as much. That's why I'd said it. Fuck you, he said. I'm not old. I shrugged, unable to contain my smirk. That was childish. Shame on me. Are you finished? I asked, pulling my phone from my pocket and glancing at the screen. I still had time, but that didn't mean I wanted to spend any more of it in Mr. Lowe's company. His eyes flickered to my phone. Let me guess. She took a picture of the two of you, right? While you were kissing. I stiffened, my glare lifting to his. He grinned. She put it on your phone, right? Made it her avatar. I frowned, unable to conceal my stunned confusion. He laughed. I know, because she did the same thing to me. She does the same thing to everyone. It's all part of her little game. My heart did an odd sinking thing and my mouth fell open, my mind a mess of contradictions. I'm ashamed to say he almost had me doubting her. Almost. He was a good actor. Plus, he was motivated. But then he said... She wants you to go with her to London, to the premiere. Marta will talk some sense into her. And that was his mistake. His words came into focus. The key fit into the lock and the door opened wide. I laughed, saying, Of course, mostly to myself. Mr. Lowe's eyes narrowed into slits. What's the joke, Hick? I surveyed him. This successful man, this icon of film, of our society... He was a person who cared too much about his image, but spent no time on what actually mattered. I felt sorry for him. His life was sad. What? He snapped, obviously not liking how I was looking at him. Let's see it. I kept my tone gentle, showing him he had my pity, not my anger. He stiffened. Let's see what? Let's see the picture, the one Sienna put on your phone. 
He took a half step back. I, I don't have my phone on me. Bullshit. He held himself rigid, though he was a really good actor. I recognized he hadn't expected me to call his bluff. I shook my head, pressing my lips together in a sympathetic smile. Sienna didn't put a picture on your phone, but her sister obviously told you about the one she put on mine. My words did not settle well with him. His bitterness and helplessness was just as plain as the nose on his face. Mr. Lowe's eyes flashed with hatred. He wanted to hit me, wanted to beat the tar out of me, make me bleed. Again, I felt sorry for him. It must have sucked to be so incapable. I glanced at my phone again. It was past time for me to leave. We don't believe in false pleasantries around these parts, nor do we kick a fellow when he's down. So I'll just say, bless your heart, and leave it at that. Chapter 33 Until you've lost your reputation, you never realize what a burden it was or what freedom really is. Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind Sienna I called my mom on my way to the airport. Dave was driving. Henry was next to me in the back, and Tim was in the front passenger seat, leaving me with both hands and all my attention free. I hadn't spoken to her since she'd given me advice about Jethro. She and my dad had been on a cruise and were back today. I'd missed our phone calls. Selecting her number, I tapped the call button and waited. It went to voicemail. Hi, Mom. It's me. I'm on my way to the airport for London and miss your voice. I know you get back today. Call me when you get this. I might be on the flight, but I'll call you back when I land. Love you and Dad. Peering at my screen, my heart sunk. I wanted to tell her about Jethro. No, that's not right. I needed to tell her about Jethro. I wanted her to know her advice had been correct and that she had been right. He was my one, and I was his. I needed to share the news about our engagement. I needed to hear her scream and get excited to ask me when we would start having babies. I was the first of her daughters to get married, though Maya and Rena were in committed relationships. They were both career-focused and had no immediate plans to have children. That was me just months ago, whereas my brothers and their wives brought up children as a maybe-someday concept. My mother had lamented loudly and frequently to all of us on several occasions about how she wanted grandchildren. I love you all so smart, so capable and accomplished. I'm so proud of you. But where are my grandchildren? She would ask, her hand on her hip, her eyebrows raised. Who am I going to give my china to? Hmm? Who is going to inherit my jewelry? These were the things she fussed over. But we all knew she just loved babies and wanted one to spoil and squeeze. Dave dropped Henry, Tim, and me off at the side terminal reserved for chartered flights and parked the car. After checking in and meeting back up with Dave, we were ushered to the tarmac where the jet was already waiting. I held my phone the whole time, hoping my mom would call me back before we departed. Thus, I received Jethro's text message as soon as I started climbing the steps to the plane. Jethro I got a hold of your publicity person and have a phone appointment on Monday. Sienna, I already miss you. I wish you were here with me. I sent the text, irrational anger rising in my chest, making it hard to swallow. I hated that he wasn't with me. I hated we were keeping our relationship secret, our engagement a secret. I hated we hadn't officially told his family, but I understood why we hadn't. But I still hated it. I hated that my mother and father had decided to go on a cruise and weren't answering their phone. But most of all, I hated that I hated everything. Jethro, I'll come next time when we're sorted. Sienna, I should have hidden you in my suitcase. Jethro, it's not big enough. Sienna, that's what she said. Jethro, you are the funniest. Mr. Lowe? Didn't expect to see you. Dave's surprised statement pulled my attention away from my messages to the interior of the aircraft. Sure enough, Tom was lounging on one of the benches, holding a glass of water with lime. What are you doing here? I didn't make any attempt to hide my dismay. I offered him a spot. I turned my head, saw Marta standing by the cockpit, an unconcerned expression on her features. 
her smile growing warm as she glanced at Tom. She continued, I thought it would be nice. I'm sure the filming schedule has been crazy, and with all your writing, you haven't had any downtime. I gaped at my sister. Certain my horrified expression said it all. Now she acknowledges I need downtime? Now? She blinked at me, looking bewildered. Is there anything wrong? I leaned close and whispered, Yes, I'd rather fly in a dog crate, in the luggage compartment, than spend ten hours trapped in a plane with that insufferable asshat. Her mouth flattened. Sienna? Get him off the plane, or I'm not going. She glittered her teeth. You're being rude. No. You're being rude and presumptuous. She huffed. You can be such a diva sometimes. Lifting my voice, I said, No, I'm not. I'm never a diva. I'm paying for this plane, so that makes it my plane. Turning to Tom, I motioned to the door. Martha shouldn't have offered you a seat. I want you to leave. Tom's surprised gaze moved from me to my sister. When his eyes moved back to mine, they were hard, and his expression made me take a step back. Is this because of what happened with your bearded friend? The one you've been fucking on the set? Marta gasped. I didn't gasp. I heaved a sigh because I was bored. Oh, for the sake of Rodan's ceiling fan, would you just leave without making a big scene? Is that possible? There are no Academy members here to see your drama. You can't use this for your reel. Just leave. His brow darkened and he stood, smoothed the hand down his shirt front, and then grabbed the Louis Vuitton overnight bag at his feet. You're washed up. This guy's going to make a laughing stock of you. Well, I hope so. In case you didn't get the memo, I'm a comedian. He paused as he moved past me, then turned his blue eyes prideful and beseeching. I could have helped you, Sienna. I still can. That's why I'm here. To help you and your sister clean up this mess. My anger fizzled, leaving me tired. It's not a mess, Tom. Jethro is not a mess. He's what I want. I'm in love with him. Even if that means throwing everything away? He sounded truly perplexed. I shook my head and sighed. If you don't fight for what you love, then you have nothing worth losing. We were over the Atlantic when Martha finally spoke to me. I can't believe you made him leave. She shook her head for the hundredth time. Though she'd been giving me the silent treatment, she'd shaken her head every three minutes since takeoff. I can't believe you asked him to come. She gave me a disbelieving look. Sienna, we're all going to the same place. It's ridiculous he should fly separately. No, it's not. We dated Martha. I dated Tom. We only dated for one or two weeks, but I broke up with him for very valid reasons, all having to do with how irritating he is. I've never seen him be anything but nice to you. I snorted. Really? Well, a few weeks ago, he suggested I try a low-carb diet if I wanted to win back the Smash Girl role. She stared at me, biting the inside of her lip, then shook her head. Okay. Yeah, that's an asshole thing to say. I threw my hands up. Finally? Finally what? Finally you admit that Tom Lowe doesn't walk on jello and smell like gardenias. Her lips pulled to the side. Gardenias are my favorite. Exactly. Sometimes I wonder if you like him more than you like me. Marta gave me a rare smile. Well, he is prettier than you are. That made me laugh, even as I narrowed my eyes on her. And he knows it, too. Her grin waned as we traded stares. I'm worried about you. Why? I asked softly, happy we were getting to the heart of the matter without yelling at each other. I'm worried about this guy. Jethro. Yes, Jethro. What do you know about him? Now I was grinning. Everything... He used to steal cars. Oh, my God. She covered her face with her hands. I couldn't help but enjoy her horror because when she actually met him, I was sure she was going to love him. Don't worry, he was never convicted. She made a little hysterical sound but said nothing. And he gave me this ring. 
I held my hand out. Marta peeked from between her fingers, then her hands dropped to her lap. Then she turned wide eyes and a gaping mouth on me. Holy shit! She grabbed my hand and yanked it toward her. Is this real? I nodded, knowing she meant the ring, but answering the unasked question. Yes. This is very real. He's talking to Annie on Monday. You know, the image guru we used when my phone was hacked? He's agreed to see me in secret until she can help us develop a plan. We're getting married. Marta's gaze lifted to mine, a mixture of worry and frustration. I don't know what to say. Say you're happy for me. I can't. I can't lie to you. I love you and don't want to see you hurt. Neither does he. But you will be hurt, Sienna. Being with him is going to hurt your image. You have to know that. Which is why we're not going public yet. It doesn't matter when you go public. Your actions have repercussions. You're behaving like a child. I know my actions have repercussions. I'm not a child. And you have to stop treating me like I'm a child. I've decided even worst-case repercussions are worth a lifetime of happiness and freedom. You're giving up your career. I shrugged. Honestly, I doubt that. I'll always have a career, but it might not be as an A-list actress. She shook her head at me. How can you give that up? You could do so much good. But at what price, personally? If I'm miserable and lose the only person I've ever loved, I lose the chance to have happiness, meaningful fulfillment, kids, a new family, an awesome, weird, wonderful family. Will I look back on my life and think, I'm so glad I worked as hard as I did and filled my life with money, parties, and empty relationships? No. The answer is no. I might be giving it up, but I'm doing it on my own terms. She frowned, pressing her lips together, then nodded tightly. Fine. I'll fly back with you to Tennessee. I'll meet him. My smile was immediate, and without thinking, I grabbed my sister and pulled her into a tight hug, yelling, God, you're going to love him! She hesitated, but then her arms wrapped around me, and she returned my embrace. I hope I do, because despite what you think, I do want you to be happy. I know. I nodded, pulling away so I could see her face, and she could see mine. I know. But, Marta, he doesn't just make me happy. He takes care of me, such excellent care of me, and I take care of him. Arriving solo to a movie premiere was a lot like going to any average theater and seeing a movie by yourself. You get the looks. Everyone wondering what you're doing by yourself, asking if you're lost, asking you where your date or person was. People treated a single female alone at the movies like a cancer patient. Of course, people treated a single man alone at the movies like a pedophile. So, between the two, I'd rather garner sympathy than suspicion. Luckily, and to my surprise, I wasn't receiving any pitiable looks or concerned smiles as I walked the red carpet and posed for the cameras. The image I'd accidentally cultivated meant no one seemed to be taking my single status as something to be pitied. Sienna! Are you making a feminist statement? Over here! You go, girl. Five questions. We have just five questions. Where's Tom? Have you lost weight? We love your dress. You look hot. Can I be a date? One photographer hollered, trying to turn my head toward his camera. Another pap called back. She's Sienna Diaz. She doesn't need a date, and your ugly arse isn't good enough. This exchange made me laugh, and the resultant flashes were blinding. The hours were blurring together. We'd arrived in London just ten hours ago. Since that time, I'd met with the producers for my next film, given seven magazine interviews, was fitted for the dress I was currently wearing, had my makeup and hair done twice, once for a photo shoot and then again for this evening, and still managed to trade several texts with Jethro. But I'd miss the call from my parents. I would call them back from the bathroom inside the theater, if I ever made it inside. Stepping away from the cameras, I walked to the media section and to more calls for my attention. I recognized a reporter acquaintance who I actually really liked and respected. He stood to one side among the throng, against the barricade, and wasn't yelling at me. 
A small smile quirked his lips, and when our eyes connected, his eyebrows raised in question. Do you have a minute? I gave him a warm smile as I walked to him, cameras following me, the crowd growing quieter so we could speak. I liked Darval because he never asked me about my diet. He never asked about my beauty regimen or my workout routine or questions about whether Latinas make good lovers. Yes, I was actually asked that question during an interview earlier in the day. I'd responded, I think the real question is, when did they start allowing perverts into press junkets? Sienna, Arval gave me a nod. You look lovely. I glanced down at myself. Oh, this whole thing? I made it. He chuckled. Like everyone else, he knew the dress was some ridiculous designer concoction. Shall we get down to business? Please do, I motioned to his microphone. What are you working on right now? Too many things. I laughed, turning on the charm for the camera. We're just wrapping up filming for The Cultivist in Tennessee, and I start filming Strange Bird Fellows in September. Are you writing anything now? Uh, I hesitated, not sure how to respond. Yes, I'm working on a script for a superhero project. There were rumors you were supposed to star in that, is that true? We were discussing the possibility, yes, but I can't speak of the outcome, as nothing is set in stone. I'm really trying to focus on the script first and foremost, so I've been embracing anger and calling it research. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Tom had arrived. He was currently smoldering at the cameras. He was also alone, his date nowhere in sight. Embracing anger. Yes, uh, someone cut me off in traffic, so I applied a red face mask, chased the person down, and threatened to smash their Prius. Unfortunately, the police were not amused. That didn't really happen, did it? No, it didn't. But it might. So here's a message to all your viewers at home. I faced the camera and spoke earnestly. Don't cut me off in traffic. Arval grinned, nodded, writing himself a note on a small notepad, then asked, And what do you think about filming in Tennessee? Are the locals friendly? His question gave me pause and I did a double take, studying him. But his expression was innocent, so I decided the question must be as well. Tennessee is gorgeous. But it's one of those treasures you don't want other people to find out about. It's perfection, just how it is. And the locals are among my favorite people in the universe. I heard gorgeous. You must be talking about me. Tom slid next to me, slipping his arm around my waist and placing a kiss on my cheek. I tensed and by some miracle kept the grimace from my face. Of course we were, I quipped. We were just talking about you and your gorgeous Pomeranians. You know, the dogs you just adopted from that animal shelter. Tom's lids lowered, giving me a vitriolic stare, but his smile didn't waver. Tom hated dogs. You've adopted a Pomeranian, Arvel asked, clearly disbelieving. Before Tom could speak, I cut in. Oh, yes, and not just one, a whole litter. Arvo glanced between us, an eyebrow lifted. Everyone knew Tom hated dogs. He'd famously refused to work with a German shepherd some years ago on a police movie, insisting his body double be used for all scenes involving the canine. Trapping my gaze, Tom smiled and said, Have you seen Sienna's ring? I gritted my teeth and shot daggers at him, my heart jumping to my throat. Don't you dare. His smile widened. Watch me. Isn't it lovely? Tom lifted my ring finger and showed it to Arval. But it's on the wrong hand, don't you think? A stunned hush fell over those who were watching and listening, followed by an eruption of questions from all sides. Sienna, are you and Tom engaged? Why did you arrive separately? When is the wedding? Arval blinked at us, clearly surprised, but then quickly recovered, addressing his question to me. Are you two making an announcement? As I held Tom's smirking gaze, frantic questions being haphazardly thrown in my direction, something in me shifted. I was mad, and I'd been mad since Jethro had left my trailer yesterday. I was mad at Tom, obviously. He was a douche nozzle. But I was also angry with myself. If I'd brought Jethro, 
If I'd followed Cletus's wise words of owning our shit and facing the music, then everything about this moment would have been different. I wouldn't be standing here feeling like a fraud. Yes, there would be fallout. Yes, I might lose a few film rolls. Some doors might shut. But did I really want to walk through those doors? If Jethro had been standing next to me, the road would have been rocky. But at least we would be facing it together. And I would have been true to myself. For the first time in my career, I felt like a coward. I felt like a sellout. And I hated it. In that moment, Jethro's words, spoken with such love, came back to me. Now part of my hate is because I don't want to lie to folks. But the other part is selfish. I'm in love with you, and the idea of us being a secret makes me want to break something. I wanted to break something. First, Tom's nose. Second, each and every preconceived notion about who I was. I was ready to be free. Decision made, I held Tom's gaze and gave him a brilliant smile. It is on the wrong hand. Thank you for pointing that out. His eyes widened with surprise and interest. Clearly he was curious what I was up to. Very carefully, I slipped Jethro's grandmother's ring, my engagement ring, off my right hand and placed the ring where it belonged. Then I turned it to the crowd of cameras in front of me, holding it up as though I were flipping them off with my ring finger instead of the middle one. I'm engaged to be married. My fiancé couldn't make it today. He's too busy humanely trapping gigantic black bears and setting them free in the wild. I can't wait for you all to meet him. His name is Jethro Winston, and he's a wildlife park ranger in Tennessee. We're completely in love, and we'll be getting married in the fall when the leaves change. I grinned, my heart swelling with the rightness of the moment. I turned to Arval to see if he had any more questions, but he just stared at me, mouth hanging open. I didn't see Tom's expression because I wasn't looking at him. I didn't care whether he was angry or putting on a show. It didn't matter. What Tom thought didn't matter. Because as Jethro had said, it's good to care about what others think, but only when those other people matter. Chapter 34 Death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside us while we live. Norman Cousins Jethro Are you drinking that stinky coffee again? I wrinkled my nose at Cletus, inspecting the paper bag and coffee mug he'd brought inside my truck because I smelled something rank. No, I only have one cup of my special brew a day. Then what smells bad? Garbage? I squinted at my brother. Garbage? Yes, garbage smells bad. So does sulfur and poop. I sighed, rolling my eyes. I meant, why does it smell bad in here? What's in that bag? You didn't ask why it smelled bad in here. You asked, what smells bad? How was I supposed to know you didn't just want a list of things that smelled bad? Glaring out the windshield, I had to bite my tongue before I snapped at my brother. He was being surly on purpose. We were driving home for the day, but first we had to stop by the Piggly Wiggly and grab a few things. I trapped five bears, more than usual, and was exhausted. After driving them up the parkway to the release grounds, I turned back around and picked up Cletus from the set. He'd been rude from the get-go, but really, he'd been in a bad mood since seeing Grandma's ring on Sienna's finger. The only thing for it was to ignore him. I rolled down my window, needing air. Whatever Cletus was transporting in his paper bag smelled like three-day-old fish and burnt popcorn. We drove in silence the rest of the way. Well, mostly silence. He kept sighing. I pulled into the lot and jumped out of the car, heard him shut his door, too, and made for the grocery store. I tried to make quick work of picking up the items on my list, but in the produce aisle, my attention snagged on the bouquets of roses by the bananas. There were several different arrangements. Sienna would be back by tomorrow afternoon, and the thought of greeting her with flowers, just to see the smile on her face appealed to me. Get the white ones, with the pink tips. I glanced over my shoulder and found Jennifer Sylvester next to me. As usual, she was in an expensive-looking dress and super high heels, her long blonde hair pulled up in a loose but fancy bun. She had on pearls. 
She was also holding a big, dirty crate of bananas. I frowned at her at this little slip of a woman, looking like she was ready for church, holding a giant crate of bananas. I stepped forward to take her burden, but before I could, she set the crate on the floor and reached for the roses. These are the ones she'll like. They're called moonstone roses. Jennifer smiled up at me with her violet eyes, placing the bunch in my hands. Moonstone roses smell the best. They smell even prettier when they open. Jennifer's eyes weren't just violet. They were full-on purple. I'd never seen anyone with eyes like hers. Her real hair color was raven black. I remember the color from when she was a little girl. But her mama had started dying at blonde when Jennifer was a teenager. Kip Sylvester, Jennifer's daddy, and the principal of the high school, didn't like the attention his daughter's dark hair, pale skin, and purple eyes garnered. So she'd grown up more sheltered than most. She was nice enough, but she was usually making everything more awkward than needed. Bless her heart. I gave her a small smile. Thanks. You're welcome. She returned my smile with one of her own, then bent to retrieve her bananas. I set Sienna's roses down in my cart and moved to pick up the crate. Jennifer Ann Sylvester, this crate is too big for you. She grumbled as I took the crate away from her. It's fine. I have to carry it once a week. I'm more than used to it by now. You'll break your neck in those shoes, and then what'll I tell your daddy? Where are we going? To your car? I said, I'm perfectly capable of carrying my own bananas. She reached for it, but I shifted to the side, lifting my eyebrows expectantly. She huffed, rolled her eyes like a kid, and said begrudgingly, Fine. Follow me. Leaving my shopping cart by the roses, I followed Jennifer past the registers and out to her BMW. She popped the trunk and opened it all the way so I could drop the crate inside. That wasn't really necessary. I know you don't like bananas. I stepped back so she could shut the trunk and turned a surprised expression on her. How do you know that? Because you've never ordered my cake. Well, she had me there. She quickly added as though she was afraid she'd offended me. To tell you the truth, I don't really like cake all that much. I don't like baking them. This was surprising because Green Valley was famous for three things. The jam session every Friday night at the community center, the trout fishing at Sky Lake, and Jennifer Sylvester's banana cake. I crossed my arm, studying her upturned face. Is that so? Yes. She paired this with a single nod. It's like, how many times am I going to have to make the same goddamn cake? Sorry for my profanity, but I get worked up when I talk about cake. Understood. She didn't seem to hear me. Just cause I'm good at making cake doesn't mean I want to make it for the rest of my life, you know. Just cause you're good at something doesn't mean that's what makes your heart happy. I sometimes feel like I become the banana cake lady, and I'm only 22. But that's it. That's who I am. My life is set, and there's no escape. I'll be 99 years old, still making banana cakes at my mama's bakery. So why don't you do something else? Jennifer lifted her eyes to mine, frowning, a wrinkle of consternation appearing between her eyebrows. You know what I'd love to do? What's that? I'd love to have my own kids, my own house. I'd love to be a stay-at-home mom and spend all day with my kids, taking care of the house, taking care of my husband. And if I can't do that, then I'd love to work in a preschool. I'd love to work with kids, doing crafts all day, reading to them, playing. I love babies. Then you should do that. Gradually, her face fell, and she nodded politely, looking away. I got the sense I'd said something untoward, but didn't have a clue what. Well, she took a step back. Thanks for carrying my crate. I have to get to the bakery and work on that particle accelerator. What? Just kidding. I'm not an astrophysicist. I bake cakes. Her smile was small and forced. She turned away and crossed to the driver's side door, opened it, then slipped inside. I stared after her, watching as she started her car. Jennifer Sylvester was famous for three things. Her banana cake, her purple eyes, and being odd. Giving my head a shake, I turned from her black BMW and made my way back toward the store. I was just at the crosswalk when Jennifer pulled her car up next to me and tapped on her horn. She rolled down the window and waved me over. What's up? I forgot to tell you. Some news guys were at the store when I first arrived to pick up my bananas. A big swarm of them. They were asking for directions to your house. I straightened, thinking her words over. My house? 
What did they want? She shrugged. I don't know for certain, but if I had to guess, I'd say it probably has something to do with you and Sienna Diaz being engaged. My mouth fell open and I gaped at Jennifer Sylvester. How did you know we were engaged? She told everybody at that fancy movie premiere earlier today. It's all over the internet. I'm engaged to be married. My fiancé couldn't make it today. He's too busy humanely trapping gigantic black bears and setting them free in the wild. Cletus pressed pause on the YouTube video and frowned at me. She makes you sound like some sort of backwoods hippie. Shut up, dummy. Play the rest of the video. I motioned to his phone where he'd pulled up the video of Sienna from earlier in the day. It was amateur quality, the sound garbled in places by all the background noise. Given the five or six hour time change, it was late night in London right now. This footage had been shot sometime around 3 p.m. Cletus grumbled something. Eventually, he pressed play while I listened and scrolled through my text messages. She hadn't messaged me. I tried calling her phone. It went to voicemail. I can't wait for you all to meet him. His name is Jethro Winston, and he's a wildlife park ranger in Tennessee. We're completely in love, and we'll be getting married in the fall, when the leaves change. I glanced at Cletus's screen, saw she was smiling as though she'd just done something brilliant. Meanwhile, Tom Lowe looked like he just swallowed a live rat. Questions were shouted at her from all directions, but that's basically where the video ended. Cletus tapped his screen and slipped his phone back into his pocket. Well, hell, was that so hard? He was grinning. I dropped my phone to the cup holder and gripped my truck's steering wheel, staring out the windshield. I can't believe she did that. From the looks of it, Tom Lowe put her in a bad spot. He was insinuating that she and him... I saw the video, Cletus. You don't need to break it down for me. Surprisingly, he snapped his mouth shut, his eyebrows lifting high on his forehead, his eyes going wide. I could almost read his mind, hear his internal thoughts as though he were speaking. No doubt it was something like, Settle your feathers, crusty britches. We sat mostly in silence for a long time. He was drumming his fingers on the passenger side door. The beat reminded me of a ticking clock. What am I going to do? I asked the car. Should I talk to those reporters? What if I end up hurting her career even more? It seems like I shouldn't be talking to anyone until I discuss the matter with Sienna first. Which is what she should have done. Why don't you want to talk to them? What if they ask about my past? He shrugged. Tell the truth. Well, tell the truth about everything except the criminal stuff. No one really expects you to answer those questions. Not looking at my brother because I wasn't really speaking to him, I said. I'm disappointed. Actually, I'm pissed off. We'd agreed on a plan and she went and did what she wanted. And now the very thing I was trying to avoid is going to happen. You'll have to punish her for sure. I blinked, my gaze cutting to him. I'm not going to punish her. What are you talking about? Well, if she did something to disappoint you, then obviously you'll have to teach her a lesson. She's not a child, Cletus. She gets to make her own decisions, do what she thinks is right. If she told those reporters the truth, then obviously. As I spoke, it became clear that Cletus was trying to hide his smile. I studied him and realized he'd been pulling my leg, leading me to the water so I could decide to drink it. Laughing, I shook my head at him. You're an asshole. Yeah, he shrugged, laughing too. I am. We sat together for a stretch, each lost to her own considerations. I was debating how to go about approaching these news folks, how to engage them and be an asset to my woman. I decided being friendly, yet firm, was in order. I'd invite them for a chat, not inside the house. The porch would do just fine. I'd introduce myself, ingratiate myself. I'd make him love me. If he tries to hurt you or Sienna, I'll kill him. Cletus's casual threat pulled me out of my thoughts. I turned to look at my brother. The set of his mouth was grim and his eyes were sharp, almost painfully bright. Excuse me? Daryl, he won't be bothering you or Sienna. Don't you worry about him. He knows as long as he's in prison, I can get to him. I gaped at my brother for a full minute, an inferno of hatred behind his eyes and a cool determination cast in his features in the harsh lines. Not a look I'd seen on his face in a very long time. 
Cletus, you're not a murderer. You wouldn't do that. He gave me a wry smile and turned the ignition, looking like someone I didn't recognize. It wouldn't be murder, big brother. It would be self-defense. Or at least I'd make it appear that way. What the? I could only stare at my younger brother as he pulled out of the parking lot. The earlier icy determination and heated resolve replaced with his usual air of detached peculiarity. Should I take the valley road, or do you think Moth Run would be quicker? He asked unnecessarily, his tone now easy and affable. The truth was, I didn't have time to think about Cletus' statement right now, or whether he actually had the ability to reach our father in jail and put an end to him, to all his threats. I had a bunch of news people waiting for me at the house and had to put on a good show. I needed to put my energy toward that. But when this media mess with Sienna resolved, I would have to confront him about it. My family had already lost enough to our father. The man was a plague, a disease, a stain on the memories of our childhood. I knew Cletus had suffered, just like we all had. Although not in the same way, Cletus had lost just as much as me because of Daryl Winston. But now I wondered what, specifically, Cletus had lost. It must have been something substantial to fuel such hatred. Regardless, it didn't matter whether my brother thought his actions or potential future actions were justified. I couldn't allow Cletus to lose his soul, too. I tried Sienna's phone one more time as we pulled into our driveway. She didn't pick up. Even from a distance, I could see the front yard littered with strange cars. Media people milling about, holding cameras, smoking cigarettes. I counted five vehicles total. Four were local news vans. One looked to be a rental car from the airport. They were on us like fleas on a dog as soon as Cletus parked, calling my name and knocking on the windows of both doors. These people are nuts. My brother locked the doors, gaping at me in horror. Why are they knocking? What do they think? We're confused about whether or not they think we should stay in the car? Parasites? I smiled at my brother, like I didn't have a care in the world. Don't say anything. Let me do the talking. I won't say anything. I'll let you do the talking. He echoed and removed the key from the ignition. Cletus turned to the faces nearly pressed against the door. He flicked his wrist, motioning for them to step back. Okay, okay. I know you want to speak to my brother. But I can't get out of the car if you're blocking my path, genius. Meanwhile, I rolled down my window and two microphones were shoved in my face. What do you have to say about Sienna Diaz's announcement earlier today? Does she know about your criminal past? What does your family think? Are you using Sienna to become famous? I let them shout their questions at me for a few minutes, careful to keep my expression calm and my smile easy. Each flash of the camera was searching for an unpleasant picture of my face. I figured I'd be the man who conned Sienna Diaz, ruined America's sweetheart if I didn't play my cards right or donned one sinister expression. When it was clear they were growing tired, I spoke over them. Now, just hold on. I'll be happy to answer everyone's questions. But I'd like to do so on my porch, in the shade and out of the heat, if you don't mind. There are plenty of chairs for everyone, and I have lemonade in the fridge. It's hot out here, and I could do with a cool drink. Their general steam and fervor, more fear that I'd rush into my house and call the cops on them for trespassing, seemed to wane at my offer, and they exchanged furtive glances. Quietly and in mass, they shifted away from the truck so Cletus and I could exit. I stepped out, giving each of their distrusting faces a small, welcoming smile, then turned to Cletus as he walked around the truck toward the porch. Could you bring out some lemonade for these fine folks? In a bucket of ice. We'll be on the porch. Cletus scowled, but he nodded casting disapproving glares around the crowd like he was cataloging each of them for one of his sinister plans. I breathed a sigh of relief when he disappeared inside without saying a word. Forgive my brother. It was a bit of a shock coming home to such a ruckus. Before anyone could speak, I turned to the reporter closest to me and extended my hand. I'm Jethro Winston. What's your name? Chapter 35 Love is a longing for the half of ourselves we have lost. Milan Kundera, the unbearable lightness of being. Sienna I can't believe we're lost, Dave grumbled, shaking his head at the mountain road. 
I mean, I only had to drive up here from the airport that one time, but I seriously thought I knew the way. Everything looks the same. Why don't any of you have your new phones? Marta complained, shaking her head at all of us. I ordered you those phones so you would have reception on the mountain. I shared a sheepish glance with Henry. He and Tim were sitting with me in the back seat. We'd all left our Tennessee phones on the kitchen table at Hank's cabin, not wanting to carry two phones with us to London. Guys, I think we need to pull over, Tim said. Actually, he moaned it. What's wrong? Dave glanced at us through the rearview mirror. Tim's car sick. Henry shifted away from Tim. Or he's about to be. It's because of the switchbacks, Dave nodded at his own assertion. Thanks, Captain Obvious, Tim groaned, covering his mouth with a big hand. Pull off there, Marta pointed to an overlook, a frantic note in her tone. Dave eased us off the side of the road. As soon as the car pulled to a stop, both Henry and I bolted out of our respective doors. Tim was a little slower to exit, crawling more than walking. The sun was low in the sky as it was still early morning. We'd left directly from the film premiere in the wee hours of pre-dawn London time. I was reasonably well-rested, having slept the entire flight back to the States. But now I was anxious to get home so I could call Jethro and tell him in person about the premiere. I wanted him to have some time to prepare before Arval ran his footage this week. Gravel crunched beneath my feet as I walked to Marta and slipped an arm around her shoulders. She exhaled a tired laugh and rested her head on my shoulder. No wonder you were lost up here. At least we know which direction is east, but you were driving in the middle of the day. I glanced around the overlook, smiling to myself. You know... I think this is the same overlook where I pulled off that first day. Just think of this as us giving you the authentic mountain experience. She lifted her head and gave me a hopeful look. Do you think you can find your way back from here? Maybe. I think we use this road to get to Jethro's. I trailed off because the sound of an approaching vehicle had us turning our attention to the road. A green truck appeared. It was Jethro's truck. I immediately laughed. Of course. Of course he'd be driving past. Right place, right time. Martha glanced between the road and me. I released my sister and walked to the edge of the overlook. He'd passed us, but now was putting on his brake and making a U-turn. Hey, that's Jethro's truck, I heard Dave say from behind me. What do you think of this, Jethro? The speculation in Martha's tone made me smile. Henry chimed in. Jethro? Oh, he's the man. Did you know he traps bears? I glanced over my shoulder just in time to see Dave give Henry a wan look, then affix an air of earnest concern to his features. Jethro's a good guy. He takes really good care of your sister. Did Sienna tell you he didn't know who she was at first? Marta split her attention between Dave, the approaching truck, and me. No, she didn't mention that. You're going to love him. Henry was the definition of effusive enthusiasm. I was pretty sure Henry had a crush on my fiancé. Hearing the engine cut off, I turned my attention back to the truck and saw Roscoe was with him. I waved, grinning wide and excited, and quickly walked over to them. Jethro was also grinning, and my heart fluttered impatiently at the warm welcome in his gaze. He was really just too handsome. Pretty soon I was running like a goof and threw myself at him. His strong arms immediately came around me, squeezing me tight. I sighed, happy and content, hopeful and unafraid. I missed you, I said, holding him tighter so I wouldn't tackle him and make love to him on the gravel. His hand pulled through my hair. I let the sound of his deliciously gravelly voice and sweet southern accent wash over me as he said, I've missed you, too. I was pleased when Marta was warmly polite, which is more than what most people received, when she and Jethro were introduced. Of course, it helped that Roscoe, who apparently knew how to turn on and off his charm, had already buttered her up by saying, with a hint of suggestiveness, You must be Sienna's younger sister. I'm Jethro's younger brother. I tried not to laugh at how that comment made her blush and smile, though she did roll her eyes at him good-naturedly. We loaded up in the car, Tim riding with Jethro in his truck this time, while Roscoe squeezed in the car with us, and we were escorted back to Hank's cabin. Jethro and Roscoe helped carry in our bags. Carrying, not rolling, so as not to ruin the wheels, then made to leave. They'd been on their way to work, but invited us to dinner. I followed Jethro out and pulled him to the side, letting Roscoe continue on to the truck. I have to tell you something, 
I kept my hand on his bicep so I could hold him in place, but also so I could feel him up. I loved his arms. They were so muscular and strong. Thinking about them turned me on. So touching them gave me delicious twisty feelings low in my belly. Smiling at me like he knew what I was doing, his eyelids lowered. What do you have to tell me? I sighed because how he dropped his voice made me think about us alone and naked. I wished we were alone and naked right now. Sienna, if you expect me to pay attention, you're going to have to stop looking at me like that. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's just, I really missed you. And I really missed you too. No, I mean, I really, really missed you. I know we're coming over for dinner tonight. But do you think there's any chance you could meet me this afternoon for lust? His lips quirked to the side. You mean for lunch? Yes, that's what I said, right? He laughed, his eyes bright, and he gained another step closer, bending slightly to capture my lips in an achingly soft kiss. What did you want to tell me? He whispered, his eyes moving over my face, making me feel cherished. But his question brought me back to reality. Oh! I gripped his other arm. Don't get mad. His smile was soft and patient, and rather than saying anything, he waited for me to continue. I gathered a deep breath for courage and then said on a rush, I may have told everyone that we are engaged when I was at the premiere yesterday, but don't worry, we have a few days to come up with a plan before Arval runs his... I know. Someone already put a video of it up on YouTube. I started at that. What? When? Yesterday afternoon. Tennessee time. I saw what happened. I grimaced. And you're not mad? I was mad, he said matter-of-factly, though he didn't look mad now. We'd come to a decision together, came up with a plan. Yes, but Tom was trying to... I stopped myself. No. That's not really the reason I did it. He gave me a push, but honestly, I wanted to do it. I hated that you weren't with me, and I hated that I'd asked you to lie. Jezero hesitated, frowning, considering my words. I didn't like that he was mad, and even if he seemed perfectly calm, he was frowning. He rarely frowned. Not with me. The pressure in my chest grew and I became aware that my grip was likely painful. I told myself to let him go, but I couldn't. I held on, tighter. He seemed to sense my growing unease, because he placed his hand over mine and pried it off his arm, bringing it to his lips for a kiss. I'll come by this afternoon. We'll discuss everything then, okay? I nodded, pressing my lips together so I wouldn't demand he stay and sort things out right this second, in the front yard of Hank's cabin, with my sister, his brother, and my bodyguards as onlookers. Okay, fine, I finally managed to say. His mouth hitched to the side as he studied me. Do you want me to bring lunch? I nodded, distracted, but deciding I had faith in him. I had faith in us. We were solid, no matter what. Then he said, And you'll bring the lust? My eyes cut to his and I saw the warm teasing there, the easy flirtation, the interest and adoration in his gaze. Okay, you bring lunch, I'll bring lust, and we'll both eat. His eyebrows bounced at the suggestiveness in my tone. Then he flashed me my favorite smile. Despite the way it made my knees weak, I lifted on my tiptoes and brushed a kiss to his lips. My anxiety melted away, leaving only trust in this remarkable man and excitement for our afternoon rendezvous. I asked Dave to drive me to the set after spending the morning with Marta. I didn't have any scenes to film, but the trailer would provide a mostly private space for Jethro and me to talk. I also brought along my black silk bathrobe. I'd been placed in charge of the lust, and I took that charge seriously. Dave waited dutifully outside the trailer. I'd given him strict instructions to allow no one but Jethro to enter. Meanwhile, I changed it to my birthday suit plus the robe. While I was waiting, an idea came to me for the Smash Girl movie, so I flipped open my spare laptop and set to work. I lost track of time. When I finally glanced down at the computer's clock, two hours had passed. I rubbed my eyes and stretched, glancing around the trailer, surprised to find Jethro sitting at the kitchen table. He was sipping on a drink through a straw, flipping through a notebook and scrolling through his phone. Hello, I said. Hey, gorgeous. He wrote down a few lines in the notebook, copying them from his phone, 
then flipped the book closed and brought his eyes to mine. All done? For now. How long have you been sitting there? He checked his phone again. About an hour and a half. Jethro, you should have interrupted me. He shrugged. You were working, and I had a nice view. A nice view always helps. I felt my mouth tucked to the side. Is that something your mother used to say? He nodded, his smile growing. But I doubt she had this view in mind when she said it. He indicated to me with a lift of his chin as he stood, shoving his hands in his pockets. I brought lunch. I stood as well and lifted my palms away from my body. I brought lust. His eyes heated as they swept over me. Yes, you did. We indulged for a moment in mutual ogling. He was wearing his ranger uniform, but his tool belt rested on the table next to his hat, and his shirt was unbuttoned, and his hair was in disarray. He was my strong, capable, sweet man, and I wanted to be close to him. But before we ate lunch or succumbed to lust, we had a few things to discuss. Thus, I blurted, I'm so sorry. His eyes cut to mine. Why are you sorry? I didn't miss the hint of amused exasperation in his tone. Because we agreed to one thing and I did the opposite. I behaved selfishly, not thinking about the consequences of my actions. And I'm sorry. Jethro shrugged, his eyes sliding over my shoulder to the swell of my breasts, saying distractedly, Live and learn. I stared at him, stunned and irritated at his laissez-faire words. Live and learn? He nodded, a smile threatening to break free. That's right. Now you know. Hindsight is twenty-twenty. Live and learn. I know what it means, Jethro. I snapped, growing both more and less aggravated, which didn't make any sense, by his teasing. Good. I guess we're on the same page then. He continued to devour me with his gaze, touching me nowhere, like he was memorizing the sight of me. Really? Are we? Yes. He nodded once, slowly. Enlighten me. I will. I can't wait. Here we go. Let's hear it. Hold on to your hat. I'm not wearing a hat. Well, hold on to your underwear then. I'm not wearing those either. Jethro opened his mouth to respond, but then snapped it shut, his gaze lifting to mine again, giving me another amused yet exasperated look. We, oui. he started, his voice full of authority, pausing just long enough to treat himself to an evocative, lingering sweep of my body. Then he started again, his voice deeper. We make plans together. We both stick to the plan. Okay. Yes. Or, if you want to change the plan, we discuss it. Makes sense. Good, he said firmly, like everything was decided, then added unexpectedly. So I guess I have something to tell you. What's that? Yesterday, after your video, I tried calling you because there were reporters camped out at my house. I immediately grimaced. Oh, no. Oh, yes. What happened? What did you do? I invited them for lemonade on the front porch and answered a few of their questions. Was it terrible? He shrugged. It wasn't so bad. But they already knew all about my past, showed me my arrest record, asked how I thought audiences were going to react to America's sweetheart hooking up with an ex-con. I pointed out that I wasn't an ex-con, as I'd never been convicted. And if they printed as much, I'd have to sue them for slander. But other than that awkwardness, our chat was mostly pleasant. I nodded, absorbing all of this. Okay, okay, we'll be fine. Sienna. His eyes searched mine, and he closed the distance between us, gathering my hands between his. It's just starting. This week might be tough. You have to let me help you. You have to tell me what's going on so we can work together. Things might come out. Stuff I haven't told you. Not because I'm keeping secrets, but because there's so much I haven't gotten to it yet. Or I simply forgot. Ask me questions. Don't be afraid of making me angry. I will, and I won't. I mean, I will ask, and I won't be afraid. I promise solemnly. I was actually really impressed with how well he took the news of what happened at the premiere. I'd expected him to be more upset. We're in this together he said, and that made me smile. We are, aren't we? I asked, feeling an odd sense of wonder. It's you and me, partner. We swapped stairs, smiling at each other. I think we both appreciated the finality of the moment. I felt the truth settle around us, 
in our little bubble of awesome. Our bubble might be pierced, but I trusted we'd always be able to patch it. Our past would always be a part of us, but it would never wholly define us, either together or as individuals. Each moment was a decision. We could either live up or down to people's expectations or blow them completely away. We had no control over what other people decided to think, but we did have control over our own actions, who we wanted to be, and how we lived our life. From now on, it was Jethro Winston and Sienna Diaz against the world, defying our history, ignoring the labels others might assign. If I became lost, I knew I could count on him to find me, and vice versa. We had faith in each other, and that's all that mattered. Well, maybe not quite. What my family thought mattered, and I would always take their advice seriously, even though I might not follow it. What Jethro's family thought also mattered, but I was certain they'd be pleased with whatever made Jethro happy. No worries there. What Jethro thought mattered, and what I thought mattered. Then everyone else could go dill a pickle. I love you, Jethro Whitman Winston. I slipped my hands from his and pulled the tie holding my black silk bathrobe closed. I can't wait to make you crazy, fill your house with children, and furnish our sex dungeon. He grinned down at me, a mixture of amusement and wickedness. He slid his large, wildly strong hands into my robe, opening it and exposing my body to his eyes and touch. I shivered, because I loved how he touched me, how he cherished me. I love you, Sienna Diaz. His voice was a low rumble, and he captured my mouth with a soft, savoring kiss. You are sunshine and sweetness, but you're so much more than that. You are strong and beautiful, brave and wise, and you are funny. I am. I'm the funniest, I quickly agreed. You are. He nodded, looking at me like I'd hung the moon and stars, and then added on a whisper, But it's not my house, love. It's our house, and I can't wait for you to tell our kids all the jokes. I laughed, but then gasped, because Jethro Winston, my soon-to-be husband, was being very, very bad. And as usual, it felt very, very good. Extra scene, sometime later. What's that? I gestured to the notebook in Jethro's hands while I dished myself a piece of pie. We were on a picnic. The leaves were changing and the wedding was just one week away. Thus, we were also sort of hiding from our families. Cletus and I had been doing yoga every morning since Jethro and I had returned from wrapping strange bird fellows in Washington State. The yoga helped, and Cletus was great. But time alone with Jethro someplace outside away from the constant swarm of reporters that had followed us everywhere since outing our relationship, was what I'd been craving. Poetry, he said, opening his arms and patting his lap. Put your head here. I lifted an eyebrow at his instruction. You always want me to put my head there. Ha <laughs> ha. He rolled his eyes, but he smiled. He always smiled. Come on, gorgeous. You need a break from the wedding stuff, and I've been working on this notebook for months. I eyed Jethro speculatively. Is that really poetry? Yes. You said you wanted me to read you poetry, so I copied some down in this book. Really? Yes. Is it your poetry? No. I transcribed them. I asked Ashley for some suggestions. She's a poetry nut, and a few are favorites of mine. You have favorite poetry? Yes, he said on an exasperated exhale, patting his lap again. Are you telling me the truth? My mama loved poetry. It's how she met Drew. She ran a poetry meeting at the library, and he, being new to town, showed up. He writes it, though. I do not. But I have one of his in here. Ashley emailed it to me yesterday when I told her I was taking you out today. I haven't read it yet. Just printed out the attachment about an hour ago. Holy cow! Drew writes poetry? Drew, or what little I knew about him, seemed to be a man of few words. He looked like a Viking, but struck me as a gentle giant. The fact he wrote poetry left me stunned. Drew writes poetry. You want me to read that one first? 
Jethro flipped through the pages of his notebook and withdrew a folded piece of paper, poised to start reading. Wait! Before you start, I set my plate to one side, then crossed to him on my hands and knees. Once I was next to him, I lay down, resting my head on his lap and folding my hands over my stomach. Okay, now start. He grinned at me like I was a goof. You finally agree? This is a poetry reading pose. Yes, I agree. Then I'm reading you poetry every day. I reached above my head and pinched his thigh. Stop being a dirty mister and read the damn poetry. His grin widened, but he acquiesced. Attention back on the journal, he cleared his throat, and then he began. I see you, a weapon to wield, tight rope above, no net below, start. Need water, need air, need forgiveness, acceptance a mantle, hopelessness a shield, a part. I see you. Rejection causes blindness, reset, renew, restart. Forgiveness on your mind, love in your heart. I see you. Son to one, brother to many, friend to me. Now husband, soon father, I see you. As Jethro read, the steadiness of his voice diminished as it slowed. He swallowed thickly between the lines beginning with brother and friend and finished the last I see you in a hauntingly roughened tone. When he finished, he continued to stare at the words, his throat working, his eyes darting over the page. I frowned my concern, reaching a hand above my head once more, but this time I squeezed his thigh, wanting to offer reassurance. Hey, I said, drawing his eyes to mine. Are you okay? He nodded, though he looked lost. I sat up, twisting at the waist. I'd planned to hold his hand, but Jethro set aside his notebook and reached for me turning my body and bringing me to his lap. I straddled him and wrapped my arms around his neck, giving him a soft kiss. Thank you. His words escaped on an exhale. For what? For giving me a chance. For wanting to know me. I gave him a disbelieving smile, tilting my head back so I could see him. Without thinking, I said, Of course I gave you a chance. Do you know how hot you are? You are seriously hot. Jethro smiled in return, yet it didn't quite reach his eyes, and that had me frowning again. I could have kicked myself. My instinct was to be silly in all serious situations. Sometimes that silliness made me thoughtless. I shook my head, shoving instinct out of the way and inviting true depth to visit. I gave myself permission to feel the moment. That's... that's not what I meant. Let me try that again. I gathered a deep breath and steadied myself by counting the colors in his iris. Green, gold, brown, and blue. I started again. Of course I gave you a chance. You're deserving of every good thing, Jethro. I know you struggle with feeling you deserve good things, and I admire you for your struggle, because I think a lot of people would move on or make excuses for their bad choices and behavior. You could blame your father. And I think you absolutely should to a certain extent. Or you could blame a hundred different other influences and factors. But you don't. His answering smile was smaller, but I was happy to see it reflected in his eyes. His gaze traveled over my features, warm and cherishing. I slipped a palm to his chest and pressed it there. You have a good heart. Thank you for letting me know it. And thank you, Jethro, for wanting to know me. We swapped small smiles and good feelings until Jethro pushed his fingers into my hair, lifting it as though measuring its weight. You are so beautiful, he said, his attention skimming from my hair to my neck, to my chin. I don't think I knew what beauty was until I met you. Ah, uh, the involuntary sound tumbled from my lips, both a grunt and a sigh. I felt his words and the sincerity behind them like an arrow to my heart. His eyes sharpened and he studied my face with interest. What? What's wrong? You and your saying of sweet things, it does something to me. You do something to me. Jethro's mouth hitched to the side with a pleased smile. Happy to hear it. Because when I'm with you, I feel like I'm both flying and falling. Uh, I sigh grunted again and quickly pressed my lips to his. 
I thought you said you don't write poetry. I don't. Stop lying to yourself and the world. You are a poet, and you don't even know it. He pressed his lips together, clearly trying not to laugh. Again, I was being silly. Funny was my default, but my default felt right this time, so I went with it. You should get a permit, but don't attempt to outwit. And here's a tidbit, I pointed to my shoulder. This is my armpit. Jethro laughed, scrunching his face at me like I was funny and weird, which I was, and gifted me with a smiling kiss. You're going to be my wife. I nodded. And you're going to be my husband. He rested his forehead against mine, and we sat together for a long moment, breathing each other in until I asked, Are you giving me comfort? Yes, Miss Winston Diaz. Good, Mr. Winston Diaz. Jethro closed his eyes, a small grin curving his mouth, and whispered like it was a secret. Thank you for being lost. I smiled and whispered in return. Thank you for finding me. This has been Grin and Bearded, The Winston Brothers, Volume 2. Written by Penny Reed. Narrated by Chris Brinkley and Cielo Camargo. Copyright 2016 by Cypher Knot. Production Copyright 2016 by Cypher Knot. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Talk.